Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, welcome to Armeno Ironica, a shared history conference in honor of Professor Nina Garsoyan, uh, which takes place today at UCI and tomorrow at UCLA. So this is actually a joint project, and I think the idea for uh, naming the conference in honor of Professor Garsoyan is with Cebu, if I'm not mistaken, which I think it's quite important and uh, the right thing to do. I think Mazda Publisher just published her memoirs, which are available for purchase online. Uh, I am just going to uh, read something quickly, uh, and then I will turn it over to uh, Professor Berberian to begin the program. Uh, again, I thank you for being here. Thank you for your support, uh, both on the Armenian and the Iranian side. Uh, and I think I'll begin for that, uh, yes? Okay. Uh, if you were with me for a couple of minutes, this morning at 5.30 a.m., when my son woke me up, I sat down to write uh, something about why an armeno ironica conference. Well, the easy answer is having taken Professor Richard Hovenissian's course on Armenian history, which opened up my eyes to another world which was fascinating unto itself, uh, but also it shed important light on the Iranian world, which I was mainly doing. Uh, but then I remembered uh, what my mother used to tell me, that much of what we call cultural ideas, especially in terms of modernity, came to Iran with the Armenians. Uh, in terms of music, I remember, well, today, Loris Cheknovarian is the sort of the great composer that everyone loves, but there were others. Uh, ballet and dance. I don't know if Ms. Haide Changizian is still uh, in Los Angeles, or uh, her father, who began uh, the art of ballet in Iran, among many others um, in 20th century Iran. I can move this page, yes. And then, of course, there are early heroes of the Iranian Constitutional Revolution of 1905-1906, uh, what Professor Berberian has written on, and her new book, The Roving Revolutionaries, is all about. Um, who can forget, of course, Yefrim Khan, who still music uh, and songs are composed about him in northern Iran, who fought to change the autocracy of the monarchy in Iran where kings thought they owned the country and the people. Uh, but then my reflections became more personal and thought of my childhood in Tehran, seeing Vigen with his electric guitar, which blew my mind, or having the best pastry I've ever had in my life, I think until even today, forget Laudry in Paris. Uh, this is Yusuf Abad on the 10th uh, Avenue where uh, the pastry shop was run by a person we used to call Musio, uh, who I used to go almost every week. The best sandwich that I've probably tasted in my life in front of Albor's High School, and we have an Albor's Auditorium now named here next to us, uh, which just gave you a simple bread, butter, and um, chicken. Um, all of these sort of resonated in my mind as to why Armenians have been important for Iran. I still can uh, smell the coffee and the best, I think, Jean Bon I've had in the Middle East, probably in the 70s, uh, with Mon Ami on Shah Reza uh, and the Love Street today. There's so much of this. An example of this the continuation is the owners of Bistango here and Bayside in Orange County, uh, the Gugasians who own Chattanooga, the, the best sort of, you know, hip place in the 70s to. Uh, hang out in. And then, of course, I understood how much should be done about the relations of Armenians and Iranians uh, throughout history. Uh, although I'm an ancient historian, uh, this is, of course, the, the sort of part of this modern reflection that other historians uh, deal with. So I would like to welcome you to this conference and introduce Professor Berberian, who is my partner in crime. Please. Do you want to say a few words? No, I just 
Uh, obviously, I, w I would hugely appreciate it. For those of you who are interested, if you could take the trouble of attending tomorrow's sessions at UCLA. Uh, there will be uh, free lunch, free dinner, and free music, as well as uh, very, very uh, stimulating uh, discussions. And which is where he will be giving his own introduction. So um, it's my privilege and pleasure to join uh, Professor Daryai in welcoming you all to this historic conference in honor of the formidable Professor Emerita Nina Garsoyan. This conference is the first in North America to address the common history and shared world of Armenians and Iranians from antiquity to the modern period. Uh, and it just occurred to me it would have been great to have someone speak about uh, Mortadella and Bologna uh, and the Arzumanians. But anyway, um, it is also the first collaboration between UCI's Armenian Studies program, Persian Studies program, and uh, UCLA's uh, uh, Modern Armenian History program. The papers presented at this two-day conference uh, here today and tomorrow UCLA reflect this shared history whose foremost scholar, Nina Garsoyan, critically evaluated and brought to the attention of scholars decades ago. I would like to acknowledge the co-organizers, uh, my co-organizers' uh, help, as well as the co-sponsor of this conference, Nasser, uh, not to be confused with Gamal, uh, but the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research. Uh, many thanks as well to Saeed Jalalipur, uh, formidable in his own right uh, for handling everything so professionally. Uh, we are delighted to have our conference participants here with us, some of whom traveled long distances from Europe, uh, from Armenia, from Australia, and Uni Hills. Mm -hmm. uh, their presence and yours serves as a reminder of the significance of the Armeno-Iranian shared world and history and the importance of continuing our work in, in, that, uh, in that field. You all have the schedule and agenda in front of you, including our breaks. Uh, we too have free food uh, and a free concert. Uh, and, uh, but without further ado, I'd like to start by introducing uh, Dr. Lebon Abdoyan, who will speak about Professor Garsoyan, but also share a message uh, with, uh, from her uh, to us. Uh, Dr. Abdoyan earned an MA, MPhil, and PhD in Ar Ancient History with a minor in Armenian History and Culture at Columbia University under Morton Smith and Nina Garsoyan. He joined the staff of the Library of Congress in 1977, became its specialist for Classics, Ancient, Byzantine, and Medieval History in 1882, and its first area specialist for Armenia and Georgia in the same year. He has published a critical translation of, of an historical commentary on the history of Taron and curated a major exhibit at the Library of Congress in commemoration of the 500th anniversary of the first printed Armenian book. He retired from the library on January 3rd of this year. Uh, and he, we are very happy to have him here. Probably your first uh, venue since your retirement. But please give him a warm welcome. Thank you, Dr. Barbarian, Dr. Aslanian, Dr. Dariai, for this wonderful honor to speak about someone who I, I warn you I could speak hours about, but I won't. Let me read a message from Nina, and you will excuse me for um, calling her Nina, but she is not only my former professor, but family. And it is, I'm quite touched that you are dedicating this important conference to her. From Nina, allow me to offer my sincere thanks to Professors Aslanian and Beberian and Dariai, and to all the scholars associated with the conference who have so kindly chosen to honor me in this thoughtful fashion. If circumstances were other than they are, I would have taken great pleasure in attending and listening to the fruits of my younger colleagues' research. I am truly sorry that I cannot be with you, especially as I read the list of lectures for both days, which my colleague and friend Dr. Abdoyan has shared with me. I am convinced that they will be both informative and challenging. Please accept both my gratitude and my wish for a successful gathering. 
Nina G. Garcia. And now for my brief contribution. You will forgive me for reading, but I have a horror of going over to schedule, and I think I actually might be under my 15 minutes. I am today speaking about Nina Garsoyan's contribution to armino iranian studies. Quote, if the great Safavid cities failed to enchant me, I was totally overwhelmed by the vision in the neighborhood of Shiraz of the ruins of Persepolis, the Achaemenid tombs cut out of the rock face, and the monumental Sasanian reliefs beneath them at Nakshi Rastam and Nakshi Rajab. Even the relatively small tomb of Cyrus at Pasargadai loomed enormous in the surrounding emptiness. The sight of the overpowering majesty of these monuments finally crystallized my growing interest in ancient Armenia's great eastern neighbor and overlord, and especially my conviction that only the juxtaposition of the surviving visual evidence with the fragmentary textual material could lead to some understanding of the civilization that produced them. It has been an attempt to compensate for the paucity of early Armenian monuments and the all but complete loss of contemporary Persian texts by seeking to read the combination of the surviving accounts of early Armenian historians and the still extant Sasanian monuments as a single illustrated document." Unquote. That's Nina Garsoyan describing her 1970 trip to Iran as part of her year as an International Research and Exchanges Board Senior Fellow in her 2011 autobiography, De Vita Sua, which you can procure. Now, you could be forgiven for thinking that this trip was the start of her research on Iran and Armenia, but you would be wrong. She does credit her friend and mentor, the great Arminist Serapidur Nesesyan, with many of her future arguments. But to demonstrate how her own interest grew, let me use this time to describe Nina Garcian, the teacher. Nina was one of that small band of scholars responsible for rescuing the study of Armenia in the United States from that horrendous and truly insulting label, ethnic studies, and for successfully repositioning this study into the mainstream of scholarship. Now, as I began my own study with her in 1968, let me describe the mise-en-scene for her two-year, once-weekly, two-hour class on Armenian history and culture, and for her Byzantine seminar, which followed. You entered her office on, to on the top of floor of Kent Hall in the Department of Middle East Languages and Cultures. That is where she hung her, her hat as Arminist. Nina was also a member of the Department of History as Byzantinist. That split still perplexes me. You sat, relatively relaxed, facing her as she sat at a massive yet still institutional wooden desk as she began, precisely on time, and ended, precisely on time, with lectures that seamlessly had a start, a middle, and an end. I do not recall a time that my hands did not ache afterwards from my note taking. But I assure you that I am not the only one of her students, and she produced 14 PhDs, uh, not the only one who has lived off of these voluminous notes since then, and I could, if pressed, tell you some books which have incorporated those notes in them. Yet it was the first lecture which both enthralled and challenged you, and which led to all that followed as she traced Armenia's history from prehistoric times to the year 1828. A detailed, exhaustive bibliography was handed out, one highlighted the primary sources available, but also the relevant secondary sources. And then, on display for that first lecture and throughout was a three-dimensional defense mapping agency plastic contour map of modern Turkey, the Caucasus, and Iran. A two-dimensional map is really not adequate to demonstrate the eternal truth of Armenia's geopolitical re uh, reality. Rugged mounted ranges that made east-west transit relatively easy and north-south perilous and extremely difficult. Tall mountain passes snowed in for months in the winter added to the influences on Armenia's variegated history. And it was during this first lecture that we first heard her enunciate her theory, known now to many of her students and colleagues as Garsoyan's Law, and perhaps fully stated at the start of this influential article. Quote, from antiquity, Armenia's geographical positioning at the meeting point of the greco roman and Iranian worlds created a situation that favored the country's cultural life. 
enriching it with two major traditions, but playing havoc with the continuity of its political history. As a general pattern, therefore, Armenia flourished only when the contending forces on either side were in near equilibrium, and neither was in a position to dominate it entirely." Unquote. Ancillary to this was her interpretation of those closed, wintry mountain passes. In times of emergency, if one mountain dwelling fell, at least another survived. This came at a price, though. These communities developed apart for months, and much of Armenia's record of fragmentation and centrifugality against a central administration is owed to this geophysical aspect of its existence. Armenia's position between East and West is on full display when we consider the first two 6th century sources that explicitly cite Armenia. The writing of the Greek logographer Hecateus of Miletus and the victory inscription of Adrius the Great at Beistun. The Greek history of, of Herodotus and the depiction of the Armenians at Persepolis. Armenia as Persian satrapy in the Greek Xenophon's late 5th century in Abyssus. Nina detailed all these and more. The possible influence of the Par Parthian Magus Tiridates, the first trip to Rome following the 65 AD Peace of Randia, to receive the regalia of office from the Roman king Nero on the biblical narrative of the three Magi's visit to the ethereal king. All these and more were relayed by Nina before her trip of 1970. And the reason is central to her pedagogy primary sources of all descriptions. Before global history, Nina stressed the importance of gathering and interpreting all re relevant sources from within and without, all of them. There is simply no way to study any period of Armenian history without looking to its neighbors, but this is especially true in the ancient era. One did not make apologies for those sources. You let them speak. You gather them. You consider without any theoretical matrix. You reach your conclusions. And if competent scholarship offered valid criticism, you did not dig in and defend. You adapted. You reinterpreted. And this integrity she demonstrated in her 1969 Dumbart Notes paper, The Paulician History, A Reinterpretation, which took into account the comments and suggestions of her colleagues, which she considered and to which she reacted following the publication of her dissertation, The Paulician Heresy. Along with the textual record, we were given the other relevant tools for the study of Armenia in this same period. Archaeology, epigraphy, anthropology, art history, along with the caveat, which sadly, some 50 years later, is still cogent. The record is skewed. Much of this data, most of this data, comes from the area of the modern Republic of Armenia, which if one takes into account the Armenia, Armenia Minor in Asia Minor, comprises perhaps only one-seventh of historic Armenia. Persia, Iran, were already a part of her thinking before her trip because the sources were already there to document this relationship eloquently. <coughs> to deny these would be to skew history. Yet some, for whatever reason, do find it difficult to accept. Nina was one of the first scholars I invited as far of Artenon's day lecture at the Library of Congress. Her 1995 talk, Iranian Elements in Early Armenian Christianity, was well received except by one individual who denounced her vociferously as not knowing what she was talking about. So ferocious were this usually mild-mannered person's accusations that I ultimately had to silence him. Nina stood unmoved by this display as she was surrounded by those who had been engaged and enlightened by the talk. Yet far too often legitimate scholarship, whether about Armenian-Iranian studies or other epics, often continued to meet similar denunciation. To end, in that same passage which I quoted above from her autobiography, Nina writes, quote, the, the series of studies begun with the prolegomena to a study of the Iranian elements in Arsida, Armenia, was to dominate my life for years to come." Unquote. That seminal article, published in the influential Armenian Mahatarist journal Hantas Amsurya in 1976, set the tone for her future work. Quote, the political theory known to us from the surviving Persian sources, only from the late Sasanian times, is attested on the Armenian side from a far earlier Parthian period. Unquote. 
end quote. Hence, it seems permissible to hazard the hypothesis that a further study of the Iranian components in Arsacid Armenia should provide a guide not only for its own history, but also for an investigation of the Parthian period of Iranian history eradicated from the Persian sources by the antagonism of its Sasanian successors and simultaneously for a study of the gradual dehellenization of the eastern regions of Asia Minor and the consequent shift in the oriental cultural balance long before the advent of the Arab invasions." Unquote. I conclude this brief essay on Nina Garsain's contribution to Ar Armino-Iranian studies by suggesting that it resides not necessarily in the acceptance of her, her, her hypotheses and conclusions, but rather in the fact that largely through her efforts, the dialogue both on Iranian elements in Armenian history and culture and on the utility of Armenian sources for the study of Iran had now begun. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Abjoyan. This is, I mean, her words are so important. I mean, I've tried after 40 years to say something new. You just, you just can't really say much after this. Thank you so much. Uh, let's begin our first panel. And the first panel, it's called Purse Armenia Culture, Religion, and Kingship, and I'm the chair. So I'm going to give 20 minutes to uh, every speaker, uh, even though uh, we'll talk about this. But um, our first speaker, uh, Dr. Sherin Farid Nejad, from the Osterreich Akademie der Wissenschaften, the Austrian Academy of Sciences, who holds a German passport, was denied a visa to the US, obviously because of his Iranian ancestry. Apparently, a wall is not only uh, is being thought to be built here at the border, but a further field in Europe, which we are uh, really disappointed of this uh, really good young scholar uh, who was not allowed to come uh, to the US. Now, that was our first speaker. So the second speaker is Dr. Omar Kalaru, uh, who comes uh, uh, to us uh, from France, but you will soon learn that he is going to be going to Genoa. I had asked uh, each speaker to give me a uh, introduction and uh, you know, it talks about their accolades, their degrees, but I'd like to actually take a, again a more personal view of this, uh, of these scholars. Uh, Professor Kolaru has a PhD in ancient history from University of Pisa and from Paris, from uh, Pantone Sorbonne, and he works obviously in ancient history, but he's one of these versatile ancient historians who doesn't just do one place. Uh, he's also a numismatist, uh, a historian of Hellenism, uh, but easily moves uh, from, let's say, the Hellenistic world uh, and ancient history onto Armenia, and then you can go to Bactria and deal with ancient Bactria. And I think the future of ancient history lies with people like uh, Prof. Uh, Dr. Kolaru, who is going to very soon joining the University of Genoa, uh, for a research project. Uh, I like him very much because I met him in Genoa the first time. He took me to a wonderful restaurant and just brought me uh, some linguine with pesto from Italy, so he's my darling right now. Uh, he is going to be uh, talking about the city of brotherly love, the language of family affection in the Artasha dynasty between the Hellenistic and Parthian worlds. Please, Professor Kodar. Thank you. Uh, 
Can you hear me? Yes. <clears throat> okay. Um, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this very interesting uh, conference. I'm really honored to be here with many uh, important scholars on the field of uh, ancient Armenian and the Iranian history. What I'm doing tomorrow, uh, today is uh, talking about um, Armenian and Iranian relationships through Hellenism. So I try to do to this thing, and we start with um, a brief presentation of the Tabula Poitingeriana that you can see here. Uh, the Tabula Poitingeriana is a medieval copy of an ancient Roman map showing the road network of the Roman Empire, as well as that of areas politically and or economically connected to Rome, such as Persia, India, and China. At section 10.5, the map witnesses the existence of a settlement called Philadelphia. And you can see here. Uh, which is the Latin transcription of Greek Philadelphia, located on the road between Artaxata and Ekbatana, more precisely between the stations of Gobdi and the Trispeda at the borders of Media Atropatene. According to modern scholarship, the settlement was on the northern shores of Lake Urmia. Conrad Miller assumed that the town was located between Hoi and Marand, while Jacob Manandian argued for a location between modern Hoi and Tarvij. The founder of Philadelphia is unknown, but historians tentatively suggested Demetrius II of Syria or Artabanos I of Parthia as the possible founders because they both had Philadelphus, brother Lovin, uh, among their royal epithets. We cannot take into account the quite improbable hypothesis put forward by Miller, who assumed that the founder of uh, Philadelphia was Anarsasis, uh, second Philadelphus. In first place, because the son and the successor of Arsasis the first never bore such a title. And secondly, because during this reign, Parthia was not in measure of exerting any political influence on uh, Armenia. In fact, at the time, the territory of the Arsacid kingdom was more or less limited to Parthia proper, and after the Eastern Campaign of Antiochus III, Arsacid II had become a vassal client king of the Seleucids. Our attention then should be focused only on Demetrius II and Artabanus I. As for the latter, I think that the objection by Marie-Louise Chaumont is still valid. The Arsacid kings never named their foundations after a royal epithet but after their personal name. For example, Arsakia, Mithridatkart, Vologesia, etc. To this objection, we should uh, add that during his four years reign, Artabanos I was constantly occupied in conflicts in southern Mesopotamia, Media and Eastern Iran, where he eventually died while fighting against the Tokari. Thus, the presence of Artabanos in the area between Armenia and Media Tropatene is quite improbable and hardly explainable. Among the possible founders of Philadelphia, the Seleucid King Demetrius II has always been considered the most probable candidate. In fact, our historical sources tell us that Demetrius campaigned against Mithridates I of Parthia in order to regain the lost territories in Mesopotamia and Media and use the upper satrapies as military base to fight against the usurper Diodotus. However, after obtaining a number of victories against the Parthians, Demetrius was ambushed and taken prisoner. Mithridates sent him to Hyrcania, but he gave his daughter Rodogune in marriage. The chronology of this short-lived campaign has to be put between the spring of 139 BC and the summer of 138 BC. And here you can see the astronomical tablet from Babylon, which um, attests the, um, the war, the conflict that we, between Demetrius and uh, Mithridates. The text is quite fragmentary, but you can make out the, the story. So the, the king coming against uh, uh, Arsasis, which is Mithridates, and then is uh, the, the news of uh, his defeat. 
Thanks to the analysis conducted by Edward Dambrova, we know that the main area for the military operation of Demetrius was media. This strategical choice aimed to cut the communication routes between Mesopotamia and Parthia proper, forcing Mithridates to retreat to his ancestral kingdom. It is safer to assume that Demetrius won, uh, went directly to media from Syria without passing from Mesopotamia. We could uh, assume that Demetrius would ha have founded or renamed a pre-existent settlement with the name of Philadelphia during his march towards media. At first glance, such an explanation uh, seems quite logical, but sounds less convincing when we have a closer look to the geopolitical situation of the area. In this case, the hypothetical itinerary uh, followed uh, by Demetrius and his army raises some doubts when compared to the usual path taken by his predecessor, for example, Seleucus II or Antiochus III. Um, the itinerary went straight from Syria to Ecbatana. Demetrius, on the contrary, would have taken a long detour around the northern shores of Ormia Lake, and such a delay seems strange for a sovereign who needed to move quickly in order to reach media. Another element that does not result entirely convincing is the act of establishing a settlement in a territory that was no more under Seleucid control, at least since the... Um, uh, the 80s of the second century BC. Um, as, far, as far as we know, this will be the first case of a Seleucid settlement founded outside the sphere of, of political influence of the kingdom. We should also add that a significant political act such as the foundation of a settlement um, in Armenia would not be without consequences from the uh, local power. Finally, there is the question of the name of the settlement. According to Levy, Demetrius assumed the epithet of Philadelphos, brother loving, to honor the memory of his brother Antigonus, murdered when the usurper Alexander Ballas took the power. However, it is more likely that this title was chosen to celebrate the unity between Demetrius and his brother Antiochus Sidetes, both sent to Asia Minor by their father Demetrius I, in order to protect them during the civil war against Alexander Ballas. Beside Philadelphus, Demetrius II was also hailed as Nicator, Victorious, Theos, God, and also Theopator, son of a divine father. All those titles appear in different combinations on coin legends that vary depending on the region where these coins were minted. In, this, in the coinage of Demetrius, uh, the title Philadelphus never occurs alone, but always accompanied by one or the other epithets. On the other hand, the epithet of Nicator seems to have been his first and main title. The historian Appian, who apparently draws his information from Seleucid sources, employs this title when speaking of Demetrius II. As a consequence, the numismatic evidence shows that Philadelphus was not a title particularly favored by the king, or in any case, he did not have such a special place in the king's propaganda to justify the naming of a settlement after it. Although the evidence on Demetrius as founders of uh, Philadelphia is far from being conclusive, it was the best option at our disposal so far. However, I would like to introduce other two characters who could challenge the assumption that Demetrius was the actual founder of Philadelphia. I mean, the royal couple formed by Tigranes the fourth and his sister, Queen Erato. Son of Tigranes III, Tigranes IV succeeded his father without the Roman permission and married his sister Erato, who shared the throne with him. The couple received the support of Euphrates IV of Parthia, who favored the rising of an anti-Roman policy in Armenia. After a few years, Tigranes was dethroned by uh, the Romans and replaced with his uncle Artavasis III. However, this resolution met with such a strong opposition by the Armenian nobility that Tigranes and Rato, with the help of the Parthians, were restored in uh, around 2 BC. Augustus sent his grandson Gaius with his army to settle the questions one and once and for all. But Tigranes asked for peace and obtained the formal recognition for his crown by Augustus. By doing so, Tigranes aimed to accept Roman influence in the Armenian affairs. 
However, he was killed while fighting some orders of unspecified northern barbarians in uh, AD 1, and Erata uh, abdicated. Gaius Caesar then appointed Ario Barzanis, second of Media Tropatene, as king of Armenia, but his reign lasted only uh, one uh, year. Uh, because the Armenians revolted against the Roman settlement, Gaius Caesar put on the, put on the throne Artavasas IV, son of Ario Barzanes, but after a few years he was murdered, around AD 6. The Armenian throne was then occupied by Atigranes, possibly the grandson of Herodias the Great, but once again the Armenian nobles overthrew him and restored back Erato, who could reign as a ruler. Um, as sole ruler, at least for three years, from uh, AD 13 to 15, as suggested by the date uh, here, three, which appears on her coinage. Why men, uh, one uh, may object that neither Tigranes IV or Erato had the title of a Philadelphus, but I hope to show that this fact does not represent an insuperable obstacle. Let us begin our analysis by exploring the issues um, of the royal habitat. I showed elsewhere that the habit of producing coinage bearing graphic and or written messages concerning kinship, family unity, and the like originated from the Seleucid and alleged kingdoms, and it was adopted by non-Greek dynasties that uh, um, adapted it according to their own culture, creating new ways of communicating kinship-based propaganda. Among the Parthian kings, <laughs> Uh, the habit uh, of uh, sta uh, stating dynastic and family ties uh, uh, on coins makes its appearance by the second half of the second century BC, with Phratus II, for whom the habitats Philopator and the Theopator are attested in order to recall the memory of his father Mithridates I. As uh, Federico Muccioli points out, these titles became all the more frequent in the period of dynastic conflict uh, known as the Parthian Dark Age. It was then that a group of sovereigns, namely Gotarsis, you can see there on the, on the slide, Gotarsis I, Orodis I, Sinatrusis, Phratis III, and Orodis II, adopted these titles on their coinage to claim their legitimacy and filial piety towards their fathers. To these rulers, we have to add Mithridates III and Phratis IV, who also bore the epithet Eupator, whose father is good, is noble. The representation of other members of the royal family besides the king occurs only once in Parthian coinage, specifically in the joint reign of Musa and her son Fratakis. A gift to, a gift to Fratakis IV from Augustus, Musa soon became the favorite concubine of the king, to whom she gave birth to Fratakis. Taking advantage of her sway on Phratis, Musa persuaded the king to send his other sons to Rome as hostages, and then poisoned her husband and married her own son in order to hold power, although she did so under the appearance of a joint rule. Unlike a common Greek model, the couple is not depicted with joint busts, but separately on either side. This fact could indicate that the queen was recognized the status of public person. In the Artaxiad dynasty, the first king to adopt a royal epithet conveying a message of kinship and affection towards a member of the royal family is Tigran the Great, who in his early coinage styles himself as Philopator, but also Philelen, Greek loving, another popular epithet among the Arsacid kings since the times of Mithridates I. In fact, we know that um, uh, Tigranes spent his youth as a hostage at the court of Mithridates II, so it is not uh, uh, far-fetched to assume that the, he took inspiration for, from the Arsacid dynasty in the choice of his own titles. After Tigranes the Great, the only legend in the Artaxed coinage showing a reference to kinship is that of the joint rule of Tigranes IV and Erato. On the rest of the uh, four Calcoi issues, we can read the following legend, Erato Basileus Tigranu Adelfe, Erato, sister of King Tigranes. Let us take into account the iconography of the royal Armenian couple as it is depicted, depicted on coins from the period of second, um, 2 BC and uh, AD 1. The series of, of four Calcoi presents the portraits of brother and sister separate on the two sides of the coin. The bust of Tigranes on the obverse and that of Rato on the reverse. 
The bust of the sister queen is accompanied by the coin legend specifying that the woman represented is, represented is the sister of the grannies. Uh, this, this typology recalls the series portraying Fratakis and Musa, with the difference that Musa has the title of Basilisa, queen, and the royal epithet Thea Urania, heavenly goddess, a title that uh, to a Greek audience uh, recalled Aphrodite, but in the Iranian world was connected to Anahita. On the contrary, Erato is only defined as Hadalfe, sister of the king. This difference is justified by the special nature of the kingship of Musa, who, even though in, in a joint rule, was de facto the sole rule, ruler. Interesting enough, these two series are almost contemporary. Incidentally, we may notice that the two queens share two names belonging to the same semantical and cultural area. Musa's, Musa is the generic name for the muse, the goddess of art, while Erato is the personal name of the muse of lyric and love poetry. Another interesting portrait of the royal couple, uh, Tigranes Rato, is that appearing on the second, uh, two Calcoi series dated to the first year of Tigranes' second rule. Uh, okay. On the observe, obverse, uh, the couple is portrayed with the jugged busts according to the classic model introduced by the Hellenistic dynasty. Even more interesting, instant, uh, sorry, interesting, uh, the reverse offers one of, uh, or maybe the oldest representation of the double peaks of Mount Ararat. Given the paramount relevance of Mount Ararat for Armenian religious and cultural sphere, the iconography of the obverse and that of the reverse can be considered as independent. On the contrary, they are deeply intertwined because the royal couple, Tigranes Erato, mirrors the divine couple represented by the great and the little Ararat. From what we have seen, it is clear that the iconography adopted by Tigranes puts a strong emphasis on the special relationship between brother and sister, a relationship to which Tigranes' right to rule seems to get strength in the face of the Armenian people and the external political actors. Rome and Parthia. Thus, we may say that Tigranes is coming a message of family unity and, if you want to say it in Greek, of Philadelphia, brother love. But just as important is the chronology of this peculiar coin iconography. These issues belong to the second reign of Tigranes IV. Because of Tigranes' pro Parthian policy, Augustus had the king replaced with his uncle Artavasus III but the latter was driven out by the Armenian nobles after a short time. Then Tigranes was able to regain his throne thanks to the support of Parthia, but eventually he accepted the, to abandon, yes, I'm, to abandon uh, his pro-Parthian politics and uh, be crowned by Augustus, a fact that uh, is highlighted by additional royal title that Tigranes used on his coinage, Philokaisar, friend of Caesar. And you can see also on, on the reverse, reverse of the coin, just over the two peaks. Uh, the foundation of the renaming of a settlement celebrating brotherly love could fit the political situation of this period. It is possible that Tigranes and Erato had to show that their throne was strong enough because of their special relationship, a strong familial bond which could assure the continuity of the Artaxia dynasty. We may ask ourselves why they would have chosen a settlement located so close to the territory of Media Tropatene. We must admit that providing an answer to this question is not an easy task. Um, however, uh, we, can not, we can put forward a hypothesis. We have to take into account what happened after the death of Tigranes. We have seen that the immediate successor in the Armenian throne, selected by Gaius Caesar, were Ario Barzanis and Artavasis of Media Atropatini. It is possible that Tigranes and Rato were fully aware that their position in the eyes of Rome was weak and that Augustus and Gaius had already in mind other candidates, more precisely member of the dynasty of Atropatini. If this is the case, the foundation of the renaming of Philadelphia could be interpreted as a political message addressed not only to Rome and Parthia, but also and especially to their Atropatenian neighbors. And thank you for your attention. As we're changing our slides, uh, I'm wondering that we should maybe hold a question until the panel comes together, uh, and then we can we have time for questions and answers. Uh, the 
talk of uh, Dr. Kohler reminded me of uh, a great Italian historian, Arnoldo Momigliano, who said uh, in one of his writings that uh, when I was a student, I thought I need to know Greek to learn to know ancient history. I learned that you need German. Uh, I think uh, by looking and listening to uh, Dr. Collar's talk, we should also remember that you need to know numismatics or the uh, study of coinage to be able to uh, figure things out. So uh, thank you very much for that proposition, for the location of Philadelphia and who may have actually uh, constructed. Our uh, next speaker is Professor Matthew Kanipa. Uh, oh, he knows his way around here because he is the uh, Professor of Art History and Elahe Omidyar Mir Jalali Presidential Chair in Art History and Archaeology of Ancient Iran at UCI. Uh, we were fortunate to have uh, the endowed chair from Professor Mir Jalali, which now from this year, Professor Kanipa has joined us. However, this quarter, he's at the beautiful uh, Getty Villa as the Villa Scholar at the Getty Research Institute. Now, I could say about his two devastatingly good uh, books, uh, the first one having won all sorts of prizes, and, uh, but I tend to understand how important he is because every other week he's somewhere in the world giving a lecture and giving keynote lectures. Uh, so we're very proud uh, to have him. Uh, as someone who understands ancient Iranian history, but the intersection of art, religion, and culture of ancient Iran. <coughs> His talk is uh, entitled Perso Macedonian Armeno Iranian Shared Dynastic Histories and the Intertwined Cultures of Kingship After the Achaemenids. Professor Penita. Thank you too much. And it's, uh, it's also my pleasure to be able to speak in this, uh, this conference honoring uh, Professor Garcian. And uh, just reading her books as a graduate student was sort of a, an education in uh, methodologies that uh, I've benefited from in my own scholarship. And I think what I've, I've learned from her the most was the importance of, of course, sources. And in many periods of Armenian as well as Iranian history, uh, the most reliable sources and the ones that tell the most uh, interesting story are not textual and rather archaeological, numismatic, um, even potsherds. And uh, she was way ahead of her time in the way that she was able to integrate all streams of textual evidence with the archaeological evidence and visual evidence too. So I uh, feel honored to be able to, at this point in my career, um, honor uh, her contributions and work. So, can you hear me? Good. All right. So this paper explores the intertwined problems of the development of Iranian and Armenian royal identity in Western Asia at the end of antiquity. And Armenian kingship emerged from several continuous and ancient Iranian traditions of post uh Hellenistic kingship. These traditions pers persisted in the Caucasus even while they disappeared elsewhere in the Iranian plateau. Now, while previous scholarship has largely focused on the Urartian through Achaemenid period, or the vast new Christian topography of power that coalesced, uh, that coalesced in the Middle Ages, my goal here is to document and explore the points of transition, continuity, and rupture between these two periods, thus the post-Achaemenid and late antique periods. This paper concentrates on the archaeological and textual evidence of cities, sanctuaries, tombs, palaces, and paradises of the 4th centuries BCE through the 4th century CE. I'm going to focus on three problems, royal cities and the topographies of power that they created, funerary traditions, and royal cultures of luxury, such as hunting and banqueting. While the adoption of Christianity introduced certain dramatic ruptures in Armenian culture, the Arsacid dynasty also engaged the ancient past, that is the Arsacid dynasty of Armenia, uh, engaged the ancient past to navigate an identity that spoke to, yet remained distinct from, their Sasanian competitors. This lecture, by necessity, challenges the assumption that there's a unified 
and naturally replicating tradition of Iranian kingship, manifesting itself in things like palatial architecture, sacred architecture, ruler representation, etc. Um, and this is this is something that I see equally important with Armenia because for Armenia, I understand Armenian kingship to be yet another manifestation of Iranian kingship. And you know, forgive the, the shameless plug, but this is also why I dedicated a, a quarter of my latest book to uh, the traditions of Anatolia and the Caucasus, especially Armenian kingship. Um, so while the Parthians eventually became the dominant Iranian and Western Asian imperial power, a number of kingdoms ruled by Iranian dynasts, Anatolia and the Caucasus, and especially Armenia, presented alternative visions of Iranian power. But for the outcome of a few battles, these could have become equally dominant Iranian traditions, or rather, we should just say, imperial traditions. So a little bit of, of context here. In his haste to reach the core of the Persian Empire, Alexander left many Achaemenid satraps in power and bypassed some regions, such as Cappadocia and Armenia, entirely. Many of these Persian aristocratic families survived the coming of the Macedonians and ended up carving out new kingdoms after the dissolution of the Seleucid Empire. Among the most important of these dynasties in the post Achaemenid West were the Arantid dynasty of Armenia and Sophene, whose descendants later ruled the kingdom of Comagene. The rise of their Sassanid dynasty was initially a rupture in this continuous development of post achaemenid Iranian kingship across Western Asia, including Armenia. While the Arsacids and later the Sasanians eventually became the dominant Iranian power, uh, kings, most notably like Tigran Metz, Tigran the Great, uh, could have become an equally dominant uh, Iranian king of kings. So let's shift our focus to sites and ritual traditions that were implicated in maintaining a Perso-Armenian royal identity from the Arantid dynasty uh, to the Arshakuni dynasty at, in the late antiquity. Uh, the symbolic topography of Armenia noticeably shifts from the Achaemenid through the Arantid, Artaxid, and Arsacid periods, with especially dramatic and deliberate changes occurring as the new Arantid and Artaxid kings took power. I've selected a number of sites to illustrate these strategic choices that Armenian sovereigns and, and peoples made to connect themselves with their ancient and illustrious past, uh, transcend, uh, transcending pre to post conversion. It is no, noteworthy that there's no single site that remained significant and continuously occupied in greater Armenia from the Achaemenid uh, through late antiquity. So in a lot of ways we're dealing here with uh, sort of a conceptual topography of power that is grounded and then regrounded at numerous different sites. After a fall of the, of the Achaemenid dynasty, the Orontids of Highland Armenia built at strategically important sites featuring venerable ruins uh, or places of natural beauty. And they used these to create new a new independent royal identity. They deliberately excluded ruins that had been associated with Persian satrapal rule choosing instead to build at sites that have been unoccupied since the Urartian period, such as Erebuni, Altintepe, and Oshakan, which have formed the Arantid satrapal topography. Um, so the question is, why did they uh, ignore the sites that were important under the Chemnitz and choose to build at these va uh, vastly more ancient sites? Um, I would argue, along with, with uh, some others, that this marks a distinct and likely deliberate poli uh, policy, wherein the, or or the Orontids selected a new site, um, a site with this deep sense of antiquity, to build a new royal identity, uh, rather than construct their identity on uh, that of a subordinate uh, satrap. So the Orontes and later early Artaxias deliberately excluded sites and forms drawn from Persian satrapal traditions and favored sites such as Armavir that had not served as a major uh, settlement since the Urartian period. By eschewing these sites of Persian satrapal power, they knew by no means rejected an association with the empire and dynasty. Instead, they embarked on a new mission to build a new royal identity. And Armenia's rich topography of magnificent ruins provided ample raw material to build a newly ancient and deeply locally rooted royal rather than satrapal persona. 
the Orontid, breakaway Orontid dynasty of Sofine, or Sapach in, uh, in Armenian, followed a remarkably similar strategy to their forebears in greater Armenia. And the Orontids here also foregrounded Persian onomastic uh, and toponymic, as well as architectural traditions, but they did not reuse sites tied to Achaemenid or Seleucid satrapal rule as their main residences. None of the Orontids' major settlements were continuously occupied from the Achaemenid through the early Hellenistic period. And this is the case within Sophine as well as Kamagine as well. The founding of cities as the joy of the ruler seems to be a quintessentially Ar Orontid tradition. And this is evident not just in the Orontid highlands, but Orontid Sophine and later Kamagine. Uh, Samis, the first, the Orontid ruler who established uh, Sophine as a separate Orontid kingdom, depended on the Seleucid Empire, uh, founded the city of Samosata sometime before, uh, before 245 BCE on the site of Hittite Kumo. Here, the ex excavators recovered a structure with well-finished limestone orthostats revetting an earth-filled wall. Later, the city of Arsamosata uh, was founded in 240 by Arsamis, both ancestors of Antiochus of Comagene. Interestingly, at both of these sites, there appears to be a very noticeable uh, several centuries gap between the Assyrian and early Hellenistic levels, with no significant Persian remains. Thus, again, um, ancient sites, uh, but one that you could create a new identity from. Now, a fur further word on these onomastic strategies. The personal names and toponyms of the royal foundations of the Orontids accentuated their Persian dynastic claims and Iranian cultural roots. They bore names such as Xerxes and Arsamis, uh, uh, which was a common name within the Achaemenid family and among Persian elites. Samis, possibly derived from Avestan Sama, uh, father of the Avestan hero Kershaspa, which would attest to some tradition of Iranian religious or epic lore within the family. Moreover, in naming cities as the joy of or happiness of the founder, um, this was a characteristically Orontid arta Artaxia practice that evoked Achaemenid traditions and occurs as a pattern in several, several foundations, such as Samosata. These naming conventions had deep Achaemenid roots, uh, but their more proximate precedence can be found among the Orontids of Armenia. Like Orontid Armavir, Artaxias founded Artashat at a site that did not have a history of occupation in the Achaemenid era, uh, but did bear the remains of an Artian fortress. The city's early levels indicate that domestic architecture evolved from uh, local Artian traditions, though the city eventually admits influence from Mediterranean city planning and architecture under Tigran II. Uh, like ruler representation, Armenian urbanism changes fundamentally with Tigranes II. In those cases where we have information beyond simply uh, the existence of a settlement, the textual and archaeological evidence indicates that these foundations did not adhere to any one tradition, but rather were an expression of an actors in a new developing middle Iranian dynamic. In a strategy that parallels aspects of Seleucid settlements, uh, Tigran the Great founded or refounded a number of eponymous settlements in the core of his kingdom and his newly won empire. These cities all bore the same uh, Iranian name, Tigranakert, built by Tigran. Certain elements within the cities were taken from Hellenistic models, such as theaters that were built and used in uh, Tigranakert Artsakh and Ardashat. But turning to domestic and palatial architecture, not a single monumental structure of a Hellenistic type has uh, yet been discovered. As Armenia contracted with the advance of the Parthians and the Romans, uh, the sites in the Armenian highlands around the Ararat plain became more important. For their part, the Arsacids used Artashat as a royal residence. However, many of the royal sites in Greater Armenia maintained their significance for the Arsacid dynasty and for the Armenian people in general. Independent of a royal city, Bhagavan was the site of an important sanctuary since its Orontid foundation and contained the tombs of several dynasties. It was located on the southern arm of the Euphrates, the Muratsu, at the foot of Mount Nipat. The literary evidence suggests that the site hosted open-air altars to several gods and eventually, under the Arsacids, an ever-burning fire, the fire of Aramazd. 
Very few pre-Christian temples have been excavated in Armenia, and most of these come from the Sasanian period. In fact, the majority of archaeological evidence cited for fire temples in Armenia were discovered in pre-existing structures, either palaces or Christian churches, that were converted to serve Zoroastrian cult during the Persian occupations, uh, such as Etchmeazin and Dvin. Literary descriptions and scattered archaeological uh, evidence suggest that the early sacred sites were open-air sanctuaries with some attached cult buildings. Only in the third century, under Sasanian influence and with the introduction of fire temple, temple architecture, uh, do temples appear. Um, so bringing ourselves back to this site, the Arsacid dynasty continued to honor Bhagavan, and this was the sanctuary where they celebrated the Iranian New Year's. Once Armenia became Christian, much of this ancient landscape was given a new Christian significance with new ecclesiastical and monastic monuments growing at the sites. This was not an absolute rupture, um, however, and Armenian kingship and culture retained many deeply ingrained elements of his Iranian heritage long after his conversion. Uh, the Arsaces continued to cultivate a connection with sites such as these that connected them back to this ancient Iranian topography of power. And as it unfolded according to different processes in Rome, several of the pre-Christian sanctuaries gained new Christian uh, significance and structures. According to Agad Angelos, uh, St. Gregory met and baptized Tirdat III and his court at the ancient site of Bhagavan. Now significant as a site of royal conversion, it continued to function as an important site of power within an Armenian royal topography of power and memory. And St. Gregory founded the monastery of St. John the Baptist there, which created an alternative monumental and architectural focus. The site's pre-Christian significance, however, was not forgotten. And it's not entirely, it's entirely likely that it motivated the Sasanian king, Yazgir II's decision to camp there upon his uh, 439 invasion of Armenia. Many of the same Armenian sources suggest that the Arsaces integrated pre-Arsacid royal tombs into their wider topography of power. Um, interestingly, even those branches of the Arantid dynasty that did not hold power over greater Armenia. According to Strabo, the original royal city of Sophine, or Sopak, was Carth or, uh, Carthéo Kurta. Pliny the Elder lists it among the most important settlements in the region and specifies that it is on the Tigris. The Acropolis retains an abraded Assyrian relief whose significance lay in its ability to provide a more general yet tangible connection with an ancient, though open-ended, past. With this Iranian Kurt suffix, the name is in the style of an Armenian royal foundation. Um, and uh, this is, you know, it was kind of a uh, still conjecture of who this might have been, or you know, if this was a kind of a corruption in the text, but a recently discovered coin of a king Arcathius uh, now provides us with the name of a possible founder, or rather, refounder, more, more likely. Uh, the cliffs of the citadel preserve a small Assyrian relief and damaged inscription, as well as uh, these uh, tomb structures below, which respond to contemporary, uh, contemporary Hellenistic architectural traditions. Sites dedicated entirely to the funerary traditions of the Arshakuni Armenian kings follow a similar trajectory with early sites that grew from Arantid, Artaxid, and Arsacid practices grafted onto new Christian cultic and later architectural contexts. Textual evidence indicates that the main royal necropolis of the Arsacid kings was located in the fortress of Ani at Daranalik in the Euphrates, present-day Kema, Turkey. The citadel was occupied through the Middle Ages and even besieged by Timur, and nothing of the ancient fortress or funerary monuments survive. From the sparse mentions in the Buzandaran, it appears the funerary monuments were freestanding megalithic structures, no trace of which survive, though several areas retain traces of rough, rough stone masonry foundations, such as the rise at the end of the plateau, which you can see here in this uh, panoramic photo I took several years ago when I was conducting field research. The Arsacid necropolis here was associated with the sanctuary to Zeus Aramazd, which our main sources say contained altar and statues but no temple, thus in keeping with the tradition of the Arantid or Taxian open-air sanctuary. In the course of St. Gregory's destruction of pagan sanctuaries and you know, overall land grab of important, um, important aristocratic uh, estates, the altar of Zeus Aramazd was overthrown, and in its place, Agatangelos states that the Lord sign was erected, 
most likely a stone stele or kashkar, uh, dedicating, uh, suggesting that the new Christian church, in a sense, appropriated the Arsacid necropolis, but kept the original uh, royal features of an Iranian dynastic funerary sanctuary. In the course of Shapur II's first invasion of Armenia, the Persians desecrated the necropolis at Ani and plundered the Arsacid's accumulated treasure and taking the bones of the kings. And here we witness an important rupture. Once the bones were returned in negotiations, the Armenian Nahrars established a new royal necropolis at the site of Ax in the southeast of Mount Aragats. Or architecturally and cultically, this site prevents a shift from previous traditions and reflects new de newly developing Christian traditions. The focal point was a single aisled Christian basilica and below ground a hypogeum, um, which previous scholarship understood to contain the royal bones. The apse cruciform hypogeum adjoined the basilica to the south of the church's apse. That is until uh, recent excavations under the floor of the church exposed multiple stone ossuaries, which when opened revealed a great quantity of bone fragments. And Movsis Horanatsi uh, indicates that the bones of the Christian and pre-Christian kings were mixed together and correspondingly, uh, this corresponds closely to the finds. The appearance of this basilica form structure uh, are architectural and religious traditions that accompany newly intensified Roman influence in Armenia. Nevertheless, elements of the Iranian royal culture uh, are detectable in the terracotta plaques and intermixed bones um, which show up in symbols such as birds and horses bearing the royal diadem. Just as importantly, the, ver the very fact that these bones themselves were this important also uh, comes from the Iranian uh, royal cultural traditions. And like Ani, a stone stele was originally associated with the site, though now in this case, bearing the Lord's sign. Um, in addition to taking control of sites, the Armenian kings appropriated several royal practices, uh, most notably hunting. And these uh, were created at uh, early Arantid sites and even in late antiquity. Uh, the Arsacids, the Arshakuni dynasty, favored the region around Garni, not only for fortresses and churches, but on its outskirts built a new paradise, a hunting paradise. And the Arsacid king Hosro II created two large hunting reserves between Garni and the new residence of Dvin. Um, now, our textual sources indicated that he did this because he was weak and pleasure-loving, uh, but the meaning comes in a sharp relief when we remind ourselves that the Persians were at uh, Hosro II's uh, doorstep. And these sites and royal performances shored up his credentials as an Armenian and Arsacid, uh, Armenian and Iranian king. The Persian practices and iconographies of princely banqueting were a portable technology of power for displaying wealth and refinement, inculcating hierarchy. They appeared as widely as the sphere of Iranian cultural influence was felt, from Rome to the steppe empires of the Turks and the Tibetan elites, to the Sogdi and Central Asia, all the way to Tang, China. Um, and this is an example of the type of objects that spread widely throughout Eurasia. And this helps explain the appearance of these silver vessels, um, such as yours, in some surprisingly unexpected places. Um, together, Georgia and Armenia paint a picture of aristocracies that engaged both the Roman and the Iranian cultural and political worlds while retaining distinct Armenian cultural identities. Armenia's ecclesiastical architecture complements and contextualizes this rather sparse evidence of late antique uh, uh, architecture. Relief carving on them celebrating wealth, strength, and prowess in Armenian terms appear on the exterior of several of these churches, including hunting. And in effect, these churches can be compared to Armenian, or likened to a sort of Iranian rock reliefs. The facade of the Amatuni family, 7th century uh, church at Ptolni, uh, also prominent, uh, prominently displays friezes of Sasanian style uh, teardrop ewers. This sort of vessel was popular in, used in the Persian Basim and became widely popular across Eurasia. And the frieze, with the frieze nearby and with his Iranian style riding costumes, albeit like crudely rendered in the reliefs, the horsemen uh, portrayed here in the frieze 
appears as an aristocrat invested with the same sort of, quote, serving vessels of gold, royal robes, gilded diadems, and stockings set with precious gems and stones that the Iranian king, Hosra II's Armenian commander, uh, Simbat Bagratuni, received early in his career. So the ewers, as ornament, cloaked the church in a diffuse reference to cultural knowledge and political authority. So to conclude, Armenian sovereigns presented different responses to the same challenge, how to present a vision of legitimacy and charismatic royal power in a post-Parthian Western Asia. The de development of these new traditions of Armenian or Sassic kingship was a means to navigate multiple pows, poles of power and root initially ephemeral political power deeply into the landscape. These strategies enabled the Arsaces to deploy ancient competing Iranian topographies of power and practices in opposition to Sasanian pressure. The Arsacid court turned a different face toward the Roman world, but as witnessed by the intense interest and considerable resources the Arshakuni dynasty expended, the ancient Iranian past was a deep well of power and legitimacy, and was the idiom that the Sasanians found most powerful and threatening. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this brings us to our last speaker uh, for this session uh, before uh, we have the question and answer session. Uh, our last speaker for this panel is uh, Dr. Tim Greenwood from the University of St. Andrews. Uh, Professor Greenwood uh, has been teaching and doing research at St. Andrews for the past decade, and he focuses on late antique and medieval Armenian political, social, and cultural history. Uh, you may have, uh, if you have uh, Sebius's translation, you may have seen, of course, his work as part of this team translation and commentary on an important Armenian text for Iran and Armenia, and I think uh, late antiquity. Uh, again, just to move away from his work, uh, if you ever go to St. Andrews and if you're interested in anything in Armenian, uh, it is uh, Professor Greenwood uh, who can best uh, navigate you through many things. And he always has a wealth of information. One of his specialties is actually to work on lesser studied <coughs> Armenian texts in late antiquity and certainly medieval times. And he's always able to pull out some amazing information on other texts that haven't been translated yet at least for the historians, uh, or they have been uh, translated. And that's why I was reading slow, because I couldn't read. So Professor Greenwood, who is going to join us uh, with, uh, through Skype from St. Andrews, uh, is going to be talking about Armenia and Iran in late antiquity, new perspectives. So I should like to express my sincere thanks to Huri and Turaj for their kind invitation to participate in this conference, and to yourself, Saeed, for your technical assistance in enabling you, me to speak to you all from the shores of Scotland. I'm sorry I cannot be with you in person today, but I look forward to catching up with you all at some point in the future. So we're now on the slide that says introduction in bold. Yeah. It's 30 years since the publication of Professor Gasoyman's magisterial study of Guzandaran Padmutium. As you will recognize, the methodology underpinning this paper was inspired by the five extraordinary appendices which accompanied her introduction, translation, and commentary. What if you took her analysis of technical terms and applied it comparatively across several compositions? The first part of this paper is devoted to this, exploring the changing terminology for rulership across four late antique Armenian historical compositions. The second part of this paper analyzes the nature of the relationship, real and imagined, between Armenia and Iran, ruled and ruler, in political, social, and ju juridical terms, through just one of these texts, the history of Khazar Parpetsi. We shall be doing so principally through the often overlooked 
third book. This means we shall not be focusing on the revolt of Vartan Mamakunian, the Battle of Abadair, or the actions and fates of the Levondiank, but rather the events of three decades later, which brought about the lasting political settlement. How were Vahan Mamakonian and his supporters reconciled with the Shahanshah? How was this described by Hazar? As Professor Gastrian appreciated, late antique Armenian texts afford insight into the specific social, intellectual, and cultural circumstances which may not always have been in harmony with one another. They are necessarily diverse, preserving a range of different perspectives. All historical compositions construct their own stories in their own ways, and this is as true within the Armenian tradition as any other. Individual histories are not installments in a single grand narrative. Although Sasanian Shahanshahs could be represented as impious, far-worshipping persecutors of their Armenian subjects, they could also be represented as legitimate rulers and occasionally even closet Christians. And while Armenians were imagined as a community of faithful believers holding out against apostates and others, ready to die for their faith if need be, they could also be loyal subjects of the Shahanshah, integrated into political, social, and legal networks, institutions, and practices of Eran Shah. This is where book three of Hazar Pakatsi's history possesses a particular value, because the whole work was written for Vahan Mamikonian himself, 15 years after the political resolution, when it was still a recent experience and within living memory for many. Although we should not take every aspect at face value, I find it impossible that Vahan ever told Vahash the Shahanshah, your religion seems to us false and the babblings of mindless men. Book three nevertheless reflects contemporary political processes and legal norms then operating within and across Sasanian Iran. Khazar's history, therefore, is both a work of Armenian literature, apparently peering in to Iran from a distance, and a work composed wholly under Sasanian hegemony, informed by, infused with, present experience. It's not a question of disentangling the Armenian from the Iranian. In many aspects, they are, inse they are inseparable, one from the other. Let's then turn to analyze the terminology of rulership across four of the principal Armenian historical texts. And you should be seeing the four on the slide. You'll notice that for the moment, I've excluded the famous and famously controversial history of Moses Khornatsi. The kind of approach I'm adopting this morning requires confidence in the chronological sequence. And since the date of Moses' highly sophisticated work remains so contested, it would risk invalidating the results to include it. Rather than work through each text, I'm going to take a step back and make some more general observations. If we look first at the most common terms for king, Hagavor and Archai, we find that the choice of term does not here to denote a particular quality of kingship or imply a set of attributes. Tagavod is used more frequently in all four compositions. In the Buzandaran and Khazar's history, both are applied to Ashokuni kings of Armenia and Sasanian kings of Iran in similar contexts. There are many instances where the same figure is titled with first one and then the other in consecutive sentences. One weak pattern of distribution across all four works is that archai seems to be preferred in direct speech. The only consistently strong pattern in relation to these terms is that the Roman emperor is always tagavor rather than archai in the first three texts, twice in the Buzandaran, but never in Hazar or Yeishe's history. But this changes in Sebios, when Roman rulers are for the first time consistently called archai, but this particular transition occurs only after the demise of Khusrow II in 628. I'm not going to go into this any further, beyond noting that the demise of Sasanian Iran in the middle of the 7th century had an impact on how Roman emperors were titled, 
their presence in the narrative, and models of rulership generally. Finally, whereas Takaburutun is found only in worldly contexts, Akayutun is limited to the heavenly realms. Now, there are three titles which are applied exclusively to either Iranian or Roman rulers. In books two and three of Khazar's history, the Iranian ruler is defined as Akai Takai, King of Kings, on 20 occasions, all but one in direct speech. In Yeishe's history, this title is used on seven occasions, principally in dating clauses. Sebios employed it on just three occasions, again, always in direct speech, but it's never used in the Buzandaran. Secondly, the term Ter Ariats, Lord of the Aryans, the Lord of Iran, occurs four times in book two of Khazar's history and 31 times in book three. It's not found in any of the other texts. This notion then of those of Iran is particularly prominent in Khazar's history, being mentioned on four occasions in book one, 49 occasions in book two, and no fewer than 106 occasions in book three. By comparison, it appears just seven times in the Dukuzan 13 times in Yeshe's history, and twice in Sebios. Finally, as you would expect, Kaisera is applied only to the Roman emperor. Now, it's of course much easier to assess how the texts correspond and diverge in their use of specific terms than it is to establish why they do so. But nevertheless, I'm going to advance some tentative thoughts. Firstly, the Buzantaran is the only composition in this study to represent the Ashikuni kingdom of Armenia as a present reality. And it's unsurprising to discover that Armenian kings feature very prominently, twice as often as kings of Sasanian Iran. It's however very noticeable that the same terms were applied to both kings of Armenia and Iran. Neither king of kings, Akhaiz Akai, nor Ter Ariats is used. This has the effect of establishing parity between the two kings within the imagined historical landscape. It serves to diminish, to delegitimize the Sasanian royal line by implying it didn't have the right to use the traditional Iranian title King of Kings. Now, of course, arguments from silence are always problematic, but the absence of this title is striking, given that it occurs in all the other compositions, as well as being attested in the surviving third century Middle Persian inscriptions commemorating Sasanian rulers. By contrast, Hazar's history employs both Akait Akai and Ter Ariats. Indeed, it's the only composition which uses the latter title for the Persian ruler. This is consistent with Hazar's stress on the notion of Iran as a meaningful category of identity. He's at pains to stress that Armenians are not Er, they're not members of the community of Iran Shah. On five occasions, the phrase you Aryans is employed in direct speech by an Armenian with the evident purpose of differentiating us, that is Armenians. Khazar also uses the phrase Ariats, yet an Ariats, of Iran and not Iran. For Khazar, these terms define those who belonged to different religious communities, those who were Er and those who were not an Er. The distinction, however, did not prevent members of the Armenian nobility from serving the Shah and Shah faithfully on the field of battle in the past. Next slide. Vardan Mamikonian is described by the venomous Hazarapet Mir Merseh as, and I quote, a man of courage who assisted the Lord of Iran. The memory of his greatest actions persists in Iran Shah, and many military commanders and other Aryans with whom he fought also remember. And even the Lord who is like a god has seen with his own eyes at Mavirot, his love of valor. So here we find Vartan Mamikonian himself, the hero of Avarar, had fought previously for the Shah in eastern Iran. Intriguingly, one of the conditions of political re-engagement in 485 is that the Armenian cavalry are once again made available for service to the Shah At the turn of the century, therefore, Hazar accepts that the normal state of affairs is for Christian Armenians to serve non-Christian rulers. Moving briefly to Yeishe, from a terminological perspective, Yeishe's history lacks the nuance of Hazar's work. By stressing Iran, not Iran, and employing Ter Ariats for the Sasanian ruler, 
Hazard highlights the different religious communities without implying political or social exclusion. Yeishe's history, on the other hand, presents a simple dichotomy between Persians and Armenians, them and us, a more straightforward, but also a more uncompromising construction of the relationship. Peter Cowley has noticed that the changes to the narrative serve to highlight the spiritual dimension of the revolt, producing, and I quote, a sharpening of focus and a polarization of the opposing values. And this terminological analysis would seem to support that. One striking feature of Yeishe's history in terms of rulership is the anonymity of the Sasanian king, Yazdegerd II. Tagavod is always used anonymously, whilst only eight of the 24 references to Archai also include the name king. This has the effect of imparting a timeless quality to the narrative, and it may not be coincidental that Yeishe's composition was more influential on later generations and much copied. It reflects a wholly different context of production, disengaged from the world of politics. So in sum, comparative terminological analysis offers a fresh way of exploring the relationship between Armenia and Iran. I suspect that similar evaluations could be done in respect to other terms of an administrative, fiscal or legal nature to discern patterns of use and reveal developments and change over time. Let's turn briefly then to book three of Hazar's history. I proposed earlier that its account of the political reintegration of Vahan Mamikonian 30 years after the rebellion of Bardan speaks powerfully to the nature of the relationships real and imagined between ruler and ruled. If you have ever consulted this, you'll be aware that the account is very long and comprises a whole series of speeches. Now, I am not about to propose that Hazar was somehow present at these events, nor that they reflect verbatim accounts of what was said. Condemning Zoroastrian teaching in the presence of the Shahanshah as the babblings of mindless men confirms this, but Hazar clearly has his own agenda here. Is it that members of the Armenian elite are once again compromising or rejecting their Christian heritage? Or could it be that it's specifically Armenian Christianity which is under threat from the teachings of the Church of the East? Either way, it does seem to be that the assumptions underlying, under, underpinning the narrative about political philosophy, law, court protocol, and the language used to record them invites close attention. Now, I've selected three extracts to illustrate this. The first comprises, uh, comprises rather an exchange between the Persian commander Mehran and Vahan Mamikonian in the context of negotiations. Vahan reflects on two ideal qualities of the Ter Areats, that he should be accessible and that he should be impartial in all respects. He should make considered judgments having consulted and listened in person. Bahan's complaint is that the Lord of Aran has made his decisions in respect of Armenia on the testimony of others, rather than the protagonists themselves. In the second, Bahan presents three demands to the new Shahanshah Bahash. First, for religious freedom for Armenians, second, for discernment and just decision-making, and thirdly, for direct access to the Shahanshah. So that's repeating two of the earlier um, observations from the first extract. Vahan requests, allow us our ancestral and inalienable religion. Now, Vahan's petition is couched in both genealogical and legal terms, maintaining that his religion, Aurenk, should be treated as an inalienable legal right, as if it were inalienable family property. As Thompson and others have argued, Aurenk has the sense of religious law, the traditions, practices, and precepts bound up in the performance of religious belief. This use of legal terminology indicates familiarity with Sasanian jurisprudence. And the third and final extract echoes this legal context. The final exchange between Bahan and Bahash is depicted by Hazard um, with the Shahanshah asking Bahan, is he content? Has he been well treated? Does he have any other requests? To which Bahan replies by inviting Bahash to grant the title of Tanutar to a member of the Kamsara Khan family. That is confirmation of the legal status of that individual as paterfamilias, head of the family, with all of the family property vested in him. This the Shahanshah does, but he follows it by commenting that in relation to the lordship of the Archunis, this will have to wait until they perform some worldly service for himself on the land of Iran. This making the vesting of family property at least in Armenia at this time, 
contingent on loyal performance is a striking feature. So this is all quite involved, and I wouldn't pretend otherwise. It seems to me that Hazar is projecting an image of the ideal Sasanian monarch, at least from an Armenian perspective, as one who listens to his subjects, who does not make arbitrary decisions, who is accessible and performs justice as required. Baharsh exemplifies these virtues. He is the one who holds natural, constrained, con and consensual authority. But here it's the performance of kingship in council with all the nobles of Iran in attendance, which is stressed. A Hazar, therefore, Sasanian court and legal culture associated with it, creates a forum for ruler and ruled to relate to one another, to perform kingship, a space in which religious distinctions may be subsumed. Now, whether or not events unfolded in quite the way that Hazar depicts is less significant than the fact that they could be conceptualized in these terms, establishing and promoting the authority of Bahadamakoniam. He becomes an effective patron with access to the court of the Shahanshah and the ear of the Shahanshah himself. If the depiction of the court and Bahad's access to it was wholly outside the spectrum of possibilities, how could this text have worked as a literary production? So to conclude, it has set out two new perspectives for studying Armenia and Iran in late antiquity. The first is methodological, employing comparative terminological analysis discern patterns of use for certain terms, and inviting reflections on when and why certain terms are used. As I suggested, this could be repeated with other terminology. The second is more revisionist in character, arguing that book three of Hazar Papetzi's history serves as a highly instructive guide to ideals of Iranian rulership, to performative kingship and legal process. Composed so close to the events described, it holds particular significance for the wider study of Sasanian Iran at this juncture. I would not want to suggest that it is somehow normative or representative of the relationship between the Shah and Shah and his Armenian subjects. This is Vahash we are talking about. Nevertheless, as with so many Armenian compositions, it does merit renewed study. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks. I, I, to be honest, I can't see any of you. It's so I have Turaj. To uh, Tim, it's Turaj. Tim? Yeah, hi there. Uh, hi, how are you? We're going, missing yeah, you. Uh, hopefully next time. We'll be... Next time, exactly. Exactly. Uh, would you mind staying on since we're going to have a panel discussion? Uh, although you haven't heard the pa early papers, but you are in the first panel. Would you mind being on for a little bit more? I'd be delighted to be. 15 more. No problem. Can I ask the speakers of the first panel to come forward and take their seats? I have learned from Professor Rollinger, who's back there. I'm going to go uh, chair the panel and point at people and make sure there is a discussion and things go well. Okay, I have a question for each one of the presenters and one general question for all if we have time. Uh, my first question is to Professor uh, Koloru, and uh, I'm an early modernist, so I may be excused for not really knowing my ancient material as well, but I know a few things. So my question is, uh, I was under the impression that consanguineous marriages and incest, essentially, was something that was uh, uniquely Sasanian or Parthian. But you're indicating with your discussion of Tigranes IV and Erato that uh, this was uh, a recognizable pattern before that among the Armenians. Could you shed some light on that? That's one question for, for you. And a question for Professor Kanepa is, is a great admirer of your work. Uh, I was wondering if you could say something about the uh, limitations imposed on you by the uh, epigraphic evidence uh, given the fact that literary uh, evidence is very sparse in this period, on the shared history of royal uh, hunts, royal hunt as a practice between Iranians and Armenians, and of course we all know that Thomas Alson wrote 
uh, an incredible uh, and very use, uh, very important book on that topic as well. Is there a limitation imposed? Because <coughs> my sense is that Jorge Nancy and others uh, don't really go into much detail about the about the royal hunt in Armenian history in a way that would be useful to writing a shared uh, history with nuance. Um, and for Professor uh, Greenwood, uh, my understanding from your lecture is that Aryats as a term for Iran or Iran Shah uh, was uh, used as a, as a way, as a foil to what is Armenian in the uh, Khazar Parpeti book, as well as, of course, Yerishe. So my question is, during this period, it is understandable that uh, such a distinction would be made between Armenians and Iran, and Aryats being limited only to Iranians. Uh, but does that limitation also apply, uh, let's say, before uh, Avarayr 451, and, or even before 228, when the Parthian dynasty in Iran fell, when Armenians and Iranians were uh, more siblings than rivals? Okay. Uh, so, one more. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. As for the uh, the brother and sister of um, the Fineage uh, is uh, our only sources about this uh, marriage between uh, Iranians and the Rato, because uh, other ancient sources, especially Cassius Dio, Tacitus, and uh, and so on, uh, just mention uh, Tyrannus or Erato during her um, sole rule. Um, but apparently it was um, a practice uh, accepted because uh, uh, actually they, they just ruled together. They didn't have any uh, opposition in that kind of, uh, for that kind of union. Uh, otherwise, even the Roman historians would have noticed that this was uh, something wrong in the their eyes. Um, so it could be a pre an agnatic practice predating the uh, Parthians as well. Yeah. Yes, I okay. would say. Yeah, I would say. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So your, your your question was on um, the. The presence or absence of, of sources for hunting? Yeah, in yeah, terms of yeah. Like the textured history of the royal hunt is a very important practice, it seemed, north and south of the border, as well as as far east as Mongolia or China, yeah, or yeah. as far west as Rome. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I guess to that I would just uh, answer you know, basic kind of methodologies for both Armenian as well as Iranian history. If we don't work with fragments, we have nothing to work with. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this ha goes with Iranian philology as, as well. Um, for Armenia, we have this incredibly rich late antique to you know, through medieval uh, textual tradition. So there, it's the the temptation and the pitfall of just repeating what those sources say. But we can go through, and there's you know, inst many instances where they, they mention it in passing, or um, like Mufsis Hornatsi says that uh, you know Hosro the second uh, Kotak was kind of weak and pleasure-loving, and he kind of uses this as a, you know, from a, a Christian point of view, he mischaracterizes what he's doing with the hunt. We can still see, we can even discern through that very hostile text what he's doing, and in, in the same breath, he's showing that he, they're showing disfavor to the Sasanian envoy by purposely uh, taking him on a really bad hunt and to bad hunting grounds and making sure that he doesn't get anything. So, you know, despite the fact that there are, you know, that, that He's misinterpreting it through his Christian lens. You can kind of see some of these policies and these ways of of, um, of using it as a kind of symbolic of power. But uh, so I think it's it's definitely there. But you know, we just if we kind of discipline ourselves to the primary source evidence and discipline ourselves with the way we approach the Christian sources, we can still come up with a rich, though not completely um, comprehensive uh, idea. Thank you, mm -hmm. Professor Greenwood. Yes, so um, does Armenia fall within or without? Um, certainly, uh, as Professor Garstein herself noted, this answer can never be categoric. Uh, if we look at um, Shapur, the first inscription at uh, Naksir Rastab, uh, Shapur says he is king of Eran and An Eran and includes Armenia in his definition of Eran. But on the other hand, the Paikuli inscription at the end of the 3rd century 
distinguishes Armenia from Eran Shah, um, noting that Nurse had been king of Armenia and then succeeds his brother uh, Ormazd as Shah and Shah, may the king of kings gracefully move from Armenia hither to Eran Shah. So it's clear that in the third century, Armenia is both within, on occasion, and without the definition of Eran Shah. My particular interest in Hazar Papetsi's uh, use of this and this stress on Eran is because, to my mind, he is illustrating an anxiety on his part. He is, uh, he is wanting to demonstrate, to assert, that Armenia is not part of Eran Shah, conceivably because many of the elite perhaps are untroubled by the prospect of operating within the frameworks of Iran. Hazar could be anxious about their spiritual welfare, therefore, and is determined to stress repeatedly how Armenians are not of Iran, precisely because this is a risk that the community is beginning to fray at the edges, is perhaps beginning to collapse. I hope that makes sense. My question actually is more directed to Dr. Kaisnagel, who is not here. So, so <laughs> not here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, in the context of general uh, Armenian history yeah. and in relation to Iran, so there is a place called the uh, Land of Anahita in Armenia. So, um, the, rela and the question is the relationship between Anahita in Armenia and Iran and uh, uh, the, especially uh, um, from Avonyash, we have like a river goddess and a celestial part. It seems that some aspects of the celestial part is coming from maybe Armenia. That, that, that's my question. Um, there's, well, I mean, the Armenian pan uh, pantheon is, it, it shares quite a bit. In, with the Iranian pantheon, but it's, it's quite distinct too. And it seems to be something that it, it is a sort of a cultural and religious sphere, in my opinion, that is encompassing uh, Anatolia as well as the, the Caucasus. And this seems to be kind of a, a sort of shared cultural and religious unit. I think um, Aslihik is the only one who doesn't have an Iranian, um, an Iranian counterpart within the Armenian pantheon, though all the rest do. Um, so, I think f from from that point of view, I mean, I, there, there's definitely you know, different epithets. There's different kind of approaches to these gods. Um, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I can really answer that that specific question. Do, did a celestial element come through the Armenians? But the, I think the, in the Armenian pantheon, there is these overlays that that seem to come from more uh, the kind of ancient Anatolian traditions and uh, Urartian traditions as even kind of the earlier Semitic traditions as well. Um, but another example of this, which I think, which I was looking forward to Sherwin speaking on, was the tradition of the open-air sanctuary. And there's a, a very specific type of Ar Armenian religiosity, which, for example, Antiochus of Kamigini, I think, is appropriating um, to create his new, um, you know, dynastic sanctuary at Nimrud Dag. Um, and one that changes very noticeably once you have the Sasanians incorporate them into the empire and try to, you know, force them into their newly created uh, Zoroastrian orthodoxy. Thank you. Any other questions? We have about seven, eight minutes. Yes, sir. So, can you kindly make a distinction between this? Well, you mentioned that you're comfortable with Bactria. We sort of... <coughs> speak. Sort of... Uh, <laughs> Uh, sort of distinguish between the traditions that were in Bactria before they, the Persians, Parthians migrated south and came in contact with Armenia. In other words, a clear distinction between what existed originally in Bactria, so the in that area, and then later, as they came in contact, what hybridized also. So, uh, sorry. So the question is a uh, uh, question I because I can't hear. Uh, I mentioned that he actually works on Bactria as well uh -huh. in the Hellenistic period, not necessarily Armenian element. So there is the Bactrian religious tradition, and then there is Iranian uh, migration to it. And I said he's also easily adapted to work on the 
other side and look at Armenia and the Hellenistic world. Not that there actually uh, there's necessarily a connection of comparative Armenian East and West. But if you want to know what is going on religiously in Bactria before the coming of, let's say, the Arsaces or the Oh, yes. I would say the origin of the Iranians are from Bactria, so yeah, you can correct them from us. And then they, they migrated south and, and became neighbors with Armenia, and then, of course, the shared experience started. You can correct them, of course. As far, as far as I know, uh, I, uh, I didn't know of, of a Bactrian migration uh, actually. Um, but uh, uh, what can I what can I say? Um, religiously, religiously, religiously speaking, uh, um, Bactria is also a particular pantheon, you know, because for example, it's not properly I would say Zoroastrian. For example, for the veneration of God Oxus, the Am the, the Amudaria. Uh, which appears as like um, a very old uh, uh, deity, and uh, but uh, concerning the relation with Armenia, I don't know. There's an interesting article by Garni Kazatrian. Uh, it's uh, called um, Armenian Demonology, and there's some in inter interesting insights about. Um, Deities living uh, supposed to live in uh, on Mount Ararat, in the two in, in caves of Mount Ararat, the Koi, the the, the brave ones. Uh, but I don't know of any relation with relation uh, with the Bactria Bactria region or what we know about Bactrian religion. Um, our first speaker, uh, Dr. Dyer E, did not give me a bio, so I decided to write one that I think would be appropriate for him, in the style of a Sasanian inscription. So, <laughs> Professor Daryai, whose lineage is from the gods, <laughs> is the Shahan Shah of the Jordan Center for Persian Studies, and a full professor in the Department of History, which we might call An Iran. <laughs> he sits on the Masi throne in Persian Studies and Culture. His conquests here in the form of publications are legion, prodigious, and influential, representative of his broader facility in horse riding, archery, polo, and backgammon. <laughs> his lecture today is entitled Armenia and Iran Shah, the Politics of Identity in Late Antique Iran and the Caucasus. Thank you, Professor Gross. That was one of the best introductions I've gotten so far. So, although I may have all of those titles, I don't know how to work a Computer, no, I know. That's okay. Yeah. yeah, I can do full. Use a clicker, so yes. Okay. Don't start the time yet. Ladies and gentlemen, I had hoped to provide some answers to the enigmatic question of where did Armenia stand vis-a-vis -vis the Sasanian Empire in the third century CE. In my view of the material, I have now understood that anything that has been said about Armenian identity politics has been discussed by Professor Nina Garsoyan. However, since I have been given 20 minutes of fame to discuss matters in regard to Armenian Ir and Iranian identity, I would like to make some observations which may provide food for thought in terms of identity politics in late antique Armenia and Iran. First, I would like to begin with Armenia, whose history for the third century CE is most vague and its chronology of events is in relative darkness. The Arshakuni dynasty that was ruling over the Caucasian territory which became identified with Armenia had become part of a large alliance with the Arsakid Iranian world in the second century CE as Professor Rapp has observed and through dynastic marriage with Balasagan, what is Albania, uh, what is part of the modern day Republic of Azerbaijan and the Arshakiani family ruling over the kingdom of Iberia more properly, Kartli, what is now Georgia. This pan arsakid world with its mothership, the Arsakid Empire, uh, on the Iranian plateau, remember there's no idea or there's no territory called Iran yet, 
had brought together numerous noble houses who were powerful enough to challenge their kings from time to time. But when it came to the existence of their realm, they banded together. Uh, this fact is most evident in the Armenian world. It is most difficult to understand the political history of Armenian lands in the third century CE, as we are present, presented with a number of names, a Khosrow, a couple of, uh, and Tirdat. Uh, Cyril Tumanov rightly observed that only two kings could not have ruled over Armenian world for, this, for a century. Hence, he attempted to provide other rulers with the same name. So in his chronology, we have three Tirdat that I provide here and a Khosrov. <coughs> hence, Tirdat III, 287 to 293, was posited before the coming of Tirdat the Great, whose lore is tied to the Christianization of Armenia. Let us keep this Tirdat in mind as it becomes important. How powerful were these kings? Again, Tumanov and other scholars of Armenian history have stated that in Armenia and in Kartli in Georgia, the dynastic princesses, i.e. the Nakharars, were more aristocratic, uh, more aristocratic than even the, Iranian, uh, uh, the, the Iranians, and that the Nakharars were quite independent. Their self-interest was kept above all things. Hence, Modern notions of nation state for neither Iran nor Armenia should be mentioned and at this point, and certainly even this is we're talking about before the invention of the Armenian alphabet and Christianity, the two most ingredients that are usually pointed to for Armenian identity. What about Iran? Again, there may have been some sort of communal identity, but we cannot say that prior to 224 CE, uh, and Iran as a political body existed. It is only with Ardashir uh, in 224, who you see him dislodging the last Arsakid uh, king over, that we begin to encounter with such terms as Iran Shah, the realm or the kingdom of the Iranians, or simply Iran. It is not the purpose of here to discuss how this notion of Iran came about, rather, what was the effect of the creation of Iran Shah on Armenia. We have several royal inscriptions, as has been mentioned, from the uh, third century, which are important for understanding the idea of Iran Shah, or Iran, and where Armenia stood. Some have suggested that Armenia in the third century was sometimes to be part of Iran Shah. I think Professor Greenwood mentioned it as well. And then not. First, there is Shapur the first inscription at Kabe Zartosht. And this is facing the Kabe Zartosht. So there is his relief, and right in front of it there's the Kabe Zartosht, placed somewhere around 260 uh, CE, uh, when the king of Iran Shah had killed Emperor Gordian in Babylonia, made Julius uh, Philippus Arab a tributary, and captured Emperor Valerian, as he says, with his own hand, near the city of Edessa. And of course, he doesn't miss an opportunity. He has lots of these, not lots, but several of these rock reliefs showing his victories. And uh, in his inscription, he claims that he is the lord or the king of Iran Shah. I am the ruler of Iran Shah, and holds a large sort of territory, which I am only interested in this line when it comes to the Caucasus. So he says, I rule over Azerbaijan, Armenia, Georgia, Sigan, Albania, Balasagan, up to the Caucasus Mountains, and the gates of Alania. This imperial list of regions or kingdoms includes Armenia, and also includes other regions which are not associated with Iran Shah. However, if we keep in mind that Shapur I in his inscription and coinage as you're seeing on the screen takes the title of the Mazda worshipping Lord Shapur, King of Kings of Iran and an Iran or non Iran, whose lineage is from the gods, then we can see why this list means uh, the empire that Shapur holds, which goes beyond Iran Shah proper. In two or three decades later, the Zoroastrian priest Kerdir, who has left us three inscriptions, in detail discusses his actions and regions he went with the King of Kings to establish fire temples, promote Mazda worshipping rites, supporting Magian or Mazdaian priests, 
in the Near East and the Caucasus. Kerdir states that he established many fi sacred fires throughout the empire and first mentions the land of Iran. So he's very specific. He sa first says, in Iran, I did these. And as you can see, and many fires and magians uh, in the empire of Iran. And he mentions the list. So he has a clear ide idea where this uh, entity is. But Kerdir has also blessed us by stating where the non-Iranian lands and Iran Shah, uh, where he established fires and Mazdian priests are located. So, and also in the land of Aniran, the fires and Magians which were in the land of Aniran, where the horses and men of the king reached. And then he uh, begins to read uh, these regions. And again, what we see here is Arman Shah, Od Virujan, Od Alan, Od Balasagan, Tafaraz U Alan on Dar, this last line, uh, land of Armenian, Iberian, Albanian, Balasagan up to the gates of Alan is mentioned. Thus, it is clear that the Caucasus is not considered to be part of Iran or Iran Shah, but part of the Sasanian Empire. This again becomes clear from our third Sasanian inscription, that of King Narsat Paikuli dated to around 293. This inscription is in many ways important for understanding Iranian views of the Caucasus and the power politics of the late third century CE. So I shall be focusing on this inscription for elucidation of the identity politics in the region. These are the sketches of Ernst Herzfeld at the Sackler Museum of how the Paikuli inscription would have looked. The story of King Narse, the son of King Shapur, is like a novel. And we have a first-person description of his life and career from the Paikuli inscription in modern-day Iraqi Kurdistan. Narse had been bypassed by brothers and finally his grand-nephew, Vahram III, for the throne of the Sasanian Empire, which he, likes, which he, like his grandfather, like his father, I'm sorry, and grandfather, called Iran Shah. So this is outside the museum uh, in Iraqi Kurdistan where they have uh, brought the uh, uh, bust of Narse uh, hanging out in the garden. Uh, he held the title of Vuzorg Arminan Shah, or the great king of Armenia, like his younger brother Hormazd Ardakhshir. This title was thought to signify, signify the importance of Armenia vis-a-vis -vis the Sasanian Empire where the crown prince of the Sasanians would be sent to rule until the sitting king passed away. Now, uh, this scenario, I think, somewhat hinted in the Paikuli inscription. And I would like to point out that already, I think, this setup exists in the Parthian Empire, where the Parthian king and the Parthian king in uh, Arshakuni in Armenia almost have as important status. So this is, I think, a continuation, but nothing of a new innovation by the Sasanians. In his Paikuli inscription, he states, at least the passage that I'm taking, we had set out from Armenia towards Iran Shah and had mobilized an army of Iran Shah. So here again, uh, the important phrase is here as Armani or Iran Shah, from Armenia to Iran Shah, which clearly suggests that in the third century, Armenia was not thought to be part of Iran. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to overemphasize this, that these are two separate entities that we're talking about. Here is Narsa, and usually this is taken to be Lady Anahid or Anahita uh, of the Iranian world, uh, giving the diadem of rulership. Others have suggested that this may be uh, uh, depicting the uh, reunification of the king and his wife. But again, I wonder of this a diadem of rulership. So most likely it may be uh, Lady Anahita, the important Zoroastrian deity. I think the inscription uh, of the Zoroastrian priest Kerdir and King Narse clearly shows this division between Armenia and the Iranian world. Furthermore, not only in Armenia, uh, the great king resided, the Vuzorg Arminan Shah, which we thought was a special title, but based on the new evidence found in Balkh now, uh, from the Bactrian seal. We have now realized that on the other side, the Sasanians also had established a great king of Kushan. So this is the Ozarko Kushan Oshaw, the great king of Kushan. But how did the Caucasus and Armenia was seen by the Sasanians in the third century is of utmost importance for identity politics. 
by comparing the inscription of Shapur I in the 260s and Narsa's Paikuli inscription in the 290s, we can see a change in political landscape of the Caucasus. This is made clear by the list of the regions mentioned under the rule of Shapur uh, and uh, the kings and the lords who are said to have come to join Narsa, King Narsa, uh, for his bid for the Sasanian throne of Iran Shah. In relation to the Caucasus, I've taken this passage of the um, which is part of his problematic of Paikuli inscription, uh, we are faced with uh, several toponyms. What you read is probably the king of Balasagan and the king of Mesketan and the king of Iberia and the king of Sigan. So, uh, yeah. And then uh, finally we have a King Tirdat. So it re literally reads... Uh, Bala Sagan Shah, Miskitan Shah, Aberian Shah, uh, Sigan Shah, or Tirdat Shah. While Bala Sagan is clearly a designated region located for the most part south of the lower course of the river Kor and Aras, Arax, bordered on the south by uh, Azerbaijan, on the east by the Caspian, which is later identified with Dashte. Moran, this area. On the other hand, Miskitan has posed problems in terms of its identification. Octor Shervo, in his edition of the Paikuli inscription, suggests that this place is to be identified with the people of Masag Masagetai, a tribe of islands mentioned by Patvos Buzand as living in Balasagan, and its location corresponds to Parthian Aradan, or what we call Aran, the name before given to the Republic of Azerbaijan. As Professor Rapp has pointed out in his very important work on Georgia, the Greek toponym Iberia, which, we, uh, which is Middle Persian Abiran, was used in various ways and for really a region that had more geographical divisions and used by the different Greek authors and texts for the Caucasian region, but not in a uniform way. Uh, speaking to Dr. Reza Khani, he reminded me that this general generalization is similar to the term used by Persians for Georgia, Gorgestan, throughout history, uh, which, again, it's used for various parts. What do we mean by Gorgestan at every time in history? It's a general designation. I'm not in tune with the niceties of Georgian topography, but this toponym reads to me for Georgian Metzcheta, with trepidation, I'm not sure. Uh, the first capital of the kingdom, which later came to be known as Georgia. Could we be seeing a mention of the king of Metzcheta from Kacheti? which was an independent principality and not only to be incorporated into the Georgian kingdom only in the 11th century, while Abiran, Iberia, which stands for Iberia, is mentioned separately. May the Sasanian king of kings not see, be seeing uh, two kingdoms rather than one kingdom, two regions in Georgia. The next two kings may support this division which revolve around Armenia. This brings us to Sagan, uh, Sigan Shah. W.B. Henning had given the important suggestion, which I think still stands, and also by Ernst Herzfeld, the first person who read the inscription, to suggest that Sigan Shah is the king of Suinik, which uh, in Armenian is called Ishkhan Suinik, which in the Armenian geography, the region is called sometimes Sisagan or Sisag yeah, Sigan or Sisagan. The country on the left bank of the lower river Arax. So, of course, this is a medieval imagery, but apparently from the same region. And uh, approximately to the modern Iranian world uh, boundaries, it would be around this region where the Suini Celts sway. Of course, in Armenian historical tradition from the 5th century onwards, reflecting on the past and their present, the House of Suinik has always been treated as outcast and traitors to the Armenian cause. And as Professor Greenwood had mentioned, why Suinik's relationship to Sasanians and Iran Shah was so different vis-a-vis -vis other Armenian noble houses. Of course, the important figure in Armenian history is Vasak Suinik, who joined the Sasanians at the Battle of Rai. Thank you. I think it is only with such independent kingdoms as Suinik that we can understand the nature of an important Sasanian rock relief in Salmas by Lake Urumiye. On the one side stands Ardeshir, the founder of the Sasanian Empire, and Sanshapur. But who are the two figures 
who are standing and receiving a diadem from the two kings. Uh, may we be looking at such kings as the house of Swinik, if not the king of Swinik himself receiving the diadem of rulership from the Sasanians. That the Sasanians saw Swinik separately from Armenia is not only clear from the inscription of Shapur and Kaveh Zartosht and Narses at Paikuli, but also in the administrative seals of the Sasanian Empire from the 5th century. A recent find of an administrative seal designated for a Zarbet, chief of gold, from the Sasanian Empire, reads the administration as such, Armin od Ardan od Virujan od Sisagan od Marze Nesavan. So again here, Armenia is seen separately by the Sasanians from Suinik. Uh, and I should mention that uh, I think in the 1980s, after the earthquake, Professor Russell had gone to uh, Eshmiat Sin, uh, where there was a fire altar found beneath, and there's a discussion of the layers of Eshmiat Sin, where there might, uh, he traced the word Babik and I think Kondor for frankincense uh, for the fire. And uh, he suggests that he dates this to the fifth century. After the battle, uh, the, the house of Suinik were actually paying for the uh, fire temple in Echmiatzin and the uh, frankincense for it. So this idea of layers of uh, Echmiatzin itself is, I think, quite fascinating in terms of uh, Christian Zoroastrian uh, noble houses. This is not the Sasanians. This is Armenian houses actually dealing with uh, religious matters. Uh, the issue has to do, of course, uh, the last issue that I'll briefly just mention is uh, the mention of King Tirdat. And since I don't have much time, I'm just going to say it uh, uh, really fast and without reading my notes. While each of these other kings are uh, associated with a specific topography, uh, King Tirdat is not mentioned to be ruling over any specific place, which in itself, I think, is quite important. I would like to, again, at the end, in conclusion, I would like to suggest that our Armenian authors, see what they see as Armenian Armenianists, is wholly unclear in the third century. And the boundaries of what is Iran Shah and what is Armenia is not clearly defined. What the Sweeney caste thought of himself and his kingdom vis-a-vis -vis the Armenians and the Iranians, I think, provides such example. Uh, the Iranian plateau and the Caucasus had been culturally and dynastically weaved together before the coming of the Sasanians in the third century. I do not think that there was any sense of an Iran prior to the third century either, although just like the Armenians, there were some notions of common ethnicity. With the Sasanians and the creation of the idea of Iran Shah, uh, with its boundaries, a rupture took place in the Caucasus Iranian world. The Sasanians who knew of this deep connection of the Arsakid Iran, Iranian world, and the Arshakuni Armenian world, this pan-Arsakid world, or what uh, Abdiyun calls the Parthian Commonwealth, uh, gave trouble to the Sasanians. And so they attempted to annex and put an end to the Armenian Arshakunis at any cost, sometimes working with the Nakharars and the noble houses against the king of Armenia, sometimes intervening directly. We should go back to the beginning of my paper and heed the words of Tumanov about the independence and importance of the Nakharars and noble houses, uh, which uh, I think also serves true for the uh, Arsakids of the Iranian world. In the third century, I would like to uh, emphasize uh, the imposition of what later is called Zoroastrianism in Armenia is not the issue for the Sasanians. The Armenians were Zoroastrians, but not the Zoroastrians or the brand of Zoroastrians which the Sasanians espoused. The militant form of Zoroastrianism, which Ardashir took, had the consequence of destroying old Zoroastrian temples in both Sasanian Iran, but also in Armenia and other regions. Khoranatse already reports that Ardashir was engaged in campaign of destruction of uh, temples with statues of Zoroastrian deities, as well as sacred fire. So this is and uh, a different type of struggle that we're uh, seeing here. It's not Christian Armenia, Zoroastrian Iran. It's Christian and Zoroastrian Armenia and a different Zoroastrian Iran. One wonders how the Zoroastrian Armenian nobles would have taken such aggressive and destructive actions by the king of Iran, Shah. Obviously, we're in the dark, but the religious hostility 
may have begun when Armenia became Christian in the 4th century, but I think already with the establishment of the Sasanian Empire in the 3rd century, religious conflicts existed in Armenia between the, actually, uh, in terms of Zoroastrianism. The Zoroastrian Armenians had their own variations of Zoroastrianism, which also kept them unique in many ways and distinct. The Arsakid Arshakuni slash Sasanian animosity was the most important cause for the breaking of Armenia and Iran. Uh, the Romanist scholar Blockley has rightly mentioned that the Sasanians wanted to do away with the Arshakuni monarchy already in the fourth century and worked with the nobility to transfer the power of the Arshakunis to the Nakharars. Hence, it is only natural that with the creation of an Iranian identity in the 3rd century, Armenia would react to the hostilities and actions by the new Iranians and search for their own identity vis-à-vis -vis the Sasanians. But the impetus for such identity formation was given a jolt before Christianity became an issue in the 4th century. And this was because of this uh, Zoroastrian uh, division uh, where Kerdir, the Sasanian priest in the third century, uh, has a famous dictum, the way of religion is one. That is, there's only one type of Zoroastrianism. Mm -hmm. Of course, that was not the case for Armenia. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much, Professor Daryi. Our next speaker is Arnold Alaverdian, who is one of our prized PhD candidates in the history department here at UC Irvine. His doctoral thesis examines how various socio-political developments in the Sasanian world merged to produce the Armenian revolt of the 450s to 451. In this context, he studies the narratives of sanctified violence that developed around the revolt within the late antique literary tradition and their mobilization by Armenian communities in more recent centuries. His lecture today is entitled Heroism in the East, Nomadic Invasions, and Prospects for the Armenian Elite's Political Mobility in the Later Sasanian Empire. Good afternoon, everyone. So, narratives of violence dominate the discourse on armeno iranian relations encounters in late antique literature. It is in accounts of persecution, dynastic feuds, and religious struggles that we find the re revered saints, martyrs, and rulers in the works of early Armenian authors. Within this framework, representatives of the Sasanian political and religious <coughs> establishments often serve as the hostile other in the binary construction of exemplary Christian Armenians. Yet, these same authors also present a more implicit dimension of Armeno-Iranian relations, one that praises Armenian engagement in cooperative acts of violence with Sasanian imperial forces. This paper analyzes the rhetoric of Armenian battlefield heroics in respect to the political and material gains associated with military service against factions of nomadic origin in East Iran. I will demonstrate that in lauding Armenian military exploits through the Iranian epic tradition, Armenian sources reveal the extent to which the Armenian elite were rooted into Sassanian political culture. The Armenian nobility, along with their counterpart, counterparts throughout the Iranian world, were especially distinguishable by their elaborate armor and their unique banners with which they appeared in battle. Due to the Sasanians' constant struggles along their eastern frontiers, this, it comes as no surprise that many legends of heroic deeds survive from this theater of war in the Iranian world. Beginning from the mid-4th century, the Sasanians encountered successive invaders of nomadic origin uh, from their eastern and northern boundaries. 
These included the Kidarite, Hephthalite, and Alkhan Hans, who repeatedly made incursions into Eastern Sasanian territories. The 10th century history by Moses Das Huranzi contains one of the earliest references to Armenian involvement in the Sasanian campaigns against Hanic tribes. Das Huranzi records that Shapur II promised Babik of Siuni great rewards if he fought in his stead and triumphed over a Hanic giant called Hanugar. Babik won the duel, and as part of his reward, Shapur, Shapur quote, sent him in great honor back to his own country, bestowing upon him the same rank as that of the Bagratunis and the Mamikonians, and he crossed, and he crossed the Araxes and built a village called Akos. The Hanic giant's name corresponds to that of the Onagur Turks, but it is more likely that this account employs a more familiar name to the memory of Shapur II's campaigns against the Iranian Huns, which were in the east. Although this tale might reflect aspects of Sasanian political culture in the 4th century, this is probably a later epic version of Babik regaining his status back as a Naharar from the Mamikonians. This is even more apparent in Das Huranzi's narration of the single combat between Babik and Hanugar within the Iranian epic tradition. To triumph against the Hanik giant, who had a monstrous head and a lance made out of a forest tree. Babik, who was himself well built, wore Shapur's armor, mounted his black horse, and then, quote, they, meaning Babik and Hanugar, rushed upon each other. And the thunderous roar of the blows exchanged by their lances continued from down to the ninth hour. Babik vanquished the murderous beast and dispatched him with a single stroke of, of his sword. Single combat that lasts for hours and triumph by a single stroke are, a com are common themes in Iranian heroic literature. As we shall see, it is fitting that medieval accounts narrate Babik's promotion back to his old status in an epic account of warfare with a nomadic opponent. We find a similar account of heroics by the Armenian prince Drastamat in the 5th century history attributed to Pastos Buzand. Pseudo-Pastos records that when Shapur II was hard pressed by the Kushans in East Iran, probably referring to the two Huns of the Kidara dynasty, quote, Drastamat performed incredible feats of valor. Of valor. He fought so bravely for King Shapur that he saved him from, bad, from death and he slew many of the Kushans. He continues that Shapur, quote, expressed deep gratitude to the eunuch, Drastamat, for his services and said to him, ask anything from me, and whatever you ask, I will give. Suropastos' tale of Drastamat's rewards for his feet implies that a service and reward political culture already existed at least by the composition of this history in the 5th century. Thus, even in their nostalgic references to the memory of Armenia's dynastic period, Armenian authors reveal a more meaningful political bond between Armenian princes and the Sasanian king in the late Ashaguni period. It is not surprising that, according to Armenian sources, it was a coalition within the Armenian nobility that instigated Bahram V's deposal of the last Ashaguni king in 428 which led to the appointment of Marsbans, or viceroys in Persia Armenia. In the 5th century, the Sasanians found it ever more difficult to contain Hanic invasions from both the Caucasus and, more significantly, from the increasingly powerful Hanic states in East Iran. Sources from various communities complained about heavy taxation during this period, while Armenian sources repeatedly complained about the hardships of cavalry service in distant lands. This state of affairs played a major role in 5th century uprisings in the Caucasus, including two major Armenian revolts. Both Syriac and Armenian sources record that Yazgir II and Pierre Peros promised rewards and promotions to noblemen and magnates under certain conditions. The history of Karkha de Betzlach and his Syriac text includes the following concerning Yazgir II's persecutions. And the judge ordered that they, meaning the nobles of Karkha de Betzlach, read the letter of the king that offers ranks, gifts, and governments to the one who denies the Messiah. 
In the history of Ghazar Parpetsi, Wahan Mamikonian, who was the leader of a revolt against the Sasanians, complains about a similar situation. In a dialogue with King Balash, Peroz's successor, Wahan accuses Peroz of treating his noble subjects in the same manner as men of lower status. He further adds that, quote, men whom Peroz once made lords in his own realm for their magism, meaning for being Zoroastrian, and who now hold rank and honor and are princed in each one's own, in each own, in each one's province, the owner of horse and arms and troops. Whether or not the claims about rewards for apostasy are tropes is the topic of another discussion. It is Wahan's complaints about the elevation of individuals of lower social standing into what he seems to describe as a new class of landholding soldiers that warrants our attention. This could imply that the existence of fifth century sustaining policies to expand uh, imply the existence of fifth century sustaining policies to expand the core of their mounted forces to deal with threats from the east. Decades before Khosrow I ach achieved this by reforming the role of Deccans in Sasanian society. Wahan, however, soon finds himself elevated to the highest political office in Armenia. After Peros died fighting the Heftalites, his successor Balash called on Wah Wahan's services to call his nephew's revolt, which was again supported by the Heftalites. Balash's forces triumphed. Wahan, after, after serving Balash in the east, not only regained his previous hereditary rights as, and titles as a Mamikonian, but in 485, he was also appointed as Marsban of Armenia. Not only did Wahan now hold an office that was perhaps more authoritative than the later Rashakuni kings, but one that possibly didn't lack in, local, in royal glamour either. Islamic sources report of Marsban's wearing ornamented garments sitting on thrones of gold and even being called king of the throne. Writing under Mamikonian patronage, Ghazar praises Wahan for his militant opposition to the Persian king on the one hand, and louds him as a brave warrior for the Sasanians on the other. This was for a good reason, as Ghazar was well aware that it was the latter task that benefited his patron's social and political standing. In the sixth century, Hostilities in the East carried on. We find Armenian nobles constantly serving uh, under the Sasanians and Byzantines and often switching sides. Uh, and the Byzantines at this time relied even more heavily on cavalry forces. In the seventh century, the Byzantine emperor Heraclius even copies the Sasanian practice of creating a landed warrior class in his empire's eastern provinces, namely Armenia and northern Mesopotamia. The history of Pseudo Sabaeus offers an epic version of Sambat Bagratuni's heroics within this political context. The history describes Sambat as a giant with extraordinary strength, who is able to fight off all sorts of beasts. Initially in Byzantine service, Sambat later finds favor with Khosrow II, who appoints him as Marsban of a province by the Caspian. His, success, his successive victories for Khosrow earn him promotions prestige offices, generous gifts, and the title Khosrov Sham, or the joy of Khosrov. His biggest triumph, however, was a duel with the leader of a large Turco-Heftalite Turco force, where Sambat's lance kills his opponent by cutting through his armor, causing the enemy army to flee, in the way Sebeos narrates it. Again, we find the narrative of an Armenian warrior, warrior's heroics for a Persian king elaborate elaborately colored in the Iranian epic theme of giants and single combat. Even for the devoutly Christian compiler of Pseudo Sebeos' history, who saves his biggest praises for the Byzantine Emperor Heraclius, the most valiant Armenian warrior in, this, in his text expresses his bravery in the Iranian world's eastern frontiers. As we have seen, distinctions between actual accounts of Armenian exploits in the East and the Iranian epic tradition are blurred in early Armenian literature. Acknowledging the prospects of rewards and promotions within a political culture that bound the Armenian princess to the king of kings, Armenian authors conveniently narrated the exploits of Armenian princes through the Iranian heroic tradition. 
By doing so, they situated Armenia firmly within what Professor Rapp appropriately identifies as the Iranian Commonwealth. I hope that the miniature paintings of the Shahnameh in my slides that accompanied passages about Armenian heroics helped you better visualize Iranian elements in early Armenian literature, a topic which our own, our own giant, Professor Garsoyan, has dedicated much of her career to. Thank you. Thank you, Arnold. Our next speaker is Dr. Khordad Rezakhani, who is an associate research scholar at the Mosaver Rahmani Center for Iran and Persian Gulf Studies at Princeton University. A historian of late antique Central Asia, he's a prolific scholar, and his most recent book is entitled Reorienting the Sasanians, which I had the privilege uh, and pleasure of being one of the first people to both read and review. Uh, his lecture today is titled The Northern Barrier, Armenians and the Dalamites in the Early Medieval Iranian World. Um, thank you, Dr. Kors, for that introduction, although I'm somewhat disappointed for not receiving a Kushan-style <laughs> introduction in fluent Bactrian, but, you know, you do what you're given. Um, is it working? Yes. Exactly, I am the Kushan Shah indeed. Um, perhaps I could start because, to be honest, the slides are not that crucial. Um, thank you very much for the um, having me uh, here, um, Professor Daryai, Professor Barbarian, and Professor uh, Aslanian. Uh, what I'm going to say today is a bit of a. Uh, sorry, I have this back and forth. Ah, all right. Is a bit of a chronological shift uh, from what we have heard so far and sort of uh, trying to provide you with a, a little bit of a taste of the magnificent things you will receive uh, here tomorrow at the second part of this conference in UCLA and uh, scholars such as uh, Alison Baca. Um, so I, uh, in, it is interesting that I was invited to this in uh, honor of um, Professor Garsoyan, the first introduction I ever had to her work, or actually to Armenian history as a whole, was in a class by Richard Hovannesian at UCLA, uh, which was taught off of the book that he edited himself. One of whose chapters was written by Nina Garsoyan about the medieval Armenian kingdoms, which was the first time I really got exposed to the whole idea as a graduate student and found it very interesting, uh, which shows the continuous uh, interest despite the fact that this is not really my primary um, field of research. Um, what I'm trying to suggest in this talk is more of presenting you with something like a position paper, at least something, a framework for myself to think, think through the issues that I uh, bring up. And uh, that is particularly the adage of Iranian intermezzo, um, a term that was introduced uh, in the classical period of Iranian studies, you could say, in a sense, in the 1940s and 50s uh, by Vladimir Minorsky and has been sort of used as a continuous um, term. And uh, this is what I'm trying to sort of think through, and I really look forward to um, comments that might come from you regarding this. The 10th century has always been treated with a special care in the history of medieval Islamic world, uh, and particularly in the study of Iranian history. Uh, the weakening of the Abbasid Caliphate uh, following the death of al-Mutawakkil in 861 allowed the rise of local powers all around the Islamic world, from Egypt of the Akhshidids to Syria of the Hamdanids and to the Jebal area of central Iran and Central Asia, um, which would be of more uh, discussion here. Uh, in the Iranian and Central Asian context, this period is characterized by increasing power of the Buyids in the Jabal region, Samanids in Central Asia, semi-imperial political um, bodies that are presented in rather modern nationalistic historiography as founders of independent kingdoms and somehow asserting Iranian culture against oppressive Arab, Islamic, whatever you want to call uh, uh, um, so rule, and that these are the powers that are freeing the Iranians. Of course, as with anything nationalistic, we could immediately dismiss that. But what is coming out of that entire thing is that it is 
assumed that there is a particular ethnic side to this um, or nationalistic side, Iranian, Persian, whatever you want to call it. Uh, while the actors are not necessarily either of these or didn't identify as this, or actually when you get to the um, details of it, are not even connected necessarily to that identity or essentially identify themselves as such. They do have certain characteristics that we are translating in our modern historiography in that sense. Um, the one that comes to mind most prominently for people is that uh, patronage of Persian literature, uh, something that Samanids are very much credited uh, for. Um, but uh, in reality, the things that comes out that connects them to this background that comes out in modern historiography as a nationalistic move is the hearkening back to the ancient traditions, the ancient kingship. Uh, this comes out in many different ways and means. And um, one of the most uh, discussed ones is probably is the fact that they, all of them tend to connect themselves to Sasanian period um, kings and characters. Samanids are famously connecting themselves to Vahram VI, the only non-Sasanian famous Sasanian king, the um, Vahram Chubin. Uh, Buyids, there are various running uh, claims that uh, take Buyid's uh, descent from Kavad, they take it from Khosrow I, Khosrow II. They are, this is one of the ways they're connecting. And another way is adopting Sasanian pre-Islamic um, royal ideologies and the ways of presenting themselves, including, for example, use of the title of Shahan Shah, which in the Buyid case comes out in most prominently on the coinage of the Buyid Adadullah. So, uh, but when you actually get to this, you find out that there's an interesting local context. This is the reason I'm showing you this very um, fascinating map. Uh, if you notice here, uh, the sort of unusually green one is identified as the Buyid state. The mustard one is Samanid one. The dark green is the local dynasties of Muzaffaris and the Shirvan Shahids and the, those. And uh, the Ziyarid state is also identified as well. Now, if you, know, if you have ever been educated in Iran, for example, you know that in this story, the Musafirids and the Salarids and others are not really mentioned, but rather the Ziyarids and the Boyids and the Samanids. Ziyarids are mentioned because of their short hold over Isfahan, uh, which brings them into the affairs of the um, central part of the Iranian plateau to, in the Jabal. Now, something that connects a few of these, going back to that ethnic thing, is that they are connected to the Dalamite identity. Now, what is Dalam? Let me see if I can. Oh, I have this. I could talk off of this. Um, what is the Dalamite identity that they are identified as? Dalam Dalamites are the natives of the Cas Southern Caspian shore. They are seen as the highland warriors that resist conquest. They are um, sort of preservers of some sort of an original identity. Particularly in that region, there is a continuation of a dynasty that never converts to Islam, apparently, called the Dabuyids. So they are seen as preserving the ancient religion as well. And then sometimes in this century, in this 10th century that I'm talking about, they break out of that region and conquer the land. Um, this is a quick chronolog uh, chronology of them, of uh, what becomes important. Um, things of interest here is really in the mid-century, in the 1940s and 1950s, where the Buyids managed to take over the Abbasid Caliphate, remove the Abbasid Caliph, and really henceforth uh, render the Abbasid Caliphate powerless and um, eventually um, established their kingdom in central Iran. Now, from a genealogical point of view, they are taken back to uh, this Daylam region, and the history of it is described in the terms of the families that rule over them. Now, I'm going to give you a lot of names. I'm going to give you a Daylamite intermezzo. A lot of names and local people. 
Sorry, what did happen to that? The brief history of it is that following the death of um, Al-Mutawakkil, you have in the local context of De Laman Gilan in the southern, in the western part of southern Caspian, you have various dynasties that have been ruling there apparently from the time immemorial, although we don't have evidence of them from the time immemorial. Among these are the families of Malkhani Khaki, the famous Samanid general, uh, the family of uh, Harusandan Pura Tida, which is another local Gilani um, leader, the family of the uh, Karinids, and of obviously in this particular region, the family of the Justanids. These are families that uh, adopt titles such as Ispahbed, or in the um, is, mm, sort of Islamic writing in um, Arabic and uh, New Persian, Isfahbed. They're ty- claiming titles that have to do with military positions during the Sasanian period. And uh, their presentation of themselves is that they are rulers that originally gained the rule of this region from the Sasanid period and now are continuing it into the Islamic period. As I said, the important branch of the Buyids goes inside Iran and gets all the attention. But the local, the Delam Gilan uh, section, really gets, in a sense, very much neglected. There are studies done on this area's uh, local context, but mostly in, um, you could say, peripheral sense. Uh, most important scholar that everybody refers to, if you read um, anything about this region, at least in European languages, uh, are the work that are done by Wilfried Madelung about the Alevit um, uh, rulers of this area. These are the uh, Zaydi Shia uh, imams who move to this region, get protection from these local dynasties, and establish what is essentially a, a religious a mini religious caliphate in this region. And you have a lot of re- little studies done in Persian, which some of them are done by amateurs that you can't really trust. They are done based on available material, which is not much. And of course, there is a major study done by Miklos Sarkozy, who studied the late Sasan and early Islamic context of this. But we have the unfortunate bad luck that that study is done in um, Hungarian. I don't know about you, but I don't read Hungarian. I have been begging him to translate it into English or anything else, but, well, he hasn't done it yet. So the local context of these uh, um, dynasties is quite vague. We don't really know what they are doing. They stop sh- start showing up in the area that we are a bit more interested in, though, in the Armenian region around the same time period. So the background of the Armenian story is that after the defeat of Babak, in 836, uh, the local um, rule falls into um, direct caliphal control in the person of Abul Saj Divdad ibn Divband, who is a Sogdian uh, general of um, Kidar al Afshin, the person who defeats uh, Babak. Uh, I have separately before suggested that Babak is not such a strange character in uh, Armenia. He might actually be a member of the Sunni family, and his name is probably Babik, like the one you saw now. Uh, so he's not that much of a form, foreign person, and he might have a Dalamite context himself. But at least in this period, after his demise, um, he, the position of the rule is taken over by this person whose family are called Sajids. In parallel, at the other side of the Araxes, and actually really on the west side of the uh, Kur, uh, you have the rise of the Bagratuni kingdom. So this is when Ashur I in 884 rules, uh, starts his rule. Uh, of course, he's at constantly fighting with the Muslim Ostikan, which happens to be Afshin, another Afshin, Muhammad al-Afshin, the son of um, Devdad, and then enter the Elamites. In 916, you have all of a sudden mentioned in the very last chapter of uh, Mufsas Dasqoransi's history of the Albanian, uh, Caucasian Albanians, that all of a sudden this character of Salar, Marzban, starts showing up in, Arme- in, in uh, the Albanian region. And he is put off, we are told, by different sources, by a local history of uh, Darban, that he's put off by 
the local ruler of the Shervan area with the help of the people of Darban and he's pushed back. This person is either Marzban himself or his father Muhammad ibn Musafir who is the, uh, related to the Justanid family of Daylam um, and is a local ruler of Tarum, the western part of Daylam, which includes the city, uh, city of uh, Ardabil, to the city of Ardabil. This is the beginning of this person's involvement in Armenian affairs. His son, Salar Marzban, is a famous scourge of Armenians. He comes and destroys everything, takes over Devin, attacks Ani, takes over Ganjag, and um, is the person who really weakens, initially weakens the uh, Armenian control, the Bagratuni control over Armenia. Um, I shall go quickly a bit because I am apparently running out of time. This is just a coin I was going to tell you about it. This is where the problem is really caused. This is where I, I tell you that this is more than anything a position paper. Other than uh, the Ninhagar Soyan that I talked about and initial influence, the person who really studies this area and this period was Vladimir Minorsky. And uh, in another sense, you could say Kirill Tumanov. And what they do, and most of their studies, what it concentrates on, are stuff like this. Family trees, persons, who is son of whom, very interesting occurrence of names across the board. You have a Muslim Ashot, you have Armenian Abbas, I'm not sure if it is that Abbas or not, but anyway you do, you have certainly later have Hassan Jalal Jalaluddole, who is uh, an Armenian with a Muslim name. You, there is a lot of studies of this sort. But this is where I want us to, to stop and kind of see what I mean is happening. We imagine these entities to be separated from each other that there are, the Dalamites are seen as the producers and sort of reproducers and preservers of this Sasanian identity. And at least from the Armenian sort of point of view, they are the invaders, they are the ones who are going to take over this area, they are the ones who are, from the Armenian point of view, by the way, they are the same as the rest of the Muslims. Of course, from their own point of view, they are the Zaidi or the Ismaili or later 12 or Shias. And so in the Muslim world, they are different. From the Armenian world, they are the outsiders. And they are the ones who are bringing these ideas, we imagine, into the Armenian context. And this, this study is the type of the studies that Minorsky and others are doing, is a study that is trying to see these influences from intermingling, from intermarriages, from connections, from creating personal connections, which is a very interesting way of presenting this. We, are, we have people from the um, op opposite sides getting together and actually agreeing and bringing some sort of peace and agreement to, to each other. But what is actually really, I think, is happening and is interesting to note is that part of this entire story has a local Armenian context as well. It might be strengthened by connections to um, the... Dilemites, but there is something you could say, call it an Armenian intermezzo within the context of the Iranian intermezzo. And I have just really la um, noticed some of, some of the very obvious points in here. Um, from the ge genealogical point of view, uh, Armenians also connect themselves to the pre-Islamic um, ancestry. In many senses, they are the living examples of the pre-Islamic pre um, ancestry connections. Unlike the Buyids or the Samanis, they don't need to claim to be descendant of any Sasanian characters. They actually are. That the Bagratuni family are actually really descended of the Bagratunis of the late Sasanian period. They are the same family. You could go back to them. Sal Sambatian always has a problem of genealogy, but he t um, claims the title of Aran Shah, the king of uh, Albania. And he is, he is, his family are descendants of those. So that genealogical connection that we very much consider the part of the Iranian intermezzo in the Armenian context is very present. Uh, something that I find very interesting is way before the title of Shahanshah is used by Panah Khosra Azadudullah, uh, the Buyid king, uh, it is bestowed, interestingly enough, by the Sajid ruler on the person of Ashad II. So Ashad II is called the Shahanshah. 
he carries the title. His grandson also carries the title. So the, Ira the Sasanian grandiose sign of kingship is actually bestowed on this Armenian local small powerless ruler who does claim this grand idea of I am the Shahanshah, I have the pre-Islamic connections. They even come really uh, copy the structure of the, um, they reproduce the structure of their uh, pre-Islamic uh, setting. Prior to um, uh, Islam, during the Sasanian period, there is a sparapet, that is a completely um, gen um, sort of hereditary position that the Fam the Sparapets are in the same family, which are originally Mamikonians and their Bagratunis. And then when Bagratunis gained the throne, they bestowed the title of a Sparapet on another family, Pahlavunis, to, in whom it, it becomes again the uh, hereditary position. So in the, w while we give all the credit of that Iranian intermezzo to those Iranian characters, quote unquote, who are um, really um, patron, uh, are patrons of Iranian arts and are representing themselves in what we accept to be the Iranian sense as the Shahanshahs, as the people who are bringing back somebody like Mardavi Jebne Ziyar who claims that he's a Sasanian king. Back here in Armenia in this small incubator of culture that is setting itself apart, the same thing is br being produced with the same characteristics, and it's in a sense, it's in a storm in a little uh, saucer, but, but this little saucer is really a um, little world in which you can see um, the continuation of the pre-Islamic values and uh, kingship and everything else in the Islamic world. So basically what I'm trying to suggest is we should consider an Armenian intermezzo within an Iranian intermezzo. Thank you. Thank you to the Kushan Shah Khorodad. Um, our final speaker um, is Dr. Lilit uh, Yerenjakian, who is the leading researcher at the Institute of Arts of the National Academy of Sciences uh, and a professor at the Komitas State Conservatory in Yerevan. Her lecture today is entitled Armenian Iranian Interrelations in Traditional Art Music. I am very pleased and delighted to have an opportunity of participating in such a great conference in honor of Professor Nina Garsoyan. <laughs> Nina Garsoyan. Uh, the scholars of Armenian National Academy of Sciences are aware and uh, appreciate very much the achievements and collaboration on behalf of the scientists at foreign academic institutions to develop arminological studies. So with great respect, I would like to say that the invitation to the conference makes me a credit to present the shared musical space of Armenian and Iranians and shed light on some aspects of Armenian-Iranian interrelations in traditional art music. Armenian culture is a unique manifestation of Christian East, where East-West dichotomies presented both in unified and split identity levels. Being on the east-west crossroads, having developed in the vicinity of Byzantine and Iranian civilizations, and later interacting with Arab and Turkish cultures, Armenian art combines in itself eastern and western roots. The distinctive aspects of the two sources are vividly reflected in musical art, with its monophonic essence, peculiarities of the organization of the model system, and melismatic decorative style, uh, Armenian music is in harmony with Middle Eastern aesthetic artistic thought. However, the expressional means of these features, the concise structures and laconic expressiveness of Armenian music related to Western musical tradition, unlike other Eastern monodic cultures where extemporization of different monodic pieces could last three, four, if not more hours. Of course, it is impossible to fully restore the historical development of Iran's and Armenians' musical cultures in their interaction and interweaving 
Entire stages of the historical path remain unknown to us due to the scarcity of factual material. The development of the two neighboring countries' musical cultures amounted in the formation of similar phonem phenomena, especially evident in the sphere of such elaborate genres of traditional music, uh, such as Muram, um, Dazdga, Ashur love romance, Sazandar instrumental music. Many peoples of Middle and neither, uh, Near Eastern countries have contributed to their origin, and it resonates with is equally dear to any Easterner. So in Christian Armenia, the art of Muhammad also acquired a special interpretation, as it had been influenced by different branches of Armenian monodic music. In various Eastern cultures, does gas. Iranian dasgas, uh, which are the representative genres of Eastern, all Eastern traditional music, are performed as a vocal instrumental suite based on text of Persian, Turkish-speaking poets of medieval East. However, only instrumental muam got in rooted in Armenian's musical life and became stable in Armenia. Neither in original language nor in translation did the Armenian musicians perceive the vocal component of the muams. Conscious or subconscious rejection of vocal led to the strengthening of instrumental thinking and reinforced their own national performance traditions. Thus, we are dealing with cultural logical differences too. Set of values, traditions, practices established in Armenian culture. In no other sphere of Armenian folk professional music of oral tradition, such long-lasting meditative improvisations or large compound suites like Iranian Dazga or Indian ragas can be found. It is worth remembering an Armenian Azeri proverb, which has become a folklore manifestation of the above mentioned phenomena. Cut the tongue of an Armenian singer and the hand of a uh, Turk player, acknowledged and mentioned by prominent linguist Rachia Ajaryan. The Iranian music of Sasanian period has undoubtedly played an important role in the East. And it is well known that the roots of Eastern model system date back to Sasanian culture, within the domain of which Armenian art music can be considered as well. There is historical evidence that two musicians, Persian Barbat and Armenian Sarkis, who played an important role in the royal court of Shah Khosrov Parvis, were invited to Ktesiphon to participate in the canonization of Iranian royal so-called Khosrovani modes. To them, both written and oral tradition ascribes legendary stories, such as creation of a new song for each day of a year. Myth or legend, the historical context is obvious. It seems quite natural that Sarkis, as well as other famous musicians, who were invited to Shah's court, among them Greek Nakisa, must have brought with them their own musical traditions, theoretical principles, this is why we can ascertain that the musical system created by them and known under the Khosrovani style is a synthesis of various art traditions. Similar phenomenon of canonization can be observed in Armenian sacred song. In the seventh century, one of the uh, first collections of Armenian religious songs, so-called Octoichos of Armenian religious music. Firdusis Shahname is an encyclopedia containing rich information on the musical culture and instruments of that period. In the earliest Shahnama manuscripts available, two miniature paintings reproduce a legend about the author of ro uh, royal Khosrovani modes. According to the legend, musicians at the court of Khosrov Paris prevented the young Persian musician Barbat from entering the court of the Shah. But at the end, Barbat succeeded in delighting the Shah due to his performing skills, and thus he won authority at the court. In Armenian historiography, the above mentioned fact is simply interpreted as a participation of Armenian musicians in the canonization of model system of Iranian music. Although it is difficult to doubt that Armenian authors were unaware of the poetic versions of Firdusi or uh, Nizami, it should be said that in 13th century, Firdusi Shahname was recited in Persian in Armenian monasteries, as evidenced by 13th, 14th century poet Kostandin Yerzakatsi. The divergence of the depictions by Eastern and Armenian authors enables to put forward even some new interpretation on a number of references connected with the name of Barbat.
It follows that a historical person becomes a hero after winning victory over the foreign musicians at the contest, whose deeds acquire religious and cultural significance. In all cases, Barbad is a young musician, and his rivals are elderly Christians, Armenian Sarkis, and Greek Nagisa. The birth of the new Muslim religion presupposes the separation of Greco-Armeno-Iranian tradition, which stems from the common Indo-European cultural heritage and the formation of the system of classical music in itself. The trend of canonizing musical art, in addition to sustaining the traditions of the past, facilitated the development of Eastern musical genres based on the normative thinking. This is evidenced by the Khosrovani style profoundly meaningful in Armenian church music. I would like to refer to the history. Um, Armenian church officially recognized this widely embracing and ancient phenomena. The great poet and composer of 12th century, Catholicos Nerses Norhali, expanding this style in his works, affirmed the sustainability of cross penetrations of various styles in musical art. In his Shnorhali and his work, Revond Alishan writes that Armenians developed the Khosrow style in their works and cites the words of 13th century historian, Armenian historian, Kirakos Gandaketi on Shnorhali, that the latter regulated hymns, songs, melodies, and poems written in this style. So Shnorhali, in his hymns, used the third mood of Armenian Oktoechus, eight mode system which is the analog of Iranian charga. The comparison of various Iranian and Armenian versions of charga, considered to be the heart of Eastern Muhammad, as well as Armenian sacred and Ashur songs, reveal similarities in emotional and psychological state likewise. Thus, it can be assumed the special semantic sustainability of charga, the uniqueness of sound system characterized by emotional weight of intervals. In Iranian radif, the system of classical uh, dust gas, there is an abundance of so-called chahar mezrab, chahar bagh gushes, the names of which are associated with the four rivers, gardens, and hierarchy of heavenly and Islamic paradise. I will restrict myself just saying that the above-mentioned parameter that relates to Islamic mysticism, Sufi's cognitive system, and numerical symbolism testifies that the issue of interrelations is not limited solely to the similarities in structural and modal intonation elements. The relationship between Christian spiritual music and Islamic maqam, incoherent and disjointed as it might seem at first, is anchored on more fundamental basis, the functional essence of which has subsisted during the natural developmental processes of people's religious art. In the depth of genetic and typological similarities, one can observe a strong syncretic core that was forged in the rich religious rituals and that best facilitated the canonization in repetitions and variations <coughs> of certain musical poetic passages. In this context, it is worth mentioning Sahari, an ancient instrumental melody Muram, the sunrise spiritual hymn played on Zurna. In Iran, it's a popular song of urban music. The word Sahari is an Arab Iranian terminological borrowing, means, uh, meaning sunrise. We come across this term already in 16th century in the works of the poet Grigoris Akhtamarzi, Morga Sahar, meaning bird of dawn. The melody is played in all kinds of ritualistic ceremonies. In some regions of Armenia, Sahari is played in the next morning of the wedding to announce the innocence and purity of the bride. Until mid 20th century, the tradition was remembered by elderly Zurna players on how many families they ruined by not playing Sahari. Parallels are more than obvious in the sphere of Ashur art that was developed in the boundaries of mythopoetic thinking of the people of the East. Why are the territorial boundaries of the tale-like story from Iran to Turkey and Transcaucasia, as well as why are the national manifestations of the genre? The love stories of Shah Sanam and Gharib, Leili and Mejnun, Khosrov and Shirin have found different interpretations in Iranian, Armenian, and Turkish-speaking people's works. The mere titles of which model the genre According to some scientists, the majority of Dastan motifs have Persian origin. 
that is, they penetrate into India, Central Asia, and Caucasus from Persia. It is noteworthy that plot compositions, especially the genre of novel, were widespread in medieval Armenian literature. We know Hovanes Yerzenkatsi's 13th century poem on love story of Christian priest's son and Mullah's daughter, Hovanes and Aisha, the verses of Bagisheti, Akhtamarti, and others on the eternal topic of the nightingale and the rose, whose concise structure and basis relate closely to the thematic core of Eastern love story. The parallels do not, however, predetermine a one-sided influence. The musical, poetic, and narrative tradition is impossible to borrow or replicate automatically if the deep cultural basis is lacking. Armenian poetry, as well as professional song art in the late Middle Ages, are abundant in bilingual, tri- and quadrilingual poems which were the consequence of interactive relations between different ethnic groups. Suffice it to mention prominent Armenian Ashuk Sayatnova, who has become an aesthetic standard in Armenian culture, a symbol of perfection of Ashuk song art and national identity. His role in the development and sustainment of musical poetic relationships of the Caucasian and Iranian peoples in the late medieval period was great. Being a court musician of Georgian King Iraq II, Sayat Nova was the first who voiced Iranian melodies in Georgia, making it popular in Tiflis, in multinational cultural center of Transcaucasia, in his own way, composing in four languages, Armenian, Georgian, Persian, and Azeri, and personifying the ideals of neighboring nations in musical characters. Sayat Nova, first of all, was the successor of Gusan, bard art of ancient Armenia. As a matter of fact, the explanation of the name of the first epic singers, that is Gusans, can be found in the Armenian language. The word Govasan, which means praiser, has been transliterated in Persian and become Gusan, whose etymology is not traced in Persian. Uh, at this point, again referring to Ashuk Dastans, I'd like to mention that the pervasive existence of Ashur love, five, okay, romance in near Middle East is widely conditioned by several religious ritualistic function bearing constituents available in the genre structure. The assimilation of which by Islamic and Christian cultures does not exclude similarities in their archaic forms. In traditional cultures based on folk ritualistic and religious beliefs, the couples in love are often compared to the sun and moon, thus reflecting the worship of celestial bodies on ethnocultural level. Bears of sacred knowledge and love, the ashus, are plated into the given social cultural environment. Bearing in mind several examples, of cultural realities in Armenian and Iranian traditional art music, I tried to dwell upon those sacred values which penetrated into the works of the musicians of the East, bringing together Christian and Muslim musical worlds at different times. Undoubtedly, the Armenian-Iranian musical relations are not limited to the domain of traditional art music. They are multifaceted and manifested both in performance and composer's work. Nikolai Ostigranyan was the first composer at the end of 19th century who recorded arranged the classical Iranian dust gas. Of special interest is the process of formation development of Armenian-Iranian community, which played an important role of the development of Iranian culture, greatly enhancing and complementing both nations' traditional lore. They initiated different projects in different fields, including staging of the first operatic works, formation of the first symphonic orchestras and choirs. They were also the authors to create the first multi-voiced and orchestral arrangement of national anthem of Iran. The list of innovative works could truly be continued. At the end of my speech, I would like to say that most precious and especially valuable and historically, culturally, traditionally bound relationships to help highlight the past and contribute to the present humane, scholarly, and for me, musical collaborations. Thank you for your attention.
I'd like to invite our four speakers to the front for uh, any questions. And if anybody has a question, please raise your hand, and I'll call on you to address the panel. First, let them take their seats. Everyone here, most people here know that Basak Sunni uh, has been associated in Armenian history as being the uh, incarnation of uh, treason and treachery. Uh, and I'm wondering if you could explain why that area was, was it a holdover of uh, Zorvanite Zoroastrianism, mm -hmm. or is there some connection there in terms of a geographic uh, factor there? That's one question to you. One question to both Khodlad uh, and Turaj as well is both of you are involved, I know personally both of you, and I know that both of you are aware of the global history movement in the last 40 years. My question is, is ancient scholars or medievalists, uh, how do you position yourself in terms of the new discourses of global history, in terms of connected histories, global histories, and so forth? And lastly, a question for uh, uh, Yerin Jakhyan, Dr. Yerin Jakhyan, and the question is, I enjoyed your talk very much, and uh, uh, I lost my notes, I was taking notes. Uh, the two people you mentioned, Sargis and Barbat, Barbat who, uh, who went to the uh, Sasanian court. Uh, you said it's a very well-known source. I'm wondering if you could mention that. Is it uh, 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 it's a legend. Zandaran, or was it? No, was it no, no, no. It's a legend included in the poem of the Firdusi, epic poem of Firdusi. I see. It's okay. yes, so Shahname, it's, Shah it's legend, and at the same same time in Armenian historiography, there are references, a lot of references to that story. So that is it mentioned in one of the classical Armenian histories, or uh, and also, um, uh, are there any? Is there any evidence, to your knowledge, of uh, no, uh, musical texts circulating in that region between Armenian centers and Iranian centers, and whether? <coughs> such circulation may have, may have contributed to intersecting and uh, connected histories of musical uh, traditions in both cultures. No, I'm not so aware of that. Let's that begin can. with Raj. Yeah. Sure. Um, I picked on Sunni because there's so much more on Sunni. And in these Pahlavi inscriptions, Sunni is singled out. Uh, I, I mean, that opens the gate to look at these other borderland, you might want to call uh, noble houses, Nakharars. I mean, where is the boundary of Iran? I mean, even if you follow the Sasanian inscriptions, here is Azerbaijan, and here, where is it exactly? What are the demarcations between what we call the Armenian world and the Iranian world? I think these houses in between aren't really clear what they are. It is sure that later Armenian sources, the Sunnik, you know, they're bad Armenian, but the Sasanians are not even seeing them as uh, really, you know, completely part of this but Armenian that's world. Not really explanation or response to my question as to why Sunik was so sui generous. Why was it so uh, unique in some ways as a, as a kind of bastion for Iranian influence well, even late into the post-Iranian mm, anti-Iranian mm, mm, uh, So that is a good question which I have Can no you answer. Of the Nakharar uh, system in Sunik geographically? Or I do not know. But there are two things clear. They have interest in Zoroastrianism all the way in the 5th, 6th century, I mentioned the Echmiyatsin, which may be actually still their uh, family who are supporting this. Secondly, there are sources that relate to the language of Sunik, uh, that they suggest that actually the language is so different from we think about sort of Armenian language already in late antiquity. So that's, I think, also something very interesting. Linguistically, religiously, of course, they're inclined to the older tradition. Linguistically, they're a bit different, and uh, they're just being seen as different. I, mean, I think this is a way to look at these uh, two sides and see uh, in terms of identity politics. And some of them don't fit either side. Okay. If I actually might build on that question to answer your 
question about um, global history and um, connected histories. Um, I don't know, did, did you read that little thing that is uh, included in the Sasanika said that Tim Greenwood wrote about the Armenian mm -hmm. uh, sources uh, about Sasanians. Uh, Sionik is actually mentioned in a very interesting way that it says that the king of the Sionik, Basak, who is seen as, or the uh, local Nakhara, who is seen as the great traitor, actually could just, his name could just be Vahram, right? His name, in, it, from Armenian point of view, he's seen as an Armenian. And the reason I say I'm building up on that one is not to start a who's who and ethnicity issue, but what I was trying to do, which I didn't quite necessarily get into in 20 minutes, is that this region, I would say, I would say there is a geographical side to the question, the answer to what you're saying, that uh, anything that includes that region of, of, of the eastern side of like uh, Sevan going up to the eastern shore of the Caspian and further down to the area of Ardebil, I I'm, I'm, I am also, I was trying to suggest that there is some sort of a local um, cohesion, geographical and political cohesion, which even continues on to when these Dalamites from Tarom are coming on, and then obviously in the later period, uh, with a very much connected history of this area to the other side of the Ar 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 Araxes. But I think this would be one of the ways of addressing the issue of connectedness. A regional in the global context. This is the reason I also dare coming to this side of the Caspian. Well, I should be way um, on the east side because I think these are all really, in a, in a sense, um, connected set of narratives. There are characters that are connecting them, but also the same processes uh, that are connecting them. There are these are. Uh, this is the same set of um, events that are leading to each other in a very boring historical linear way, but a series of themes and institutions and um, historical actions that you could say connects anything from, I don't know, I wouldn't dare going for the west and Azerbaijan because my knowledge of it would be not be very well, but up to the northern Afghanistan, up to the area of Tukharistan, that in this northern area, it is all connected histories. It is all part of the revival of this entire uh, region as a um, centralized region of Eurasia, I would, I would claim. So I would say that what I'm, at least the way I am looking at it is very much from a global historian point of view, trying to focus on a little region and see these uh, um, even local events in a connected sense. No evidence because uh, it's oral tradition. It's tradition related of oral. Yes, it's related of oral tradition. The Armenian uh, uh, sacred religious music. They had a uh, nomadic system. Our nerve, but the Iranian music, there is no nervous system. So it's oral tradition, totally oral tradition. <laughs> Up to 18th century, 17th, 18th century, there is no. Uh, text, musical text, or shit, some, some kind of musical evidence. Is that's why I appreciate very much the uh, historical sources uh, which uh, uh, we found in the works of Armenian historians. Yeah. I have a question about the music. Do you think the Armenian and the Persian ancient or medieval music had a separate source and then gets kind of became close to each other? Or they came together, start, start from the same source and then diverged? Oh, it's uh, hard to say, of course. The problem is that Muham, Dasga, any kind of traditional music genre, genre, it's a model, perfect model uh, for creating uh, pieces, uh, certain pieces. It depends on the uh, knowledge and uh, skills of the musician, how to interpret, how to uh, do his improvisation or extemporization. Uh, otherwise, Mulam is a just model, uh, specific notes, combination of specific, specific notes. But the combination during this combination of that notes, there are uh, certain traditional uh, rhythmic, uh, musical, intonational phrases which are passing uh, through tradition to tradition and uh, becoming traditional ones. Uh, 
So I tried to dwell on that uh, issue, uh, which we have in Iranian does got common music intonational phrases, which are uh, can be found in Iranian dasga and in uh, Armenian uh, religious songs. Yeah, that's why because the mod the mode of those uh, pieces are uh, is the same is the same. For example, jarga or sega or yega doesn't matter. Yeah. In Iranian, yeah, that's got <laughs> seven. So we have seven uh, modes in Iranian traditional music and eight modes in Armenian. And there are a lot of connections, of course, in uh, those modes. The system, of, uh, the construction, the ways of, uh, yeah, uh, of interpreting those modes. I have two quick questions. Uh, one for uh, Arnold. Um, I w I'd love to hear you reflect on um, the chronological sources, right? How you use sources. I think you start with a 10th century source. So, how you kind of um, choose what sources to rely on and whatnot, and then hagiographical sources as well. So, Carpus Bay Sloth, of course, is a Persian Martyr Act, so it's martyrology. Pseudo Sabaeus, the source you cited, was specifically kind of an embellished uh, folk motif kind of source. And then for Professor Dari, um, I love this idea that the Sasanians are trying to re spatially recategorize the world into Iran and on Iran, which is very clearly their innovation, and they're trying to figure out what the boundaries are. My question about Sunik in particular is the two pieces of evidence was the diadem, right, the handing of the diadem, and then, of course, the zarbed. But Sasanians are also appointing the Meshansha, they're appointing the, right, they're, they are invested in who's appointed as king in Armenia. They have Marzaban appointed over Armenia, so they're, the idea that they're uh, active in Sunik doesn't mean that they're therefore uh, treating it as Iran. That could simply just be how they're treating it as on Iran. So I, I like the idea that it's border lands and that they're still trying to define the spatial territory, but is Sweenik necessarily Iran from the evidence that we have? Okay, uh, so why did I start with a 10th century source, the narrative about Babik, or what might have been Babkan, it seems like, uh, uh, which is the narrative we also find in Stepanos or Belian, and um, the earlier one is in uh, Daskuranzi or Kahangatsi. Uh, so uh, I was thinking of sort of having a narrative for the presentation, and I thought, how do I do it? Should I use factual en evidence in some ways to go about, or just should I just cite the earliest references wherever I see and sort of then uh, build on a narrative with that? So that was my only objective, is just to have a narrative in the presentation. And then hagiographical sources. Uh, hagiographical sources, that was uh, more specifically for, uh, in connection to sort of the statements Hazar put into sort of Wahan's mouth in his uh, history and how it really sort of closely corresponds to sort of uh, what we see in the history of Karkha de uh, So that was the only reason I connected. So because you have correspondence there, and therefore the hagiographical nature can kind of be uh, overcome you have consensus in some ways? Well, I mean, we cannot, I mean, uh, say 400%. It's really, really difficult working with hagiographical sources, but still, um, when we see a lot of evidences, for instance, this fifth century uh, policies, we see a lot of uh, resemblances in a whole variety of sources, not just Christian, not just Armenian, Syriac, um, a lot of different uh, sort of the rabbinic <laughs> tradition, etc. So then we can sort of in some ways, uh, see them more as, in some ways, factual. Uh, I, I don't think Suinik is part of Iran Shah. It's clearly not. Uh, but in the eyes of the Iranians who are creating these boundaries and sort of, as you mentioned, especially giving designation to places, Suinik is also not Armenian for that. Uh, now, why that is, I cannot tell. Mm -hmm. But it's an interesting question. Why are these people being singled out? Differently, why is mentioned that linguistically they may be differently, they're more attached sometimes to the south, they're much more independent. So, and I think that's part of the characteristics of this region and also before the Sasanians, also Iranian plateau. Um, you know, you're that, who makes this designation? And I think things are quite uh, unclear still uh, in the beginning of the third century. Can you um, describe what may be 
Um, we can't actually, that's very hard to define because there is variety. Uh, the person to uh, study really now is Abdi Young, professor of Zoroastrianism at, uh, in Leiden, uh, who has written a series of articles on Armenia and Georgia, and then also on the Parthian, sort of Iranian Parthians, where we be, we're we beginning to get the sense uh, that Z what Zoroastrianism obviously means before the Sasanians, uh, it's uh, something that is, m is much more wide open in that. Uh, you could have Anahit temples, you know, in one way in Armenia, and you could have an Anahit temple in Estakh with another way, and you could have another Anahit temple somewhere else. And all of these are accepted in this uh, Parthian commonwealth, the Georgian, Armenian, uh, Iranian worlds. Uh, what happens, I think, with the Sasanians, there's this idea now, let's create what we think Zoroastrianism is and what it's not. And so this hostile actions from the third century by the Sasanians, uh, I mean, if you look at it from the Armenian side, you know, these Zoroastrians are trying to impose Zoroastrianism on us, right? But I think the issue is much more complex. There are a set of Zoroastrians in the, in the province of Fars who think their idea is the right way, and they're going to go smash all temples belonging to any Zoroastrian deity that is not in line with them. Uh, that is something, I think, different but the Sasanians are doing, restricting other religions as well as in the third century from the Jewish and Christian side. They're trying to manage religions. And certainly I think managing Zoroastrianism is uh, one of the key points if you're a Zoroastrian empire. And the Armenian Zoroastrianism, although they've got the Anahid and the Vahagn and the, you know, all of them, but, but they're not, th this is the sort of this Parthian world of Zoroastrianism that is very different. Um, that the dynastic conflict and the religious differences might have actually been a reason for the adoption of Christianity. Mm, okay, thank you for pushing me that way. <laughs> Look, I, I think there's already hostility between this Armenian world and Iranian world before 314 or 309 that we're talking about. It's not that Armenians say, okay, now we're Christians, let's have a... Well, I mean, it's not clear cut, certain, not like that. Already, I think, for a hundred years, there are tensions within the Armenian noble houses who are independent somewhat, and the Sasanian is trying to control them, but religiously as well. They're trying to impose something that is, is un unacceptable to them. And it's not obviously, it's Zoroastrianism. And it's a brand of Zoroastrianism that has sort of been created in the province of Fars by a family who's trying to destroy all other Zoroastrian sites. And I mean, what do the Zoroastrian uh, Naharars think of uh, what's being done to them? Obviously, I mean, uh, there's a negotiation that's not going anywhere. I mean, th th that's a good reason to break away completely. Yeah. It totally makes sense. Uh, we have time for one more question. Anybody want to jump in? Yeah. So, uh, the music that you're talking about is more the popular Kusan type of thing. Songs, but the Armenian musical tradition goes much farther, mostly in the church, right? Quadraphonic singing, gospel, etc. goes to the fourth century. There's a huge amount of uh, yeah. uh, music created there that's very unique. Did that have an influence? Was that mingled at all in the uh, Iranian culture? Or because it was Christian culture, it remained separate? Of course, church, Armenian church, tried to keep it separately from traditional music. That's why they rejected the Busan art, uh, traditional mundane art of Busans, uh, criticizing uh, the ancient Busans. But still, uh, of course, the Armenian octave echoes, uh, eight mode system has very ancient roots in seventh century, and it's a written tradition. Uh, the other question that uh, in uh, 17th century we lost the key to read the pneumatic system of Armenian music, khas, our khas notation, we lost it, but it was a written tradition. Uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, that's why I told that it's a unique uh, musical culture because uh, we have uh, oral and written tradition in Armenian music, church music, uh, has its uh, uh, written tradition, 
and uh, traditional genres uh, of oral tradition uh, has a lot of a lot of connections with church music too. So maybe uh, it, it's uh, hard to answer Armenian music influenced Iranian music. There are uh, similarities in the intonational sphere, in modal sphere, yeah. Some uh, canonized songs are very uh, famous both in Iran and Armenia. For example, Ashuf Sayat Novas in Njmanet Arkayagan, very, very, uh, uh, Baba the Pish, 17th century, or Sayat Nova, 18th century. Uh, very popular songs which are very close to Iranian charga because of their model structure, because of model structure. But the interpretation of these melodies are different. A more philosophical, more concise structure of Armenian uh, songs and meditative improvisational nature of Iranian uh, melodies. We can talk uh, just uh, on 17th, 18th century Iranian classical dasga system. Before that, just uh, folklore genres, not classical traditional music. There are no uh, information, there's no information on that, side, on that subject because of absence of uh, uh, literary tradition. Yeah, it was oral. Thank you very much. We have a 15 minute coffee break. But before we begin, please join me in thanking our as the moderator. I will s introduce the speakers individually just before they present. Um, and so let me begin with um, my dear colleague and friend, in fact, everyone on this panel, I'm really honored to have them all together, uh, Elise Sanasarian, who is a professor of political science at the University of Southern California. She is the author of The Religious Minorities in Iran and the Women's Rights Movement in Iran, Mutiny, Appeasement, and Repression from 1900 to Khomeini. And it's uh, edited Persian translation by Nushin Khorasani, um, which won the first prize at the, as the best research book on women in Iran by the Sedigre Dolat Abadi Library in Tehran. Her publications on a variety of topics have appeared in book chapters and academic journals, such as the Journal of International Affairs, Holocaust and Genocide Studies, and Diaspora. She has served on the editorial boards of Politics and Religion Journal, which is the general official journal of the Amer uh, American Political Science Association. And at the present, she serves on the advisory board of the Journal of the Society of Armenian Studies. She has received various awards, including her university's highest honor, the Associates Award for Excellence in Teaching. The title of her presentation is Complexities of Objective Research on Armenians in Iran. Elise, please. I didn't, I didn't know how else to get here. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, my research has moved on from the issue of religious minorities to other topics. Um, although I keep up with developments and I'm still advising a lot of graduate students all over the world, I've done work um, with colleagues. We got a fund from U.S. Agency for International Development, so we did work on street children and HIV AIDS in Kenya. I've also been in Tanzania on the same subject. Uh, I just finished an article on tension between secularism and religion with several colleagues in Turkey. Um, and I finished the book on the concept and practice of public good, but it hasn't come out yet. So yes, I have moved on. So why revisit <laughs> this topic? First, because uh, Huri Berberian asked me to be on this panel. Second, because I realized it's an opportunity for me to talk about some of the research problems I faced, but purposefully, I never addressed them, never talked about them, never wrote about them. I didn't even tell people that I'm very close to academics about the experience. The reason I can do that now, especially with regard to Armenians, is because many of the people who helped me either left the country or have passed away. So 
that, I thought, is a good opportunity for me to talk about these problems that I faced. I want to thank two people that I couldn't thank in my book because they didn't want their names to be mentioned. One was Archbishop Artak Manukian, and who has passed away, and the other one is uh, Mrs. Navart Madatian, who was an active member of Dashnak and was very much involved with the church in whose house I stayed. Of course, it was her and me and her 80-year-old grandmother, and um, they were extremely helpful to me but didn't want their names mentioned. I'm going to first identify the problem and then give you one example from my experience so that you understand. But for every problem I identify, I can give you dozens of examples. So I've only chosen one to stay within the time frame I'm given. The first problem I faced when I went for my field work to Iran, which was, of course, uh, many years ago, it was a few years after the end of Iran-Iraq war, was an atmosphere of intense suspicion. I think that atmosphere still exists in Iran, but at that time, it was uh, much worse. I'll give you one example. Um, I really wanted to meet Reverend Tadeusz Mikhailian. He was senior pastor of St. John's Armenian Evangelical Church in Tehran. And I had read some of the interviews he had given to Western press, and I wanted to talk to him more about what he had said. So Mrs. Navart Madatian took me to his house because she knew his wife and him and was very fond of them. So I walk into the living room. He's sitting behind a table, and next to him were just a pile of documents. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the character of us academics, those piles of documents are more precious <laughs> than any pile of gold or diamonds. <laughs> And I was ready to take a leap forward and grab them. But his demeanor was so serious that I realized I have to sit away from him and across the table from him. He stared at me, at me for a long time. And then he said, so, Elise, how is CIA doing these days? <laughs> I said, how would I know? And he said, well, aren't you working for them? Now, at that point, I realized Logic has to be abandoned. <laughs> I felt, and I did this many times, that my instincts moved me more so than a kind of a logical approach to a situation. So I just got up, started walking out of the room, and turned to him, and I said, you know, you shouldn't be talking to me if you think I'm an agent of the CIA. It's dangerous for you. So as I'm turning to grab the knob, I can hear Mrs. Navart Madatian saying, Va, Jesus Christos. <laughs> How can Elise be a CIA agent? I knew her family and her father played violin. <laughs> now, meanwhile, my brain tries to process the correlation between violin playing and me being an agent. <laughs> and I can't take that in, and I don't know how it's going to impact, but it had a positive impact because uh, uh, Reverend called me back in and shared with me unbelievable documents. And I, he was the most courageous person I met in my trip to Iran. Second problem that I faced, um, I want to put it under the category of um, not anticipated problems. Uh, let me uh, give you the context. One of the issues that I faced looking at all religious minorities and Armenians or no exception was inner group conflict. So Jews were the same as Austrians. Everybody had two segments, at least, in their groupings. The Armenian one was divided between Dashnak and, of course, the church on the one side, and everybody else on the other, which were called under the rubric of left. It didn't mean they were leftists. They were just called left. I was very lucky, and this happened by accident, that I had so many f close friends on both sides who trusted me and knew me. I didn't design this, it just happened that way. Um, I want to give you an example of unexpected, uh, which really took me by surprise. I wanted to fly to the city of Shiraz, where I went to senior high in an all-girls public school for two years, and then went to the university one year. I had many people, friends there that I wanted to meet of all the religious backgrounds, including majority, of course, uh, Muslims. 
There were no tickets. Everything was sold out. Uh, so I thought I will wait until I find tickets. I get a call from somebody from the left of the political perspective saying, you know, Archbishop Goryon Papian of Isfahan, and I'm in Tehran, has found out about your dilemma and he's willing to take you in his private jet to Shiraz. He's going there with a chorus from Isfahan. They will be performing for Shiraz Armenians and they, want, uh, they will take you along. You can stay there or come back with them, whatever you like. I was so happy. It was like, oh, how fantastic to go with this group and then go to Shiraz. I'll stay longer. So I walk towards Mrs. Navart Madatian and I say, you know, Archbishop Goryum Papian of Isfahan has offered to take me. Isn't that great? Navart's coloring changed. <laughs> and she said, honey, you're not going to go. And I couldn't understand why I wouldn't go. <laughs> and she again said no without giving any details. But you know, you can't say no to me. I mean, inquiring minds want to know. I mean, I won't let it go. So after persistence, her response was, if you go, if you accept to go with him, all the doors will close down at you in Tehran in your relationship with others, and particularly with Archbishop Artak Manukian. And of course, Artak Manukian had helped me to get into Iran. So uh, I found out later that it's because the two archbishops had a personality conflict with each other, and it was serious enough that there will be repercussions for me. I had to check this with some Armenians from the left of the political spectrum, and they were told that it's true. Everybody knows that. And with high probability, I was offered this trip on purpose uh, by Archbishop Artak Manukian in order to indirectly undermine, um, uh, was offered by Papian to um, undermine Artak Manukian. And they also <coughs> told me that he was, the Archbishop of Isfahan was often called Rasputin. So. <laughs> <laughs> the next problem that I faced, uh, the only category that I can put it under is the psychoculture of the community. This made it, in fact, uh, more difficult. Everybody thought it would be easier to do research, being born there and Armenian, uh, to do research among Armenians, but that was not correct. And it, because mainly it contributed to the psychoculture, I would say, of the community, i give you one example. It was very important for me to get verification of practices I had heard about or read about. So if somebody says, my uncle told me this is what happened to him, that's not important. I wanted to know if that happened to an individual that directly told me about it. Um, so a friend invited two carpenters who were constantly working on people on the construction side, mostly Muslims, to meet with me and talk to me and have cake and tea. For one hour, I drilled them. Have you had any experiences, small or big? And no, 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 Ar uh, you, know, you know, Iranians love Armenians. They love them, always. OK, uh, anything else? <laughs> Legally, you're second class citizens. I guess that shows a lot of love. But anything else? <laughs> but no. So I go to the kitchen, I give up. All of a sudden. Just in the back of my ear, I hear one of them telling the other, oh, Karapet, you remember when we were in uh, Muhammad's house having tea, the bottom of our teacups were marked. And then when they took it to the kitchen, the mother said prayers and washed it and separated it from others. I don't know how I got from the kitchen to the living room. So if anybody tells you we can't fly, we can, 100%. I just don't know what happens physically. And then I heard the rest of the story. But until that point, um, it hadn't occurred to them to share this information with me. And that's really exactly what I was looking for. The next problem that I faced was gender. Now, gender is a very sensitive issue. And how one deals with it, uh, it, has, it can be direct, it can be indirect. I have to give a lot of credit to Armenian women for their help um, very much like other religious minority women, if it wasn't because of them, I wouldn't be able to do my research. And uh, my work uh, in Africa, as well as my work with um, uh, uh, looking at survivors of Armenian genocide, uh, watching the interviews, 
has shown me that women often give a lot of detail, are much more truthful, go into specifics, and so as a researcher, that's really what I needed uh, from them. But I want to give you an example of how directly it impacted on my research. I wanted to fly to the city of Abadan, where I went to um, Armenian school for nine years. And uh, uh, this city, and I basically grew up in that city. It was in the south. And during the Iran-Iraq war, it was basically destroyed. There were no flights there. But I really wanted to visit it anyway. A friend of a friend approached me and said, um, I'm flying, I have a private contract with the government, I'm flying there on a helicopter, and I can take you there 24 hours. We'll just go in, I'll have to do something, and then we will come out. You can't stay there. I said, that's okay. The day before our flight, he called distraught, saying he didn't realize I'm a woman. <laughs> and because I'm a woman, uh, I cannot be in the helicopter alone with him and the, um, the pilot who was a Muslim Iranian man, but it wouldn't have mattered. It could have been Jewish or Armenian or Zoroastrian because I'm not intimate with either one of them, which is the word mahram they often use. So he, he said he, his wife, whom I knew, had offered to come uh, in the helicopter with us, that way I can claim to be related to her and then the trip would be okay. I said, I'm grateful, that's fine. The next morning they both called distraught saying their son has the flu and uh, she has to stay and take care of him. So that was that, <laughs> I couldn't go. Um, but gender also played in a different way in this research. Um, a female psychologist did an extensive study showing that Female scholars have much higher number of citations than male scholars. And her argument was that they feel they won't be believed. <laughs> so they really load the citation. And in fact, it's true for my book um, that if you separate the endnote and, and footnote, it becomes a separate book. You literally can publish it as a <laughs> separate book. Because on everything, I had to have like verification, interviewed, one wasn't correct, several, any other source, you know. And it was very draining to do this. But I want to conclude with, with and relate it to one last uh, problem of scholarship that I don't think it's only mine. I think it's also other people in, uh, who do scholarship. Problem with Iranian studies is everyone is an expert. <laughs> Armenians too, yes. Um, so um, engineers are political scientists, doctors are historians, and they have no understanding as to what objective research means, what going through documents and looking at them means. It's completely a foreign phenomenon to them. So this was one issue that I faced, but I want to give you just one example of this that happened later on. Um, my book had already come out, the paperback came out a few years later. I received a letter from an Armenian man in Glendale. Um, he complimented me with the usual compliments Armenians give to other Armenians, proud to have an Armenian, okay. <laughs> it started like this, it continued. Then after one page of proud, proud comes, and I want to give you what I think and expand on some of the issues you said. And then he went on for 10, 12 pages, single space, exploiting various issues that he wanted me to supposedly know. They weren't directly relevant. I mean, even if they had come out, even if he had told me that earlier, I needed verification heavily on some point to put it in. But anyway, so I thought I would just write politely a thank you note and send it to him. Right before I put the thank you note in the envelope, I thought, oh, well, a lot of non-academics don't get to read. They may read our books, but they don't get to read our articles. I might as well put two of my most recent pieces and send it to him. So I took a bigger envelope and put that in, send it. Big mistake. <laughs> two weeks later comes a, a letter from him. I think I've memorized it so I can tell you what it said. Now I know who you are. 
you're an agent of Jews and Baha'is. I hope they are paying you well. Of course, it could also be that you're naive and you're just giving services to them free of charge. And don't be stupid. Get money from them because they have a lot of money. Um, so, you know, of course, my aunt offered to go and beat him up. Uh, she was in her 80s, and I'm sure she would have done it, but I didn't want to go there. But I want to end my um, talk by saying that the concept of objective research, it's very difficult to do objective research in, on complex societies and complex topics. And Western academics, particularly in social sciences, specifically in my field, which is political science, are clueless when they write their books and articles about methodology, survey data, and all that. They're completely out of touch about the reality of what goes on on the ground. And I thought that the title of this panel that Huri chose, Challenges, uh, is very correct um, because there are many challenges. And no matter how well prepared you are, knowing the language or languages, you, it is still, if you want to do an objective work of scholarship and you want to make sure everybody is presented, you don't have anything against the state, you don't have anything against the society, majority, minority, um, it is a big issue and it's a big challenge. So um, I'm glad that you chose this title for our panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elise. Our next speaker is Huri Berberian, who doesn't need an introduction, but she's a professor of history, uh, the McRooney Family Presidential Chair in Armenian Studies, and the director of the Armenia Studies Program here at UCI. She is the author of a number of articles and a book that's entitled Armenians and the Iranian Constitutional Revolution of 1905 to 1911, the Love for Freedom Has No Fatherland. Her next book, I think I've seen the cover of that book. Her next book, Roving Revolutionaries, Armenians, and Connected Revolutions in the Russian, Iranian, and the Ottoman Worlds will be out with UC Press in April uh, of this year. The title of her presentation is A Shared World of Revolution, Belonging, Socialism, and the national question. Hoja. I'm not a whatever this is, not Mac user. PC. Yeah. PC. Okay. So uh, thank you, Nasrin, for that introduction, and uh, thank you, Elise, for uh, making us laugh. We didn't laugh that much this morning. <laughs> it was all very somber and serious. Well, anyway, so as the title suggests, and in keeping with the theme of this conference, and by drawing on archival documents and the Armenian language press in the Caucasus, Middle East, and Europe in the early 20th century, um, my presentation today explores the shared world of revolution inhabited by Armenians and Iranians as well as Ottoman and Russian subjects during the early 20th century revolutionary wave that swept the region and beyond. It focuses in particular on notions of belonging to a larger whole, Iranian and other, and the concept of fatherland, Haidenik that although grounded in the reality of Armenian populations dispersed among three empires, that's disconcerting, <laughs> that although grounded in the reality of Armenian populations dispersed among three empires, Ottoman, Russian, and Iranian, were also part of the discourse of socialism's challenging relationship with the national question. It was important and imperative 
For many Armenian revolutionaries taking part in the Russian Young Turk and Ottoman and the Iranian revolutions from about 1904 to 1912. To reconcile socialism on the one hand and cultural and political autonomy for nationalities on the other, and to demonstrate that the two were not incompatible. Let's first begin with what was the extent and nature of this shared world of revolution. The Russian, Young Turk, and Iranian revolutions coincided with revolutions in Portugal in 1910, Mexico in 1911, and China in 1912. They shared a great deal and took markedly similar, similar paths. Progressive movements toppled autocratic states and initiated the beginning of popular sovereignty, that is, constitutional rule, parliament, and freedoms. But they did not successfully implement or guarantee them. All revolutions were followed by coup d'etat, initiated by more conservative forces. All three revolutions involved the participation of Armenian revolutionaries and intellectuals who contributed in diff differing ways and degrees and with varying rates of success to revolutionary preparation, process, and development. Key among the factors driving Armenian participation was the revolutionaries' conviction that the fate of the Armenian populations living in all three empires would benefit from the establishment of a constitution that promised the end of autocracy and arbitrary rule and the realization of representative government, social and economic justice, harmonious coexistence, and equality of all citizens, regardless of religious and ethnic difference, a tall order. Moreover, our revolutionaries saw the movements as connected and part of the same fight. Collaboration between Armenian and Iranian constitutionalists and revolutionaries centered around preserving the newly established constitution after 1906 and contributing to greater democratization. In fact, a secret agreement was reached in 1907 between the Armenian Revolutionary Federation, ARF, led by Rostom, and six Majlis parliament members led by Sayyid Hassan Talizadeh. Ah, there you are. I put the arrows just in case you couldn't tell which was which. <laughs> this agreement led to many collaborative military activities between the ARF and Iranian revolutionaries against anti-constitutionalist forces. The Social Democratic Hunchakyan Party, SDHP, also joined the Iranian struggle, collaborating with Caucasian and Iranian Social Democrats, and translating the party's program from Armenian into Persian. They even formed the Iranian branch of the party with fellow Iranian constitutionalists. Other Caucasian Armenian Social Democrats helped found the Tabriz Social Democratic Party in 1905 and the Democrat Party in 1909. They thus acted as a mobile link between the Caucasus and Iran and between the Russian and Iranian revolutions. Iranian and Armenian workers, too, became important conduits of ideas and experiences as they crossed the South Caucasian and Iranian frontiers during the revolutionary period. Migrant workers returned to their communities in Iran influenced or affected by worker movements and strikes, socialist ideas, and revolutionary fervor in general. For some revolutionaries, the Iranian Constitutional Revolution was the first stage in the struggle that would ultimately end in socialism. Armenian Social Democrats, especially those like Ashavir Chilingirian, Varam Pilosian, and Vaso Khachaturian in Tabriz, sought the counsel of German and Russian Social Democratic leaders, Karl Kautsky and Georgi Tiekhanov, regarding two issues. First, the character of the Iranian Constitutional Revolution, that is, was it regressive or progressive? And what role, if any, should social democrats play in each of these two scenarios? Second, and closely linked to the first, what was Iran's stage of capitalist production? Kautsky encouraged participation because of the movement's primarily democratic character and considered Iran to be experiencing the first condition of industrial development, foreign capitalism, and exploitation. The triumph of democracy, which the revolution would bring about, would then usher in the final class struggle and thus social democracy. 
The temporary Social Democrats agreed with Kautsky's overall assessment in his letter to them. They concluded that the state of the working class, mostly in manufacturing production, demanded that the party work on two levels in Iran. First, as Democrats, to work in defense of democracy in the, and in the service of freeing the country from any foreign encroachment. Second, to continue to pursue socialist activity among progressive workers. The Tabriz Armenian Social Democrats argued that because Iran had entered the stage of manufacturing and industrial production and had developed a small class of workers alongside a larger class of artisans, a foundation for socialist agitation already existed. In contrast to Kautsky's recommendation, quote, to collaborate with the bourgeoisie, end quote, and participate in the revolution merely as Democrats, Armenian Social Democrats insisted on continuing a struggle as Social Democrats whose worldview significantly departed from that of mere Democrats. They contended that their role at all times was to mobilize and agitate among workers and intellectuals and to arouse a, quote, class consciousness for the socialist struggle, end quote. Thus, they were no different than their ethnic or ideological counterparts in seeing in the Iranian constitutional revolution a path to socialism and accompanying promise for dra dramatic change in the country and the region. For Armenians, as for other imperial subjects, socialism was part and parcel of a reconfiguring of their identity, their relationship or belonging to a fatherland and to fellow subjects, and a way to reconcile class and nation. Time and time again during the revolutionary years that rocked the South Caucasus, the Ottoman Empire and Iran, there were appeals for inclusion. Whether in the form of being part of a Caucasian whole Ottomanism or inclusive Iranian nationalism. Their reality as Armenian populations in all three empires shaped their adoption of socialism, federation, and inclusion. The frequent application of the words, quote, our country, end quote, to all three rate, to all three states by their respective Armenian populations, as well as their emphasis on encompassing part of a wider society and identity signified an acute consciousness of their realities and a path that promised their own welfare and progress unambiguously in line with the well-being and development of their host societies and states. Solidarity, in particular whether between Armenians and Iranians or Armenians and Turks, recurred as a common refrain in print and was very similar to that of other Ottoman Muslim and non-Muslim subjects. I apologize. I had nothing to do with it. Okay. So it was similar to uh, other Ottoman and non-Ottoman non Ottoman Muslim and non-Muslim subjects, such as Bulgarian, Macedonian, and Albanian, as they all engage with the same ideas and vocabulary as, quote, the children of the same father and the same fatherland, end quote. Whenever Armenians explain their participation in the three revolutions, they position themselves not apart from, but as a part of an inclusive society to be transformed by connected revolutionary struggles. Thus, their adoption and adaptation of ideas, and by extension identities, strongly link their present and their future with those of their fellow subjects. Their campaign to serve in the Iranian and Ottoman military serves as an excellent example of the application of an inclusive identity. <coughs> the pages of both the SDHP and ARF periodicals published in Tabriz, Zang, Bell, and Arabot Morning pushed for military service and government positions, seeking, quote, to be not the illegitimate but real child of a free fatherland and to enjoy the fatherland's beneficence and bitterness with 10 million Iranians, end quote. For Iran's Armenians, the constitution that emerged in 1906 and that they fought to preserve became a way to rise above what they considered to be their, quote, shameful rank of visitor, end quote. The Iranian constitution, like the Ottoman one, while recognizing the equality of all subjects, still retained Islam as the official religion of the country. 
Therefore, as a constitutionally affirmed religious minority, Armenians in Iran struggled to achieve the same rights and responsibilities as Muslims, declaring unequivocally, quote, we are Persian citizens, end quote. As such, they objected to having separate parliamentary representatives, which they viewed as only perpetuate, perpetuating further divisions, and they called for full political participation. As I have argued elsewhere, Iranian Armenians began to take part in a broader Iranian nationalism that at the time of the Constitutional Revolution was fairly inclusive and embraced linguistically, ethnically, and religiously diverse Iranian citizenry. This kind of reconfiguration of Iranian nationhood expressly, expressly appealed to Iranian Armenians as an ethnically and religiously distinct minority that sought incorporation into the Iranian nation in place of, quote, otherness, end quote. In a similar way, in the Ottoman Empire, Istanbul's Jamanag time, the men did that, quote, as children of the Ottoman fatherland, we too must participate in the work of our country's defense, end quote. Moreover, it, is, it insisted that Armenians remain, quote, inseparable from the Ottoman fatherland and, sh and shared the country's happiness as well as its misfortune. Armenians clearly distinguished between an Ottoman fatherland and an Ottoman nation. Turks, Arabs, Armenians, Greeks, Kurds, and others with their own past, particularities in language and so forth, remained, quote, Ottomans, Osmanlı, the children of the same fatherland, but without ceasing to be Turks, Armenians, Greeks, Arabs, etc. End quote. Therefore, Armenians were not alone in adopting two loyalties. Like other Ottoman subjects, belonging to the same fatherland did not mean waiving one's ethnic or religious identity. Our revolutionaries could not imagine separating their cause from those of their neighbors within and outside Iranian and Ottoman frontiers. Many also could not imagine separating themselves from the states in which, li in which they lived. As Tikran Zaven uh, reiterated, at least two, reiterated in at least two issues of the Tiflis-based socialist Yer Gritsayna, the voice of country, quote, just as the Armenian people in Russia and Persia has not severed its fortune and does not think to sever from the fortune of other peoples living in the same countries, in that way, the Turkish Armenian will not separate his cause of freedom from the cause of these peoples with whom inextricably tied he bears the same yoke of despotism, end quote. Zaven's comrade and Nor Hosank new current editor Karekin Kozikyan but bluntly pointed out the absurdity of separatism for the Armenians divided for centuries among three states. He writes, quote, and this is one of my favorite quotes, that which is possible to sing in poems or novels with beautifully colored pen and mighty breath and to inspire men, that thing cannot be obtained in reality. Complex political problems are not resolved by constructing castles in the sky, otain balatner. <coughs> or by wandering in the world of imagination, end quote. He cautions readers that to re recreate historical Armenia means to wage war against three states, to, elim to eliminate existing borders, and to take back by force. An impossibility, quote, even if the whole of the Armenian people, starting from the cradle infant to the old man who has reached death's door, turned into heroes armed from head to toe, end quote. The only solution for Kozikyan lies in a socialist order. Not only, only then will, quote, the chains of human inequality, end quote, be pulverized and only then will true freedom, fraternity, and equality be realized. The issue of belonging to a larger whole and the concept of father, fatherland while grounded in the reality of trans-imperial, multi-local Armenian populations was also part of the discourse of socialism's challenging relationship with the national question, and therefore an issue that the Armenian leftist press took up. They were prompted not only by their uncertain situation in newly constitutional states like Iran and the Ottoman Empire facing counter-revolutionary threats, but also by the need they saw to defend their rights, their right to a national home against some Marxists' inflexible adherence to the communist manifestos, quote, the working men have no country, end quote. 
The Armenian Revolutionary Press's discussion of belonging to a fatherland was a reflection of a larger concern and engagement with the national question and socialism. Armenian activists and intellectuals sought both socialism and cultural and political autonomy for nationalities like themselves. They made great efforts to demonstrate that the two were compatible. In fact, they said they were supported by the most brilliant, this is in quotes, European socialist minds. By appealing to European socialists, Armenian activists not only joined the larger debate taking place among socialists on the national question, but also tried to silence their own critics, especially, but not ex exclusively, those further on the left who accused them rather colorfully, I might add, at every turn of only bearing, quote, a socialist mask, of operate, operating, quote, in the clause of nationalism, of, quote, decorating themselves with socialism's feathers, and of spreading, quote, their chauvinist venom. Armenian thinkers and propagandists' arguments on socialism and the national question revolved around three issues. First, that reality, local, regional, and global dictated their position on the national question. Second, that every socialist party in any given country was national. And third, that the national question was not going away and in actuality had become even more relevant in the 20th century. Little did they know it would remain relevant in the 21st century. Their approach did not allow limiting activities to class struggle alone and force the national cause to center stage. In conclusion, Revolutionaries and ideas flowed across the Eurasian imperial frontiers and within a shared world of revolution. Ethnically and religiously as ethnically and religiously diverse revolutionaries collaborated for a better future in Iran and beyond. Ideological boundary crossings involved on some level negotiation, compromise, or the balancing of often divergent positions within socialism itself and a reappraisal re of their belonging. Thank you. Our next speaker is Talin Grigor, who is a professor of art history in the Department of Art and Art History at the University of California, Davis. She approaches 19th to 20th century art and architectural histories through the premise of post-colonial and critical theories grounded in Iran <coughs> and Parsi India. Her books include Building Iran, Modernism, Architecture, and National Heritage under the Pahlavi Monarchs, and Contemporary, which was published in 2009, and then Contemporary Iranian Art, From the Street to the Studio, published in 2014, beautiful book, highly recommended, and The Persian Revival, Ancient Iranian Art, Historiography, and Imperialism, forthcoming in 2020. And the title of her presentation is Reza Shah's Cosmopolitan Architect. Please join me in welcoming Tanya. Yeah, yes, the speaker has asked for the light to be completely out. Thank you. Thank you, Nasreen, um, for the introduction. I want to thank Kuli and Turaj and Seppu for this invitation. Um, and I also, this is, uh, I'm very honored to be here. Also in part because for the first time I'm on the same panel as Professor Sanasarian, for whom I wrote in my third year undergrad uh, my first paper on Zoroastrians. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so it's a particularly special. Uh, Thank you, Tali. You're 200 years old. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> It is entirely possible that it was during a warm summer afternoon amid a sweaty, testosterone-filled basketball game between Le Corbusier, his cousin Pierre Janaret, and their friend Gabriel Gevrekian, that the radical idea of Siam was conceived. By then, at age 25, Gevrekian had already made his mark. He had 
won the first prize for his Garden of Water and Light at the 1925 Exposition for Decorative Arts in Paris, followed by the design of two cubic gardens in southern France. Now, in 1928, he organized Siam's first three-day con conference, during which the then most influential modern modernist architect drew the La, um, La Sarraz Declaration. It clearly delineated their stance on the relationship between architecture and the state. Manifesto point seven, architecture's new attitude according to which um, it aims of its own volition to uh, resituate re itself within economic reality renders all claim to official patronage superficial. Outwardly, counterintuitively, um, yet completely in line with the doctrine of modernism, the idea of art for art's sake, these architects pledged to place architecture back into its socioeconomic context instituted the autonomizing discourse that aimed to split design from politics. This call for the profession to divorce from the state a uh, deceptive walking away from politics endowed political power to the modernist architects. So here you can see uh, a number of famous architects have collaborated with dictators, uh, inclu including Le Corbusier with the Shivi um, um, uh, state, um, um, Mussolini and, her, and um, um, Hitler, they all had a favorite architect who designed modern architecture. As the Bauhaus came under Nazi attack in 1931, Siam intensified its activities and amassed uh, German-speaking um, uh, members under Gevrekian's chairmanship between 1928 and 1932. So um, one of the most important architects is Mies uh, down here um, and who, which, to whom we will come back to. In the same year, together with uh, Mallet Stevenson, uh, Sauvage, and um, uh, Auguste Perret, Gavrakian launched L'Architecture d'Aujourd'hui. It's a very important architectural journal that is still uh, published. He then joined 32 architects to partake in Vienna's work bond exhibition under Joseph Hoffman's direction. Opened in June 1932, it received 100,000 visitors and was praised as the greatest architectural exhibition in Europe. Frank had been Gevrakian's teacher when in 1915, at the age of 15, he had arrived from Tehran and had begun his architectural education at Vienna's Academic of, uh, Academy of Applied Arts. By then, he was at home in five languages, having been born to Christian Armenian parents from Istanbul, <coughs> raised in Tehran, educated in Vienna, and trained in Paris. After graduation, he had uh, entered the atelier of Joseph Hoffman, leaving for Paris in 1922 to partner with Malle Stevenson. By 1932, Gavrakian had reached such a status in the modern movement that his modernist dwelling was featured at the uh, heart of the exhibition. So um, you're seeing this is his uh, sort of model for um, modernist architecture. Um, and um, he is right here. Um, and uh, Los is right there. I mean, these are names that um, if you were art historians, they would um, really pop out. Uh, so he's pretty central here um, in the modern movement. Uh, and this is an interior um, uh, shot of his dwelling. Um, um, uh, very minimalist, very sort of aesthetically, uh, very, very international style. In October 1933, the Nazi party shut down the Bauhaus, while Siam's Fourth Congress in Moscow planned for the same year was canceled. Despite the highly successful 1932 exhibition, the uh, Austrian work bond dissolved in 1934. The leaders of the modern movement were underrun. 
Gevrekyan, on his part, accepted Iranian government's invitation as Tehran's chief architect. Sometimes during 1933, he arrived in Iran amid the biggest construction boom since Reza Shah the Great, I mean, Shah Abbas the Great. It was a dream come true. Reza Shah had demolished two thirds of Rajar urban fabric, opening up a tabula rasa, an uh, empty slate. Ruled by a heavy-handed hand, heavy monarch bent on top-down modernization and financed by oil money, the Tehran of the 1930s was indeed a modernist dream come true. My initial curiosity uh, began with a simple question. And actually, uh, Huri's paper completely sort of, sort of, if I knew your, um, the history that you just provided, it answers some of these questions that I have. Um, why, given the staunchly nationalist environment of Reza Shah's reign, did so many of the leading architects, the pioneers of the Iranian avant-garde movement, like Gevrekyan, came from Iran's religious minorities? Or rather, how come so many young professionals from Christian, Baha'i, Jewish, and Zoroastrian communities chose the field of architecture as their careers and succeeded in designing so much of Iran's modern built environment? I would like to propose here that Reza Shah's push for modernization created an inadvertent affirmative action organism, which Professor Sanasarian doesn't buy um, my argument. Uh, I'm not sure if I buy my argument, but just hang in there. <laughs> <laughs> from within which professional architects from the margins of various minorities, side, side by side, Muslim Iranians rose to the challenge of building the secular nation. In terms of architecture, the early Pahlavi nationalization project was both a top-down commitment to a secular process that was in its bi in big part about the image of modernity as such, and therefore could but embrace its own margins. And at the same time, a bottom-up um, confidence and participation in the state nation building project by its minorities being religious, ethnic, or gender. In trying to answer this, these questions, I would like to piece together three interlocked historical inconsistencies. First, the apolitical claims of the modern movement in architectural culture between 1920s and World War II, despite its overwhelming dependence on, on political leaders. Two, Reza Shah's uh, affirmative action policies between 1922 and 41, despite Iran's adamant commitment to Persian ethno-nationalism. And three, Mar um, marginals as pioneers of modernity throughout the Pahlavi era, despite the homogenizing processes of nationalism. These three seeming uh, inconsistencies overlap and cross-pollinate in specific ways within the specific context of Pahlavi Iran that reveals the conditions that created the unique historical moment in which modernist architect, especially from minorities, um, uh, emerged as the advocates of modernization. Nasseruddin Shah's ambivalent attitude towards modernization both fueled political instability and laid the institutional structures upon which Pahlavi modernity would expand, including, of course, the Constitutional Revolution. In the 1930s, the agendas of the top down and the bottom up were aligned. Minorities and missionary primary schools from the 1980s on, the archaeological negotiations of the 1990s that handed excavation rights to the French, the 1935 establishment of Tehran University, the construction boom of the interwar period of the Reza Shah, uh, Mohammed Reza Shah and Reza Shah uh, period, um, the Pahlavi aspiration for a bourgeois culture, 
and uh, m um, endless demands for professional architects by sta state bureaucracy and major industry created a unique historical condition conducive to the expansion of, the mo of modernism in Iran. The professional Iranian uh, architect who emerged as a protagonist was the first to benefit from and shape this uh, moment. So it's very important that I've left out of this paper the evolution of minority and missionary schools. And so the architects that I'm going to talk about, all of them were first educated in these schools that were actually mixed. They were, they had, um, um, initially they weren't mixed, but then after, at, I think, 1932, uh, they, they were mixed because Reza Shah said that all schools are, are um, national schools. Um, uh, so it's very important. They're coming out of these schools, um, and all of these schools, because of their patronage, for example, this building was, uh, was uh, financed by the Parsis in Bombay. Uh, had an architectural component to them. So it wasn't just an, a secular education that were, they were getting, but also, um, an, also an aesthetic cultural education they were getting. Um, and this is another example of these sort of uh, minority schools also having an, an architectural agenda in mind. Um, when in 1933 Gevrakian arrived in Tehran, no other Iranian architect had contact with Europe's modern movement. He was the first and until 1935 the sole representative of the avant-garde in Iran. The reformist uh, ministers quickly uh, uh, enlisted him uh, in their efforts, where he took cha charge of the projects of the Tehran municipality. The mastermind of the 1928 civil code, Justice Minister Ali Akbar Dawar, was a staunch advocate of rapid economic growth. In his newspaper, Mad Azad, um, uh, he declared in 1923 that, quote, we have 6,000 years of history, but that will not translate into factories, railroads, hospitals, and schools. In 1935, he appointed Gevrekian as the head of the technical department of the finance ministry to guarantee the modernist look of all public architecture. Within four short but decisive years, Gevrekian uh, erected two dozen structures on uh, international style principles. As of his arrival, he completed a model for the new state theater. The following year, he uh, proposed a multi-partite structure for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, lifted on concrete piloti, those are columns. The Ministry of Industry rose to seven story of horizontal openings. In the design of the 1937 Justice Ministry, an uneasy compromise between the architect's avant-garde tenants and a neoclassical aesthetic favored by the state began to emerge. Gevrekian willed the greatest freedom during the design of his upper middle class villas, as he had done in France and Austria. These were the spaces of experimentation commissioned by private clients who um, insisted on the image of their own modernity. The modern movement rematerialized in the suburb of northern Tehran with open plans, large minimalist openings, um, and the piloti. And uh, so um, then he, he um, in 1937, um, Gavrakian's departure, sudden departure, actually coincided with the suspicious suicide of Davar. Uh, he returned to um, uh, Europe and he left his projects, including the officer's club, to um, uh, his um, uh, colleague, uh, Vartan Hovanesian, known as Vartan. Um, and Vartan, uh, his background has, had prepared him well for the, um, his, his first project, the Girls' Art Academy, uh, for, um, because Hovanesian, um, he had finished school in, in Paris, and Allah had given him a job. 
Um, and this was the first girls' academy that he designed on, again, uh, a lot of modernist principles with these horizontal windows, uh, balconies that opened up uh, into classrooms. Um, um, and so it was very important that he had already an experience with uh, women's education because he had paid for his schooling by teaching in Armenian women's school. And these are some of the shots. And uh, just like Le Corbusier, he published his own seven plans, points of architecture. Um, and he trained a whole generation of architects. Uh, Reza Shah commissioned this, uh, the Dadband Hotel, which was very important for Iranian tourism. Um, and he designed apartment buildings um, and a lot of cinemas. Some of you might have um, gone on your first date in here. Um, um, so as the protagonist of the modern middle class, these architects often found themselves in the precarious position between a heavy-handed government with which they often shared ideology and method of implementation and their own avant-garde uh, spirit to practice without uh, authoritarian um, interference. Um, like Siam and the Bauhaus, they constantly reinforced the notion that they had nothing to do with politics. In the, first, uh, in the very first edition of the architect, um, um, uh, Moshiri de declared that the journal is purely a tec technical and aesthetic publication which cannot and does not have anything to do with the world of politics. Um, and um, uh, Hovanesian was particularly, um, um, this, is, uh, this is the journal, uh, which had a number of, um, and Hovanesian was particularly uh, against the uh, Persian revival. Uh, so the Sapke Meli, uh, he poked fun of uh, all these great uh, uh, architects who came before him. Uh, Markov and Tarizadeh, uh, um, uh, um, Tarizadeh, and uh, he claimed that the National Bank, a very famous uh, building in the neo achaemenid style, was just an attempt to turn Tehran into a zoo. <laughs> so being a religious minority in the uh, matrix of an an advertent affirmative action nation was to have found oneself in a historical position that enabled the turning of marginality into a privilege. To be able to separate one, oneself from their own traditionalist communities and through official channels to be tossed into the international world of modernist architecture. By removing one from one's local identity politics, these young architects to be partook in the modern movements universal A politics. A secular primary and secondary education at home had shaped their bilingual and worldly outlook uh, led and led them to Europe and back. At home, they had found um, a, a lot of very positive uh, environment for this, their prosperity. Um, and in post-war Iran, there were huge demand for them once they came back. Uh, the, just to uh, just the, uh, the oil company uh, was one of them. Um, the Shahs um, uh, um, um, organizations, uh, both official and non-official organizations, were uh, very important. And not to mention the late Muhammad Reza Shah's sort of uh, utopian project, mega project that all of these uh, architects were enlisted in. Um, so many of them were many influential uh, figures. Come, came from these, um, Hu Shang Sehun was the dean of the fi fine arts faculty, was a Baha'i. Um, uh, Gregorian and al Khas were Armenian and um, uh, Assyrian. They were both uh, pioneers of the modern movement. Uh, Eugene Aftandilian designed the Rudaki. Um, uh, uh, Oshana designed a, about 12 um, vill villas in the modernist principles. Um, Boskanyan designed the Ararat Stadium, and um, of course, Amanat designed the uh, uh, Shahiyat. Um, and at the end, this is a story to be continued uh, in May, uh, of course, Farah was an architect. 
uh, and she became their patron. Um, and this is, uh, um, uh, uh, again, I'll talk about her uh, in May, uh, Veronique um, Saginian was on top of her class when she graduated. Um, and this is a remarkable photograph because she is sitting there at IIT, Illinois Institute of Technology, the, uh, um, the heart of uh, modernist architecture in the uh, United States. And of course, this is Mies, Mies van der Rohe. They're sitting next to each other, um, sort of uh, from the margins of modernity um, to the center of European um, uh, architecture. Um, uh, and uh, she's completely, it's completely apolitical. Um, all right, thank you. Thank you, Tony. Our next speaker is coming to us via Skype. She is, where is Claudia? Oh, can yes. I, can I start, do you want to her now or after you come with introduction? Uh, yeah, I can wait. Okay. I could just see her here. Sure. Um, Claudia Yagubi is a Roshan Institute Assistant Professor in Persian Studies at the Department of Asian Studies at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. She's the author of <laughs> Subjectivity in Attar, Persian Sufism and European Mysticism that was published by Purdue University Press in 2017. Some of her recent public, more recent publications include Pirzad's Diasporic Transnational Subjects in a Day Before Easter, published by International Journal of Persian Literature in 2018, and Mapping out sociocultural decadence on the female body, Sadiq Chubak's Gohar in Sangye Sabur, published by Frontier, a journal of women's studies in 2018. Please join me in welcoming Claudia. Um, so thank you, Tony, for the um, Dr. Daria E. for inviting me and for making this Skype presentation possible. And I want to add that um, just like Talin, who's been a student of uh, Professor Sanasarian, I have been a student of um, Dr. Rahimia for a decade now. So um, it's an honor to be here with everybody today. Um, I'll be talking about Zoya Pirzad's works. In an interview with Courier International, when asked about her Armenian heritage and how she combines the Armenian and Iranian cultures, Zoya Pirzad expressed the complexities of a hybrid identity, discussing her mother's conversion to Islam and her own experience of being bullied at school due to a to not having IAN at the end of her last name. Pirzad recognizes that if Armenians were not sensitive about their culture and language, they would not have a community today. As a product of this somewhat diverse background, Pirzad draws on her mother's and her own experiences to create hybrid characters, exploring the conflicts and contradictions of an identity that incorporates dislocation and attempted assimilation. Pirzad's narrative highlights the construction of her Iranian-Armenian character's identity as the other through their relations with the Iranian Muslim community. Both diaspora and transnationalism, which I have in my title and I'm still working with and I grapple with the idea of this, or and I have to decide whether to use it or not. Both these terms deal with homeland ties and assimilation of people living in host nations. Hence, alongside diaspora, I explore Pirzad's narrative from a transnational perspective. This will provide insight into today's Iranian Armenians' multiplicity of identity and forms of existence, too. Bringing the character's diasporic consciousness to light, Pirzad's narrative provides an examination of Iranian-Armenian identity reflective of the cultural clashes that are an inevitable consequence of such an interweaving of cultures, 
and histories across religious and ethnic divisions. I examined the transformation of, our, uh, of Armenian identity from a diasporic to a transnational one, encompassing a diverse identity through several generations. Finally, Pirzad's own hybrid identity and the ways she negotiates it through her work manifests an anxiety to maintain an Armenian identity while the reality of Iranian-Armenian culture necessitates many flows and exchanges. Pirzad's characters nullify what Stuart Hall calls having a unified and coherent identity. According to Hall, quote, the fully unified, completed, secure, and co coherent identity is a fantasy. Instead, as the system of meanings and cultural representations multiply, we are confronted by a bewildering, fleeting multiplicity of possible identities, any one of which we could identify with, at least temporarily, end quote. Cultural identity was once defined in terms of Quote, one shared culture, a sort of collective one true self, hiding inside the many other, more superficial and artificially imposed selves, which people with a shared history and ancestry held in common, end quote. This definition, however, created a thematic refrain for cultural identity. It considered the subject as a non-autonomous being whose identity was fixed and unified. This constraining definition shifted through time. The subject who was intended to be a stable identity was slowly being viewed as fragmented to, due to contradictory and unresolved aspects of their identity. In Hall's words, this new postmodern subject had no permanent identity and was constantly being transformed in accord to cultural systems in their milieu. The postmodern subject is what Pirzot presents through her characters Clarice in Things We Left Onset and Edmund in A Day Before Easter. Constructing a sense of identity in Iran and suffering from feelings of displacement in an Iranian seaside town where the first Armenian immigrants settled coincides with the adolescent life of Edmund and his struggles with his identity. The story begins with Edmund telling us about his childhood home, which is located next door to the church and school. Pirzad's reference to the church and the school reflects the important role these two institutions play in the Armenian characters' lives as they strive to preserve their heritage and maintain their roots. The fact that the church and school had been built by the first Armenian immigrants who settled in this seaside town adds further significance. The Armenian school, where children learn about their history and heritage, is beautifully pictured in Edmund's recollections of stu students reciting morning Christian prayers before going to class and the annual composition about their responsibilities to their homeland. The significance of the church and religion is highlighted through the most important traditional um, and most important religious tradition, Easter, which is not only reflected in the title of Pirzad's story, but it also is the, that time of the year that recalls Edmund's annual reminiscences. Edmund goes to great lengths to show how important it was for his family to celebrate Easter in a conventional and time-honored time manner, that includes all the classic Armenian pastries, Fosca, Gata, and Nazu. In conjunction with the Easter celebrations, we always hear about Edmund's grandmother, who happens to be the most traditional female character in the story. Grandmother's presence, mirroring the presence of their Armenian roots, is even highlighted after her death through a wooden picture frame on the wall from which she gazes down as if nothing escapes her surveying gaze. The food prepared for dinner, rice, kuku, and smoked fish are mainstays of Persian Noruz dishes. While it might be a coincidence that both nations celebrate special occasions with similar food choices, this, this may also highlight the influence of these two cultures on one another at one point in their shared history. 
This detailed description set the scene for the rest of the no the rest of the story, which revolves around Edmund's longing to integrate and transgress boundaries, signaling the diasporic transnational subject's identity as a construct and one that is in progress. The belief that everyone should have knowledge and awareness about one's history is a dominant mindset of the entire community, introducing the various explicit and implicit ways it maintains its ties with the homeland. Pirzat's characters make considerable ideological efforts in order to conceive of their communities as a continuum of their homeland of Armenia. One important factor to take into consideration underscored within Pirzat's narrative is Armenian characters' annual demonstration and commemorations on the anniversary of the 1915 genocide and their lobbying of the Iranian government on behalf of their homeland for the official recognition of the genocide. In this way, while in diaspora and locally integrated in the social structure of Iran, Pirzad's characters are involved in an institutional network that symbolically engages their homeland. This em emotional connection to the homeland creates a dilemma for the characters who struggle between glancing back and moving forward, which additionally casts doubts on sustaining their individual identities. Pirzad's characters consciously maintain collective identity and find solace in their common origin, historical experience, and geographical place. Things We Left Unsaid is also peppered with various Armenian literary, religious, and historical texts. Regarding history, there are, of course, conversations about the 1915 Armenian genocide and the memorial ceremony at the school. In regards to religious texts, the novel is filled with religious words, prayer, phrases, and prayers, or references to the Bible, Jesus Christ, and the Virgin Mary. After her secret desire for an affair with Emil, Clarice goes to church, prays, and reads from the Bible. While going to church brings peace to Clarice, and she begins to see Abadan as a beautiful city, it also intensifies her inner strife. In her dream, she sees a magisterial priest who commands her to unravel the secret and mystery of her existence. In terms of peppering her discursive narrative with literature, in her interaction with children, Clarice reads Hovanes Tumanyan's poem Parvana to them. The references to Tumanyan, Sayad Nova, and Sardo, with their emphasis on the importance of love, highlight Clarice's struggles in choosing between love and duty. All the while, the fusion of various languages texts, words, and proverbs in the narrative style of the novel mark the hybridity of the characters and Pirzad herself and their struggles with upholding their Armenian identity while also leaning toward a change. By the end of the narratives, both Edmund and Clarice, who struggle with their own understanding of their identity, reconfigure their attitude to their homeland by incorporating a new set of ideas and practices embedded in acceptance of multiplicity. For instance, in the last final part of A Day Before Easter, the present and the past are interlocked, and through his recollections of the past, Edmund reaches an inner peace in the present. His incapacity to bridge the divides of language, religion, religion, and ethnicity comes to an end within the final moments of the story. In the end, Edmund's newly acquired flexibility is mimicked in his letter to his daughter, Alenouj, who's married Behzad, a Muslim man. Edmund writes the letter the day after Easter on a piece of white paper in green ink and he begins the letter with Dearest Nunush. 
Edmund's letter using the short form of Alenusha's name as a term of endearment echoes his reconciliation with her. Writing the letter, Edmund uses grinning, which earlier in this story signified his desire and his mother's desire to be different. His choice of green ink is indicative of his acceptance of Alenusha's differences. After Alenusha's marriage to Behzad and their immigration to a foreign country, Edmund and his wife Martha had been ostracized by the Armenian community. But Edmund had become used to it, even though he could not forgive Alenush because he blamed her for Martha's death, something that was not overtly expressed but was felt. After writing the letter, Edmund finally moves out of his own bewildering sense of not be belonging. Here's how the narrative ends with Edmund coming to terms with his own identity. At the outset of things we left unsaid, Theresa's cognitive representation of the self is impacted by the shared social category of the group to which she belongs, that is, the Armenians. The sense of belonging to the Armenians does not allow her to separate her individual self from the collective one. The inability to separate oneself from the collective is what John Turner calls depersonalization of self-representation. This makes Clarice perceive herself as an interchangeable exemplar of the group rather than a unique personality. For Clarice, this occurs in a comparative context between in-group Armenian members such as her mother, her sister Alice, and her friend Nina, and out-group Iranian Shia Muslims such as Mrs. Nurullahi. However, the truth is that the relationship between in-groups and out-groups is interdependent and cannot be defined in isolation from one another. Hence, by the end of the novel, to a certain extent, Clarice breaks away from her Armenian community and the ways it has shaped her identity and reconstructs her subjectivity within the framework of an interaction with the Muslim community. This partial split from her shared culture with the common Armenian identity results in the possibility of reconstructing a new non-unified in and incoherent subjectivity. Clarissa's perception of herself begins to change midway through the novel. Her true self begins to seek a way out, to emerge from behind the masks and occasion pers personas. This desire for freedom is exemplified in the amphitheater scene when um, she's looking at the bulletin board um, and notices the woman and freedom talk by Mrs. Nurolahi and decides to attend. By positing a parallel look at the different lifestyles of Clarice and Mrs. Nurolahi, Pirzad introduces a force of change for Clarice's subjectivity. This agent of change, however, is a member of the Iranian Muslim community. Hence, for a long time, Clarice feels conflicted about accepting it. Immediately after reading the announcement of Mrs. Nurolahi's talk, Clarice recalls the last time she had a conversation with her husband Ardouche and their family friends Garnik and Nina about getting involved in Iran's sociopolitical activism. The varying responses of Garnik, Ardouche and Nina to the matter of women's rights and voting issues are emblematic of the different responses to Armenian acculturation in Iranian culture. When Clarice asks Mrs. Nurullahi why she attended the Armenian genocide commemoration, she responds, quote, a tragedy is a tragedy. It's not a Muslim or Armenian thing, end quote. As a result of her exposure to Mrs. Nurullahi, we begin to see a gradual identity shift in Clarice's character. When she goes to Mrs. Nurullahi's lecture on women's rights, she questions questions herself about the extent to which minority populations should get involved in the matters of the society at large. Contradictions and doubts occur when issues of national scale arise. Mrs. Nurolahi tells Clarice, 
quote, I wanted to ask if you would be so kind as to attend the next meeting of our society. The Armenian ladies have not been inclined to join in with us. I know that you have your own society, a very active one. But as you know, the Majlis elections are coming up. And as you are also no doubt aware, because of the suffrage issue, the coming year will be an important one for Iranian women, end quote. This invitation comes as Clarice feels shame for her estrangement from the society at large. Clarice is not pleased with her ethnically exclusive surroundings and its consequential constraints. She was not aware of the Majlis elections and had only heard about the women's rights, women's voting rights. She reproaches herself saying, quote, you and most other Armenian women act like you're not living in this country, end quote. Fighting for those rights helps Clarice not only to not only regain her sovereignty as a woman, but also to craft the self which is able to integrate both of her identities simultaneously. Edmund and Clarice are examples of Armenian diasporic transnationals who are Iranian citizens while they engage with their homeland of Armenia. This engagement, however, does not translate into a loss of individual subjectivity for them. In her narrative, not only does Pirzad explore being Iranian-Armenian as a construct and examines the roles played by hybridity, she also cha challenges this construct. Pirzad is a world in which Armenian and Iranian cultures coexist and intermingle, yet are not homogeneous. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Our last speaker for the panel is James Barry, who is a research fellow at the Alfred Deakin Institute at Deakin University, Melbourne, Australia. His research focuses on the intersections of ethnic and religious identities in Iran and diaspora homeland relations with a specific interest in Armenians. His book, Armenian Christians in Iran, Ethnicity, Religion, and Identity in the Islamic Republic was recently published through Cambridge University Press. James's research has also been published in Ethnic and Racial Studies, Third World Quarterly, and Iranian Studies. James is currently working with the Chair of Islamic Studies at Deakin University, performing research on Turkish minority communities in Australia, including Turkish Armenians. In addition, he is pursuing his research interests on the perception of Iranian national identity among um, ethnic and religious minorities. The title of his presentation is Iranian Armenian Perceptions of Proximity and Distance. Please join me in welcoming James. Thank you very much. Um, I have to start with an apology. I'm very badly jet lagged, uh, so if I seem a little bit all over the place, that's that's mostly the reason. Um, I also have to apologise. I have an Australian accent, and I understand that sometimes <laughs> I speak too fast. So if I if you can't understand me, just wave your arms up in the air, and I'll I'll slow down. Um, <laughs> there we go. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Berberian, uh, Professor Dalioyi, and Professor Aslanyan for inviting me along today. Um, I'd also like to thank. Uh, I would also like to say uh, how happy I am that uh, Professor Sanasadian is here because I feel in many ways uh, that my research has, has grown out of hers tremendously and of course with her help. Um, I, I can relate to a lot of the things that she was talking about with regard to doing field work in Iran and how the fact that it never really ends. Like I, I did an interview on uh, Persian radio in, in Australia and when it was shared on Facebook, some of the comments that were coming up from Iranians based in Australia, things like, Dr. James, Sedaya Akhundost, you know, James is the voice of the mullahs, that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it seems to be never ending. Uh, so, today I'm going to be talking about, we're building on uh, Dr. Yagubi's talk, really, uh, the issue of uh, intermarriage in Iran. It's part of a, a wider study on perceptions of the closeness of Armenians and Iranians or the distance between them where the boundary lies, which 
really also builds on some of the earlier presentations about you know, what is the boundary of Iran um, and where does, where does Armenia begin or is it part of it and so on and so forth. But in the contemporary understanding of Armenian identity and Iranian identity is, uh, as these abstract ideas which are somehow um, in silos but the, there are lots of connections as well. But with, in the terms of intermarriage, um, the taboo around intermarriage and the fact that it's um, uh, intermarriage often leads to the person, the Armenian, who, who marries a non-Armenian being uh, cast out of the community uh, to some extent, sometimes to a large extent. Um, now, uh, anecdotally, uh, of course, this is not necessarily something that's specific to Iranian Armenians, but I know in my own experience, I, um, I was married once, and uh, I remember once in Tehran uh, being asked by a guy who was part of the Tashnak Sagan, uh, if I was married to an Armenian, and I said no, and his response was uh, good because non-Armenians shouldn't marry Armenians. So I was like, "You're welcome." But um, <laughs> anyway, uh, so in in literature that's around intermarriage, some of it is uh, is generally quite positive. The idea that intermarriage brings communities together, though, uh, in anthropology and sociology studies, particularly those on uh, Armenians in Iran, it seems to be that's actually quite the um, the opposite. And in particular, one, one, one quote I got, and this is not exactly from a, a great source, but I just thought it's archetypal of this idea. Uh, Mixed marriages can be reconsidered as a way of peaceful coexistence among different social groups in an area that has been troubled by interfaith and interethnic conflicts on many occasions throughout the ages. So the idea that where this conflict, people are brought together. But of course, the, um, the reality is, is, is largely different. Today, I'm just going to talk about um, the work, uh, work that's been done in Tehran and published recently um, by a sco by a scholar, a master's student actually, an Iranian Armenian, and Ellen Ismaili. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build some of my discussions around her work um, because it was published in uh, Hoist magazine, which is a, a bilingual, I don't know if it still exists, but it was a bilingual uh, magazine published in Tehran, um, I think a monthly magazine. And it caused a great stir. The, the editor, Robert Safarian, got a lot of hate mail because he published it in Persian. And the feeling amongst, he said, the people who were sending him letters was that he was airing the community's dirty laundry to a Persian-speaking audience. And that it would have been fine if he just published these interviews in Armenian. But the fact that he published them in Persian was a problem. But they do tell us uh, a number of interesting things about uh, identity, um, particularly the identity of children of mixed marriages, which... I mean, as should be expected, you expect the unexpected. The, their views on identity are, um, are not so uh, easily defined um, and contradictory amongst themselves, like, like all of us. Now, intermarriage is a highly taboo subject. Uh, uh, Robert Safarian, in his introduction to these interviews, he actually said the dominant approach amongst Armenians is to deny it or ignore it. Um, it it's, quite, it's, it's not that rare. Uh, I've met a number of people who were... Uh, who had married non-Armenians in Iran, and they have had uh, quite negative experiences. But also, um, yeah, it's it's the impression that you get from some community leaders is that it never happens. But the reality is very different. Now, it's of course because Iran is an Islamic republic. Uh, its marriage is governed by religious <coughs> authorities. Um, now, this isn't uh, anything new. That was the case before the revolution. But um, it's uh, it, it, the Armenian Church has. Uh, decides on all issues relating to marriage um, and, uh, and divorce and inheritance through its own courts and judicial, judicial systems. Uh, the church's opinion is important to the issue of intermarriage. Uh, the previous archbishop, um, who Professor Sanasarian mentioned, Ardak Manokian, has stated that intermarriage is impossible. If they want to marry, one of them shall convert, and we do not con accept conversion in our religion. And this comes, <laughs> this comes to a very important theme, which is... Uh, when there is any, any intermarriage in Iran, that the Armenian who marries a non-Armenian has to adopt Islam. Now, it doesn't have to be direct. If, uh, if it's a female marrying a male, uh, an Armenian woman, she doesn't actually have to formally convert because in the eyes of Iranian law, she's, more, she's subservient to her husband. So she, it's as good as converting. But the, um, the men have to convert. And this is one of the issues that actually, in the, uh, when the interviews were published, uh, the editor 
had a long explanation of this to try and make it clear that conversion was an important part of it. But it's interesting that he qualified, Robert Safad Yan, I'm not sure if anyone has ever come across him, but um, he's, he's very much critical of the uh, community's leadership in, in many ways. He'd be called a two day here, I think, um, for his attitude, or a leftist. Um, but uh, he also qualified it by saying, well, the interviews showed that the Iranian families, meaning the Muslim families, were much more accepting of the Armenian spouse than the Armenian families were of the, uh, of the um, Iranian Muslim spouse. Um, so he's sort of saying, yeah, while the law is like this, uh, the cultural attitudes are, 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 also, are not correlating. Um, actually, in the interviews itself, that's not necessarily the case. There, there are, are lots of family problems from the Muslim side of the families as well. But um, it's a point that he, he, uh, he thought was very relevant. Um, it's a common theme in uh, Iranian... It's, it's becoming a common theme in Iranian literature. We were talking before about Zoya Pirzad and um, her book Yekruz Monde, uh, Monde Be Eda Park, which uh, has three sort of... three basic stories stru structuring it, which all centre on the issue of not just intermarriage, but relations with, uh, with Muslims or non-Armenians that are transgressive or could be seen to tran as transgressive. Um, Theoretically speaking, I mean, it, we're talking a lot about ethnic boundaries and the creation of ethnic boundaries, and we can go back to Frederick Barth if we so wish. Um, and, but one of the points that Barth makes in his 1969 introduction to his book on the topic uh, is that some identities can be adopted and others can't. Some can be lost and others are not necessarily lost. So he gives the example of Pathans or Pashtuns. Uh, and Baluch. A, a Baluch can become a Pathan, sorry, the other way around. A Pathan can become a Baluch, but not the other way around. Um, and this is something that comes out with the discussion of Armenians and Iranians. An Armenian can become an Iranian, um, but an Iranian can't become an Armenian when upon marriage. Now, that's a perfect system, and the reality is very different. And as you see amongst even people in Iran whose ancestors converted from Judaism or Christianity, often they have the name Musalman as part of their surname. So there's even several generations later, there's sort of this acknowledgement that they've, they've come from a minority community. community. So it's not necessarily that uh, yeah, you automatically become an Iranian or a Muslim. Uh, this, this stays um, with people for a long time. And it's not limited, of course, to Iran. Um, the Israeli author, the Iraqi-born Israeli author, Shimon Balas, wrote a, a novel about um, a, a Jewish Iraqi who converted to Islam and the whole issue about how he was never fully accepted. He was welcomed, but never fully accepted uh, as an Iraqi Muslim. Um, so to, to move on, I'll, I'll talk a bit about the, uh, the interviews themselves. Now, there are three main uh, themes that come out of intermarriage with, the, with regard to these interviews. The first is family, the family acceptance, uh, or the lack thereof. The second is the attitude of the Armenian community towards intermarriage. And the third is the, uh, the, the children of these, in, of these um, the most fascinating part, I think, is the children of these relationships and how they relate to their Armenian identity and the Iranian identity. Uh, they specifically, they say, well, we're technically Iranian, we're, we're more Iranian than we are Armenian, but then they start talking about how much they speak the language, how much they enjoy the, the culture. Uh, so it's, it's an interesting contradiction. So family, of course, uh, in all of the interviews, that, uh, and this is also the cases that I've come across of intermarriage, the family have usually not accepted it. And you have uh, cases, uh, one, of the, one of the interviews that uh, Dr Ismaili has done uh, looks at um, a woman who actually hid her marriage for four years. So she was living with her grandfather at night time and then seeing her husband in the evening, then going home to her grandfather at the night time. It took four years before she admitted to her family, at which point um, her father, she said, was quite... Uh, open, or not, not open, but he was more accepting, whereas um, the mother uh, attempted suicide as a result. Mm. And the, uh, the family eventually left Iran, and she felt that it was because of this, because of her intermarriage, the shame that was involved. Um, another, another man, he had a complete separation from his family. His mother wouldn't even talk to him. Uh, he would have to call beforehand if he was going to visit and it wouldn't always be the case. The mother refused to meet the grandson, and this is quite, um, quite common in all of the stories, that, uh, all of the, um, the interviews that have been done. Uh, but also it had a negative effect, of course, on the marriages of these uh, couples because uh, in one case, uh, a man who, uh, who never really had any interest in Armenian culture 
but um, and also was very contrary, and he didn't really like the restrictions that the Armenian community in Tehran had. Uh, once he uh, once he ma in, he married a non-Armenian, he suddenly became very fascinated in his culture and very involved in it, and this had a negative effect on his uh, his relationship because. He was trying to drag, even though he couldn't take his grandson to visit his own family, he was trying to keep the grandson away from the Iranian family so he didn't become too Iranian. So the psychological effect of, um, of these intermarriages is uh, it, the circumstances, um, yeah, uh, they're quite telling. Um, now, the, the second aspect is the community. The community itself, I mean the community, uh, just generally people, not necessarily institutions, though that, that plays a part in it. Uh, they and the church, of course, um, but community members and their tendency to shun members for various reasons. Because it's a small community as well, in relative terms, it's, um, it's much more uh, effective, it's a much more uh, effective way of, of treating, with, treating people who are seen to have transgressed. Uh, one of the examples, the man, um, he was still part of an Armenian cultural group, but the Alec newspaper refused to publish any events with Alec is the main Armenian newspaper, a Tashnag paper in, uh, in Tehran, re refused to publish any events that they were holding, this artistic group was holding, if this man's name was on those events as a contact on a mobile phone or anything. So uh, that was, um, you know, that's the extent that it would that the, the taboo would go to. It's very difficult to enrol uh, the children in schools. This is the interesting thing. All of the people interviewed decided they wanted to send their children to Armenian schools. Uh, so, I mean, it shouldn't be that interesting, I guess, because that's their background. But uh, they had, of course, a lot of difficulties in terms of the schools would say, look, um, they're not Armenian. Your child is not Armenian. Some schools were more, the principals were more liberal, and they said, yeah, of course, you can enrol them. But in most cases, their local school wouldn't accept the child. Um, and of course the children would undergo, would be, would be bullied. Uh, in, in one case, uh, because his mother was Iranian, or Muslim Iranian, uh, the insults were directed at his mother, and that's particularly, not, well, it's, it's not a polite thing to do in any society, but of course in Iran it's a very aggressive thing to, um, to be constantly attacking, or to attack someone's mother. Um, the uh, same with, with basketball teams and football teams not accepting them. Uh, the children of intermarriages. Uh, the, um, and, yeah, so... And finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about the, uh, the children of these relationships. So they all, quite, they all have quite strong... Uh, on one hand, they say that they're more Iranian than, than anything else. One of them says, I'm 70% Iranian and maybe 30% um, Armenian. Another said, uh, I'm 90%. But all of these children speak Armenian quite well. Often, some of the things that they say, I would actually wonder if they're more advanced. Thank you. Um, for instance, with literacy, they all talked about their literacy in Armenian, which for those who know Tehran today amongst Armenians, um, literacy, of course, in Armenian is, you, you, they learn it at school, but at the same time, the confidence that most people have growing up in Iran in writing in, in Armenian letters is not very much. They prefer to write in Persian letters. That's why you get a case that, you know, when someone goes out and they leave a letter to their, a note to their mother, I've gone out, they'll write it in Persian rather than Armenian, even if they were in person, they would say it in Armenian and not in Persian. Um, so these children often speak Armenian quite well, or they, uh, they speak it well, and they also can read and write. Um, but they are affected by the fact that their families, the Armenian side of the family, didn't really claim any uh, connection to them. So they have a feeling that they're rejected by the community. Um, however, you do see... Uh, some interesting, uh, some, and some interesting habits come out of this. Uh, one one uh, child of a, an intermarriage said, I, "I love the Armenians very much, and over the years I've encountered, I haven't encountered any problems with them. However, if I don't know who they are, I won't reveal my identity or the issue of the marriage of my mother and the father. Just on, uh, even though no bad experience, just on instinct, not um, not revealing their background. Uh, on identity, I depended." Uh, um, yeah, my, so my social environment, I consider myself to be 90% non-Armenian. But um, and also parents also hid their identity when talking, about, uh, um, when, when talking to other people about their background. If, for instance, if one woman was talking about when she spoke to uh, other Armenians, she'd never reveal that her husband was a, a Muslim, even if she felt they were quite open-minded. Um, anyway, uh, that's, I'll, I'll leave it there, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. So thank you very much. Could I ask 
um, all of our speakers to please come. And we will entertain some questions, though we have to, um, I understand we have to end promptly at 5.30, right, uh, Huri? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, I have uh, two short questions. One for uh, uh, Dr. Bebeyan and one for Dr. Lord. Uh, first question is, um, I think, and I understand it was for the purposes of the brief uh, presentation, um, that you referred to like Armenia's understanding of socialism, but more uh, precisely, what do we know? Are they or any of these, have they produced a like, serious text that they left behind that shows a serious engagement or understanding of what socialism might be meant at that point? And I'm not thinking on their meaning because we don't have that for the either at that time. The best we have is that we did, and it be, I guess, both of our sides being an uh, And uh, for uh, Professor Gregor, I, if I'm not mistaken, we were referring several times to these architects as non-political. They didn't claim they were non-political. But from the overall tenor of your presentation, it seemed like you wouldn't find that that wasn't the case. They were in some way. But is, is that correct? And by the way, they positioned themselves in this the project of authoritarian modernization of the Shah Iraq. The works of architecture appear to be the physical embodiment of, of that idea, which was not political at all. So, can you want to clarify that? Okay. Yeah. So, maybe we can start with you, Maria, and then we'll Well, I, I guess we'll have the uh, Iranians beat on this one. Uh, <laughs> there are many, many articles in the contemporary uh, press. Uh, about socialism in the Armenian press, whether it's uh, Armenian Revolutionary Federation, Social Democratic Hanchakyan Party, Independent Social Democrats, Socialist Revolutionaries, you have, it runs the gamut. In addition, we also have books and pamphlets that are written about socialism, not just the history of socialism, but what they believe uh, it should be happening in terms of a socialist state. Um, and this is something to plug my book I discuss in my upcoming book. Yeah. But we'll all brush out my copies. <laughs> um, yes, you're, that's exactly what I'm arguing, that uh, it is deeply political, um, not only in Iran, but the modern movement uh, as an architectural movement was deeply political, except that it disguised itself as apolitical, and that was what was reproduced. And um, I'm trying to find, and actually one could, this panel is a very interesting in the sense that we could look at this relationship of minorities to the state on the long durée, from, from mm -hmm. your revolutionaries to my architects who want to be, I mean, to be an engineer was in the 50s, 40s, 50s, 60s, it was to be building the nation. So it was deeply political, but it was also sort of not political or pretending not to be political. Mm -hmm. So maybe, you know, they try to be very political and then they're like, okay, that's not working. Let's try something else. And to, to today where, you know, you're deeply caught up into this um, the sort of the secular model is not working anymore. Now it's the religious um, state that is dictating these identity relations. Um, so I, I think on the long, if we look at it uh, mm -hmm. in terms of the entire century, um, we see patterns uh, and shifts that are very interesting. Yeah, thank you. Rudy? I have two questions for Uri. Can I call you Uri? Mm. Um, Excuse me, sir? <laughs> <laughs> representation and representativeness. To what extent were the intellectuals that you talk about uh, representative of their community? Were they a bunch, small bunch of intellectuals engaged in the rarefied discourse that was shared by presumably small readership of the, the newspapers that you wrote for? Uh, 
or were they representative of a larger community? To, to what extent do you talk about that? Do so you have any ideas about that? That's my first question. The second one is, you have to me convincingly demonstrated that these people who wrote for these newspapers truly believed in their cause. They believed in socialism and in the compatibility of socialism with being the nation. Right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm asking you, is there also an element of defensiveness? I'm thinking about the Jews in the 1920s, 30s Germany, who argued along the same lines, trying to prove for themselves, and also truly believed that they were very good Germans. Right? But there was also an element of defensiveness, which was trying to allay the suspicion and the accusation of disloyalty in the fifth column. What's there an element of that in this particular? Uh, I'll start with the second, your second question. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, both in, especially in the Iranian and Ottoman case, as a religious minority, uh, and in a rising, in the Ottoman case, a rising Turkish uh, nationalism, uh, and a young Turk movement that in 1913 uh, becomes uh, much more conservative and extremist, but was, you know, there were elements of it even before then. Uh, definitely, and even in the Iranian Constitutional Revolution, not everybody was, uh, you know, harmonious coexistence kind of person, right? Not, there weren't these uh, pre-60s uh, hippies. Um, so there is, there is, uh, there are also uh, people who believe in, in sort of an exclusive nationalism who don't want Armenians, Jews, Baha'is in the Iranian case. Uh, to be part of this larger Iranian nation, because for them, Iranian is 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 very much tied with being Muslim. So, absolutely, in both in the, both the Ottoman and the Iranian case, there is a defensiveness, and then that defensiveness also, uh, I think, goes beyond that in the sense that they are defending themselves not only against uh, these sort of much more conservative ideas, but also they are defending themselves against people further on the left, uh, who accuse them of really being nationalists and pretending to be socialists. So on all sides, there's, uh, it's very obvious from the press how much um, uh, evidence gathering and convincing they're trying to do of themselves and, and of others. But yes, they, they do, as you said, absolutely believe what they are saying. It's not like, it's not a pretense. Um, as a po as uh, regarding the question about represented, how representative it is, um, it, first, it's in a sense, it's hard to tell uh, because we don't have subscription numbers. We do know that there are constant um, uh, demands uh, and appeals for more newspapers, for more uh, copies to be sent. So we do know that there is a demand. However, I think we're talking about when we talk about socialism, we're talking about uh, a small segment of, uh, of Armenians, uh, a little perhaps larger than the Iranians and definitely larger than in the Ottoman case for uh, Turkish Muslims. Um, but still, we're talking about a, 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 small, a small minority. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, please. I have two questions, one for Professor Sanasari and uh, you left us hanging. How did you resolve the situation going to Shiraz? Between the discussion between the two uh, uh, religious uh, leaders. Oh, I waited until I found the ticket by myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. And the other question for Barry is: Do you think the, the, the that that tension in in the mixed marriages is it mostly due to religion or just cultural or what? I don't know that well. Um. In my personal opinion, it's uh, it's to do more with the cultural thing in terms of um, the the whole concept of Haibachanum, preserving Armenianness, uh, that is really uh, is fostered by the education um, system, the Iran Armenian education system in Iran, not just in Iran but elsewhere. Uh, religion doesn't seem to have much to do with it because, and again, this is just in my observation, Iranian Armenians, from one perspective, don't tend to be particularly religious. Uh, but on another level, that doesn't mean that they would call themselves anything other than Christian. And I know uh, one friend of mine, he told me he was an atheist, and I, I said, would you go around saying that you're an atheist? And he said, no, and he said, from the community, they'd say you're no longer an Armenian if you call yourself an atheist. You can be an atheist, but just call yourself a Christian. That's all you need to do. Um, so 
that's but yeah, again, that's my, my, my take on it. Yes, please. Uh, from the marriage, from mixed marriages, uh, the acceptance of the marriage or the kids didn't matter if the uh, father was Armenian or mother was Armenian. You make a difference. Um, no, not, not as far as I can tell. It's, it's, the reaction is more or less the same. Uh, the, it seems to be that men, Armenian men, get more of a negative response from the woman's family than when a woman marries uh, an Iranian Muslim man. And often it's, a, it's not because that they're a Christian, but it's such things as their education levels don't correlate, their age difference is not, uh, is not appropriate or even just down to the fact that well, he's from an Armenian family, they're very closed, you know, our daughter is going to have problems uh, with the Armenian side of the family as a result of that. So, uh, but on, from the Armenian side, it's, it's, there doesn't seem to be any difference. It's a negative reaction in general. Other questions or comments? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's it's yeah. it's the, it's the, the identity itself, you know, yes. is being yes. bound around the language tied to language, uh, Armenian Christianity Armenian specifically. specifically. Yeah, and uh, and an idea of a shared genealogy, shared history. Um, but uh, I guess the way I speak, having coming from an having Irish parents and being raised in a very Catholic background, I, I always look to the Armenians and and think to myself. You know, you don't um, you don't actually take the religion as seriously as like no no seriously that's the wrong word for it. You don't take it to the same extent that other Christians do. So um, I guess that's where I'm coming from on that. Yeah. If I can add something, uh, James. The definition of culture oftentimes is religion, history, um, various practices, lifestyle, and all that. So I think that when you use culture, you're saying the larger. Factor yeah. beyond religion, which includes language and yeah, it's it's not being opposed to Islam yeah, per se. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Common history, sense of nationalism, yeah, ethnic sense nationalism. Yeah, yeah. 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 Can we let her finish? Yeah. And then I'll According to Polo. Exactly. Yeah. This yeah. is the overall. Yes, yes. Yes. I mean, my my point is is that uh, that dichotism or the struggle yes. is that. Different between Armenians and Persians versus Armenians and Greeks or Armenians and other Christian. Um, they there are intermarriages between Armenians and Assyrians in Iran. Um, I'm only just going to speak about the Armenian case, uh, but um, that's that doesn't seem to go off with too many problems because they're still classified as Christian. And the weird thing, or the, the interesting thing in Persian, I'm, I'm, I think this is also in other languages, Armani can is synonymous with Christian. So Assyri Assyrians get called Christian. Uh, a great deal. I, I even I, I've, I used to live um, near the British compound in Kolhak, and there's a cemetery there. And people say, "Oh, Armenians! You, there's an Armenian cemetery there," meaning the British soldiers' cemetery. None of them, none of whom are Armenian, but they're Christians. So um, that's uh, that means that, that those intermarriages are not so much of a problem. However, some of the organisations like Ararat, they tend to be quite strict, and I think it's not because they are chauvinistic in any sense. It's because of the nature of the idea of excluding non-Armenians from their clubs, but specifically Muslims from coming in because they consume alcohol sometimes and the rest of it. So I know of Assyrians who've been asked to leave, they're married to Armenians, who've been asked to leave Ararat because they're speaking in Persian because they, they weren't able to communicate in, um, in Armenian and people had to stand by and say, no, no, they're a Christian, it's not a problem. So um, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's how it works in Iran, it seems. Okay. Yeah. I could use May, may I make a comment about language? Yes, please. Um, I think that uh, it's less and less the case that Armenian language uh, is become is an identifying marker of being Armenian, especially in places like the United States. Um, well, their fear is different that multi compound identity, and in that case, language is not one of the. I approach is different theories. Yes, but it is true that <laughs> I think we can we see the same thing in fact happening for our Persian language classes. Even though we like to think that our identities are bound by, but 
future generations are far less interested in connecting themselves purely through language. Now, I'm speaking broadly about different things. But may I use my prerogatives as chair to ask Claudia a question, which is that you, you talked about, you began your presentation by talking about Pirzad's own situation. Um, so do you think that there has been, or do you, uh, have you read if there has been a backlash about the fact that Zoya Pirzad writes in Persian? Um, I, have, I have not read anything about that, but I have written myself about that. Uh, the fact that she uses the Persian language to talk about Armenian characters. But I have not read uh, about the backlash. Well, I, the reason I ask this is just I, this is really anecdotal, but an Armenian friend of mine here in Irvine told me that her sister's in law refused to buy copies of Pirzad's books because she is, after all, not a real Armenian and she puts the community to shame. That's, I, this is just one little <laughs> anecdote. But huh? Yes, please. Well, I, I would want to ask a follow up on that, which is very interesting because Armenians wouldn't do the same with Saroyan, right? It, as far as Armenia goes, Saroyan is considered an Armenian writer when a man didn't write a sentence in Armenian. Correct. But because he's Saroyan with the last name, he's all of a sudden an Armenian. When Perzat isn't, unless a person is told that she's Armenian, would instantly grab uh, to it, uh, she gets excluded from it. Mm -hmm. Which I guess adds to the, I think, to Professor uh, Nick Marriage's part two, when they asked if the husband is Armenian, uh, if the father is Armenian or the mother, which I, I have encountered the same with my own friends who are uh, of mixed marriages, when the father is Armenian and then the child gets the Armenian last name, we, we never tended to ask uh, or wonder. Uh, but when it's the other way, I have a friend whose father is Iranian and mother is Armenian, and the first thing is like, oh, you're Persian, and then they have to, I guess, clarify that they're not. But then when the, they get the last name in Armenian, all of a sudden, no questions are asked. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Yeah. 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 I have the problem of last names too, myself. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. I don't have the IAN, but I had Masihi at the end, uh, which yeah. then <laughs> that yeah. clarified you just, something. You just need two letters, A and N. Just go ahead and add it, Claudia. <laughs> yes, I please. Dro I dropped the Masihi. I don't know if I should do another change. <laughs> <laughs> please, go ahead. I have a question for Hadi. You referred to the architecture during the Reza uh, As far as I know, there were a lot of modern structure, architecture in Iran built during the pandemic by Germans, including mm -hmm. the ministries. Mm -hmm. And I suspect, given the graph that you showed, Minister of Justice and also finance ministries, and of course, the shop with a heavy price for that one because he was at the right But uh, in addition to that, some of the Minorities that you mentioned, uh, they were part of Freemasons. Mm -hmm. So, so Freemasonry was very powerful during the late Bajars, uh, of Shah, and also Muhammad Reza Shah. And therefore, don't you think that it is not because of their status as minorities, but rather their political influence that could get these huge projects as Freemasons? Um, you're you're right on um, uh, you're you're correct that Freemasonry was very important, and we know. Uh, I mean, the founder of Freemasonry uh, was a convert uh, from Armenian, um, and then the official Freemasonry was in 1906, 1905, or 1906 around or 1907. Um, and so, so Fururi's son, I showed you the picture. He was a very important architect. Mamad um, um, Ali Fururi was the founder, one of the founders of Freemasonry. Um, 
among the architects themselves, we don't know who was a Freemason, who wasn't. So I cannot com confirm that, yes, uh, Mohsen Furuki was a Freemason, and he was an architect, and he was building. Um, there certainly is a connection between Freemasonry, uh, the reform movement, and um, modern architecture. Um, what I'm trying to make a distinction here was that the avant-garde movement, the international style, which was a very specific way of approaching architecture, was different from the revival style, which was built by, I showed you, the bank was built by a German, uh, the um, foreign ministry was built by a German, the uh, museum was built by, by French. Um, uh, so you have a lot of foreigners, which we don't know if they were Freemasons, but they might have been, um, they were working along uh, the Rajar Memars. Um, and they were, but they were all building in this sort of neo achaemenid style. And so Gebrekian and Vartanian, and then later Furugi uh, and Zafar, and when they came back from Europe, they said, this is all nonsense, we need to build in international style. Um, and I can't tell you if they were Freemason. Probably they were, I mean, probably they were ideologically um, uh, uh, sort of Freemason or re sort of or path, but yeah. But um, we don't know if they were. If there are no more questions, perhaps we could end the panel now. Please join me in thanking all of our presenters. Uh, he's trained as a Byzantinist uh, and Central Eurasian history, so he, but he's more than this. He just gave me this to read. I should tell you, Professor Rapp uh, does, of course, work, uh, knows his Byzantine and uh, his Eurasian history uh, better than many people who deal with this period of history, let's say late antiquity, as he's given us lectures here on his sort of uh, world history approach to the Caucasus as well. Uh, I would suggest to anyone to read The Sasanian World Through Georgian Eyes, Caucasia, and the Iranian Commonwealth in Late Antique Georgian Literature, one of the best history books I have read, certainly in the past decade. And I go to it, it's like a reference book uh, among his other works on uh, the Caucasus. Uh, really an amazing scholar who I wish we could steal and bring to uh, uh, UC Irvine if he uh, thinks about it. Uh, and then uh, today he will talk about medieval Caucasia and the Byzantine turn, the fate of a Christianized Persianate society. Please. Thank you all. Uh, I congratulate you for your endurance. Um, I want to thank the organizers for the very kind invitation to be here, and also to Toraj in particular, who has kindly extended the time for my talk to three hours. <laughs> I'll speak quickly. Uh, but, but before I begin, uh, it's with a heavy heart, I, I just want to acknowledge some of the great losses that Caucasiology has faced this past year. And in particular, I'd like to dedicate this presentation to Robert Thompson, uh, to Tamila Magulibdishvili, a Georgian scholar who worked a lot in Armenian material, and to Robert Hewson. In the long twilight of late antiquity, political disaster enveloped the Caucasian isthmus. One by one, the Sasanian government dismantled the region's monarchies. The process launched already in 428 with Bahram Gur's removal of the Armenian Arshakunis, a branch of the Parthian Arsakids, and you've heard all about them today. More geographically distant, the acculturated Mihranids of eastern Georgia, who called themselves Hosroids, clutched to power for another 150 years. And in Albania, kingship likewise met its demise, though the circumstances remain murky. All three monarchies were located in the strategic Caucasus region. All three had robust Parthian dimensions, and all three had Christianized in the fourth century. 
Sasanian and then Arab intervention triggered a massive reshuffling of the Caucasian social order, but not to a wholesale change in the underlying social fabric. Eventually, royal power was reconstituted in medieval Armenia and Georgia by other families, most notably the Bagratids. It was Ashot I Bagratuni who resuscitated Armenian royal authority in 884-5. From their inception, the Bagratids had a strong Persianate dimension, a trait shared with elite houses across Caucasia. Early Bagratunis, Kornants of the Armenian Arshakunis, inhabited a Persianate social landscape punctuated by dynastic aristocratic houses. The illumination of this space owes much to the magisterial researches of Nicholas Adonz, Cyril Tomonov, and of course, Arnina Garsoyan. But we must remember that this social fabric stretched beyond the various Armenias. It was established by the Iron Age and blanketed the entire Caucasus Isthmus, from the Black to the Caspian Seas, enveloping both sedentary and pastoralist communities. Given Caucasia's condition as a durable cross-cultural zone, it is justified and I think essential to think of a pan-Caucasian society populated with individual but overlapping and mixed cultures. The pre-modern Armenian and Georgian experiences were distinctive, but they were also profoundly entwined and mixed. As a consequence, gaps in Armenian history can be filled by Georgian sources and vice versa an approach I shall deploy today. It is therefore significant for Caucasian and Armenian history that a band of Bagratids accrued power outside Armenia in Georgian lands that had eluded direct Arab control. In 888, Adarnase Bagratuniani restored royal power in Georgia. Just a little more than a century later, these Bagratids of the North forged the first durable political union of Georgian districts on either side of the Sarami Ridge. Thereafter, the Georgian Bagratids governed a pan-Caucasian kingdom that incorporated much of Caucasian Armenia. Meanwhile, in Caucasia's Far East, the Albanian realm and its distinctive language and culture were evaporating. By the 9th and 10th centuries, Albania was a shadow of its former self. Intensive Turkification radiated from the Muhan steppe, and other Albanians assimilated to Armenian culture, as is evident by the history of Albania written in Armenian by Moses Daskurantsi. Across Caucasia, newly empowered families took power in tumultuous conditions. These included the Artsrunis, the Bagratids, and the Orbelians. Not surprisingly, these new and renewed elites devoted considerable attention to their royal image, at the heart of which pulsed a steadfast commitment to Christianity. At the same time, these elites had a love-hate relationship with the Christian Roman Empire. In most cases, the trend was towards Caucasia's deeper integration within Eastern Christendom and the Byzantine Commonwealth while safeguarding political and religious autonomies. Thus, selective Byzantinization is evident in the Armenian and Georgian Bagratid kingdoms and their allied national churches, though this strategy was more enthusiastically embraced by Diophysite Georgians. This discerning and creative harmonization with Christian Byzantine culture in royal ideology, literature, art, architecture, and the like was especially fueled by the ongoing Islamic presence in Caucasia. Indeed, Christian Caucasians magnified their demarcation from the Dar al-Islam by reinforcing Christian identities punctuated with adapted Byzantine elements. This deliberate pan-Caucasian Byzantine turn, and I use the word turn quite cautiously, was by no means sharp or absolute, and it represented neither passive imitation nor comprehensive imperial imposition but rather creative and selective adaptation in an atmosphere of fluctuating imperial hegemonies. Significantly, the long-standing Persianate social structure and its attendant models of authority were not comprehensively replaced with Byzantine ones. In many respects, the undergirding Persianate structures were perpetuated, though adaptations of Byzantine and ecumenical Christian culture were increasingly grafted onto them. 
Across medieval times, the public expression of Persianate forms diminished. But this had more to do with the blossoming of Iranian culture in new Islamic frameworks, the evolving identification of Armenians and Georgians with Christianity, and Caucasian responses to Constantinople's unprecedented military interventions. In terms of sheer political, military, and economic power, the Bagratids anchored in Georgia achieved the family's greatest triumphs. At the apex of Georgian Bag Bagratid power, especially under Queen Tamar at the turn of the 12th and 13th centuries, the unified Georgian kingdom was transformed into a pan-Caucasian empire, reaching into northern Iran and eastern Anatolia, and comprising large swaths of Armenia and northern Caucasia. This achievement is habitually termed the Georgian Golden Age, but in fact, it was a cross-cultural pan-regional achievement. Non-Georgians, especially Armenians, were a vital cog in this moment of political, military, and economic prowess. The Armenian contribution is exemplified by two famous brothers, Ivane and Zakare Zakarian, who commanded remarkable autonomy in Armenian lands as they backed Queen Tamar. The unified Georgian kingdom and subsequent Caucasian empire had to come to terms with the fact that large areas of Caucasia, including much of Azerbaijan and the former Al Albania, remained under Islamic control that substantial Arab and growing Turkic populations existed within Georgia and Armenia and were sometimes mixed with Christians and adherents of other faiths, and that Caucasia's chief trading partners were Muslims. Whether Caucasia's Christian elites liked it or not, medieval Caucasia was also integrated into the Dar al-Islam. At the height of their Caucasian empire, the Christian Georgian Bagratids thus minted coins of Islamic types bearing Arabic inscriptions. Accommodation and mixture of such kinds are evident throughout medieval Caucasia and are evolutions of a long-standing cross-cultural arrangement. Perhaps the most tangible monument to this enduring cross-cultural condition is the Arturunis Church at Akhtamar, which creatively engages Caucasian, Iranian, Islamic, and Anatolian elements. But this, but this was no cross-cultural free-for-all. Akhtamar is distinctively Armenian. In terms of Bagratid royal imagery, we observe considerable deliberation. From their establishment in the late 11th century, the Bagratid imperial family and some of their aristocratic allies prioritized biblical and Christian names, including David, Tamar, Georgi, Dmitri, Ivane, and Zakaria. A bit earlier, however, names drawn from the Persianate world, Ashot, Adonase, Bagrat, Sumbat, were common among Armenian and Georgian Bagratids. And their family name, Bagrat, echoes the Middle Iranian Baidad, or given by God. These are reminders of the Armeno-Iranian provenance of the Bagratids at the daybreak of late antiquity. As it happens, the Onomastikon across late antique Caucasia had been heavily Iranian and Persianate. In Armenia, Judeo-Christian names are evident among early Bagratids only from the fourth century and especially thereafter. Now such Persianate names were not flimsy badges meant to impress Iranian, Arab, and Turkic overlords. Indeed, the durability of the Persianate onomasticon into the medieval era signals a broader pattern of Persianate and Iranian terms saturating the Armenian and Georgian languages, a condition having its origins in the later ancient era. Such terms overwhelmingly parallel and were borrowed from Middle Iranian languages and not New Persian. In the autumn of late antiquity, Bagratids in Armenia and then in Georgia wielded royal authority for the first time. Legitimacy was a chief concern. Byzantine models could be exploited, but there were other possibilities. The famous Armenian historian Moses Khoranatsi was not simply a talented antiquarian. He was also an advocate of the surging Bagratunis. So as to capitalize upon the family's claim of a special attachment to Christian monotheism, Khoranatsi conferred an ancient Jewish pedigree upon the Bagratunis. This declaration was intended for internal and external consumption. The Georgian branch of the family then pushed this Jewish claim to its logical conclusion 
by betraying itself as the direct biological offspring of the biblical King David. In turn, this Davidic marker was applied back to the Armenian Bagratids, as is evidenced in the pro-Bagratid history of Yohannes Yo Dras Chana Kertzi of the 10th century. Evolving assertions of an ancient and biblical Jewish ancestry were simultaneously intended to represent the Bagratids as a dramatic rupture with the Caucasian royal past. And all of this anticipated claims of Davidic descent that were that were deployed in the Islamic world from about the 11th century, a phenomenon recently investigated by Arnold Franklin. The Georgian Bagratids took great pains to represent themselves as a radical break from the Persianate pre-Bagratid royalty. In the century after their resuscitation of kingship, these Bagratids, like their brethren in Armenia, discarded much of the Persianate royal apparatus that had characterized Caucasia's political life since the Hellenistic age. This flexible Persianate image had withstood Christianization and had continued through the Georgian interregnum in the late sixth century. Now, Byzantine and Byzantine-like elements were introduced on an unprecedented scale. Such aspects were not slavishly imitated, but were selectively adapted to the cross-cultural environment of medieval Caucasia. But whereas earlier Persianate elements had frequently developed organically within Caucasia itself, Byzantine and Byzantine-like elements were mostly foreign imports that were creatively adjusted to the Caucasian milieu. An intentional substitution in the content of the Bagratid's royal image was underway, yet the underlying approach actually perpetuated pre-Bagratid Persianate conventions. Pre-Bagratid Georgian monarchs had made no Davidic assertions, but they deployed a legitimation strategy that would endure for centuries to come. The Holsroids, who had commanded Eastern Georgia from the fourth to the, early, to the late sixth centuries, were at once Christian and Persianate. But unlike the acculturating and acculturated Arsakids reigning throughout Caucasia, including Armenia, the Holsroids had previously not exercised royal authority. So as to bypass this irritating quandary, the late antique Holsroids turned to the ultimate story of monotheistic ethnogenesis, the Hebrew Bible, and thus masqueraded as the progeny of Nimrod, the infamous hunter of Genesis. Despite Caucasian traditions branding Nimrod as the archenemy of the primogenitors of Caucasia, including Hike and Kartlos, Early Christian Georgians reimagined Nimrod in a positive way. Accordingly, they envisioned the powerful Nimrod as the first king upon the world and as the founder of Sparseti, the durable continuum of Iranian empires. Across the late antique Near East, Christians of assorted cultural and social backgrounds broadcast similar genealogies. In fourth century Iraq, the converted Sasanian prince Mark Kardach reputedly issued, quote, from the stock of the kingdom of the Assyrians. His father was descended from the renowned lineage of the house of Nimrod and his mother from the renowned lineage of the house of Sennacherib, end quote. This is reminiscent of the Armenian Tomfa Artsruni, who proudly traces the provenance of his family to Sennacherib, the ancient king of ancient Assyria um, in the seventh century BC. Tomva also devotes considerable space to Nimrod, identified in the Armenian tradition as Bel. His Nimrod is an arrogant giant, the world's earliest king, the builder of the first city and the Tower of Babel, and the inventor of idolatry. <coughs> Thus, the medieval historian Tomva Artsruni, expounding and expanding upon Khuranatsi, describes Nimrod in much the same manner that the Iranian epic tradition describes primordial foundational kings, forefathers who literally invented the chief structures of their societies. And the same Persianate convention is observed in early Georgian historiography as well. The medieval Georgian Bagratids not only drew upon the origin stories promoted by their Armenian Bagratuni brethren, but also ripped a page from the Khosroids Persianate royal playbook. Instead of alleging descent from an Old Testament figure who had been endowed with an extra-biblical bond to ancient Iran and Mesopotamia, the Georgian Bagratids tethered themselves to the famous king prophet David. 
and this Davidic pedigree could reap benefits within Georgia and Caucasia and on the wider Eurasian stage. It's mentioned, for example, in the De Administrando of the, of the Byzantine Emperor Constantine VII Porphyrogenitus. During the reign of Georgian King David II in the late 11th century, the Georgian Bagratid polity was being transformed into a powerful empire that conceived itself as a second Byzantium, contemporaneous and equal to the original anchored at Constantinople. This David even claimed for himself the superlative title of Basileus. This co-option of a great Eurasian empire was also inspired by pre-Bagratid Persianate royal imagery. Calling themselves Khosroyani, the Khosroids imagine themselves the offspring of a certain Khosro, the supposed ancestor of the Sasanians. The assertion of Sasanian origins operated in tandem with that of direct descent from the decisive royal Iranian ancestor, the pre achaemenid Nimrod. In late antiquity, Christian Khosroids therefore projected their descent from two lines of ancient Iranian royalty. Adorned with Khara, the Khosroids thought of their realm as a parallel Iran. Bagratid historical literature tends to spotlight Caucasus membership in the Byzantine and Eastern Christian Achaemen. Sometimes this occurred through the adoption of Byzantine imperial reigns as a mean to organize historical narratives, as is the case with the Armenian Aristakis Lastevertsi. In Georgian, Byzantine flavors in historiographical narratives become commonplace from the 11th century, when the Pan-Caucasian Empire, commanded by the Bagratids, positioned itself as a second Byzantium. But departures from this pattern yield valuable insights into Caucasus cosmopolitan condition and the endurance of Persianate modes from one end of the isthmus to the other. An anonymous history of Queen Tamar dis dis deploys kaleidoscopic imagery transcending the Ireno Islamic and Romano Byzantine empires. Its title, Historiani da Asmani Sharavadetani, or The Histories and Eulogies of the Crowned creatively evokes these mixed traditions. The plural historiani transcribes Greek historia, history, a term seldomly used in Old Georgian. Shadavandi denotes consecration, crowning, and the corona or rays of the sun. It echoes the undocumented Middle Persian Shadavand, designating the crown tie associated with Sasanian monarchs. And we know this term through the Armenian Ashkharavand, which is mentioned in the much earlier Buzandaran Patmutunik, the epic histories. Now, Tamar was the first woman to govern a Bagratid kingdom in her own right, and surviving textual and visual sources reflect a vigorous campaign to establish her credentials beyond any doubt. The histories and eulogies is a central component of this project. Unlike other contemporaneous Georgian historiographical works, histories and eulogies copiously blends imagery from the Greco-Roman and Hellenistic Mediterranean, from biblical antiquity, and from the pre-Islamic Iranian worlds. Its, its initial passage conjures Moses and the Old Testament kings David and Solomon, from whom the Georgian Bagratids claimed direct biological descent. But according to histories and eulogies, Tamar's opulent lineage also transcended rival imperial traditions. It included the Hulsroids, and by extension, the Sasanians. Elsewhere, the 13th century author mingles local Persianate and Mediterranean imagery. Tamar was, quote, a descendant of the one who by the power of Nimrod acquired the domains of the sons of Haik, whom it befits only Homer to praise. How much Plutarch ma magnified the place of kings in history and elaborated the words of Alexander, end quote. At the height of the Pan-Caucasian Empire, the Bagratid's royal image also featured the mixing and reshaping of traditions from antiquity, and not exclusively Greco-Roman and biblical ones. Consider this passage about Georgi III, Tamar's father. Quote, and God the Father, together with his son, Jesus Christ, raised the dearest son who resembled his father to his side to share the throne with him, exposing him like the son among heavenly bodies, or like Alexander and Kehusro among sovereigns, or Achilles 
Samson and Nimrod among heroes, or Spandad, Tahmores, and Siavash among giants, and Solomon, Socrates, and Plato among sages. Needless to say, these celebrities issue from the ancient and Hellenistic Mediterranean, the Holy Land, and Iran. The extended passage describes Georgi as a pious hero king with an Olympic reign. He was like a winged panther and was blessed with the arm of Achilles, the good fortune of Alexander, and the divine glory, the Khvara, of Siavash. A medley of cultural strands saturates the report of Georgi's death. Observe the sequence's procession from Iranian and Old Testament to Hellenistic, Hellenic, and Christian. Quote, he, the sun over all suns, and the shining of royal power, a new Nimrod, Alexander, and Achilles, who had from the very beginning been raised up to heaven, died the same holy week as Christ. Georgi and his bagrated relatives, including daughter Tamar, thus embodied the continuation and renewal of Iranian and Mediterranean traditions of heroism and rulership. Now, throughout the medieval epoch and into the early modern and modern periods too, Iran and especially Pers Iranian and especially Persianate epics maintain great popularity throughout Caucasia, even among Christians. Among the most beloved contemporary literary works was the Georgian language poem Vepiskauseni, The Knight in the Panther's Skin. This poem is usually attributed to Shota Rustaveli, who is thought to have lived during Queen Tamar's reign. Now, this literary masterpiece conveys the story of the reclusive knight, Tariel, his quest to liberate and earn the love of a woman named Nestan Darejan, the friendship struck between Tariel and his fellow knight, Aftandil, and Aftandil's affection for one Tina Teen, daughter of the king of Arabia. Bound by unwavering loyalty, knights Tariel and Aftandil vanquished their foes, including demonic Kajis and Devs, and won the hands of, two, of the two maidens. The Knight in the Panther skin is set in Arabia, India, Central Asia, and a number of imaginary venues, including Kajeti, the land of demons. All are situated well beyond the Mediterranean and the Byzantine Ecumene. It is commonly affirmed, and rightly so, that the Knight in the Panther skin belongs to the genre of Iranian epics that were revived throughout the central and eastern sectors of the Dar al-Islam. This is a story of heroes forged in the literary mode of Eran Shah in its widest definition. The majority of the Knight in the Panther skin's characters bear names and titles consistent with Iranian and Irano-Islamic society. Themes of honor, trust, loyalty, friendship, courtly love, vassalage, hunting, feasting, physical prowess, vengeance, and fate saturate the poem. Produced at the peak of medieval Caucasia and some nine centuries after its initial royal Christianization, the Knight in the Panther skin is a saga composed in a style exemplifying the far-flung Iranian world. It contains no direct references to Byzantium or to Christianity. In the epic's more than 1,500 quatrains, we encounter not a single explicit reference to the Christian God, Jesus, and basic Christian dogma. As it happens, the Knight in the Panther skin represents a renewed Caucasian outburst of the Persianate epic. This epical, epical efflorescence reached across the isthmus, including the pastoralists of the Caucasian highlands. In Armenia, too, the Persianate epic had endured Christianization, the collapse of the Sasanian Empire, and the ascendancy of the Byzantinizing Bagratids. Examples of Armenian epics are found throughout the medieval period, including the Gosan tradition, which we heard about earlier, including one from the 14th and 15th century, represented by Yohannes Tukhkuransi. And this tradition continued well beyond, as we also heard earlier, with the polyglot and Ashukh traditions and poems of Sayat Nova in the 18th century. But perhaps the most famous expression of the medieval Armenian epic is the oral cycle featuring the hero David of Sassoon, the so-called daredevils of Sassoon, the Sasna Zerer. 
Although this tale was consigned to writing only in the 19th century, there can be no question of considerable, considerably older roots reaching into medieval times. The epic commences with the birth of two twins, Sanasar and Bagdasar, and traces four generations of heroes from the Armenian region of Sassoon in eastern Anatolia. Struggles enveloping Christian Armenians and their pagan, that is to say Muslim overlords, provide the constant backdrop, even when the stage purports to be situated in antiquity. At the same time, this Sassoon heroic cycle is a cross-cultural artifact of the complexities of Christian Muslim and Armenian, Persian, Turkic, Arab inter interactions. Starry-eyed lovers face the constant quandary of Christians not being able to marry non-Christians and so forth, again tying into an earlier talk. Throughout this Sassoon epic, courageous Armenian Pahlavans engage in battle. Single combat is an incessant theme. An entire chapter is devoted to the single combat waged between Sanasar's grandson David against his half-brother Mesremelik. David enjoined battle on his magnificent, magnificent steed, Kurkik Jalali, or the Colt Jalal. David was a Persianate hero ruler who happened to be Christian and who, unlike his father Meher, bore a Judeo-Christian name. David belonged to a dynastic family, a fact emphasized here by the receipt of his father's armaments. He fights pagans and Arabs, that is to say Muslims, as a Christian warrior whose arm was emblazoned with a supernatural battle cross insignia. There are many similarities between the Armenian Sassoon cycle and the Georgian knight in the panther skin. Both exude a mix of real and legendary settings, the joy of doing battle, the even greater joy of single combat, the extraordinary feats fueled by love for seemingly un un unobtainable maidens, often made more unobtainable through differing religious affiliation, the danger of demons, the lure of mysterious caves, and the delights of hunting and banqueting. There are also substantial differences, ones that remind us of Caucasia's grand diversity. Unlike the Knight in the Panther skin, the Sassoon cycle specially emphasizes the Christian identity of Armenia's heroes and the pagan, but then quotation marks, affiliation of their tyrannical overlords. Within Caucasia, Armenians and Georgians were not alone in their love of Persianate epics. Consider, for example, the Nart sagas from the Ossetians, the Chuvash, Ingush, Circassians, and other North Caucasian peoples. These oral stories feature heroic Persianate giants from powerful clans. And one of the most famous Narts was the warrior Batras, whose story is part of the Caucasian Prometheus legend. Stories from the Nart corpus engage many epic themes, including pre-human giants, uh, uh, courtly love, why the sun pauses on the horizon, and Narts literally plucking stars from the sky. There were, we should remember, many physical interactions between the pastoralist highlanders and the sedentary communities to the south. And this helps to explain similar themes and motifs across Caucasia's epics. Well, there is much, much more that might be said, but uh, my three hours has come to an end. So I'd like to leave you with this idea. And of course, I'm thinking big here, throwing out some big ideas and some big patterns. So I'd like to leave you with this. The epic heroes, the epic universe of the heroes from Sassoon, the knight in the panther skin and the Nart sagas mirrors that of medieval Caucasia itself. All were inherently cosmopolitan and cross-cultural, and all were products of an enduring but evolving Persianate socio-cultural matrix in the medieval epic. Significantly, our Caucasian epics are not chiefly an expression of the articulation of the Iranian epic taking place in Islamic spaces, although there were many shared influences in this regard. And these Caucasian epics were not some brand new exotic craze sweeping Caucasian Christian elites in the medieval period. Rather, the epics of medieval Caucasia, like the region's diverse Persianate cultural identities, were evolving complex expressions of the durable world of Eranshar that had bound Iran and Caucasia in many different kinds of ways 
since the Achaemenids of old. Shnor Hagalatun, thank you very much. Oh, shoot. associated with uh, my area of specialization might be early modern, maybe even early medieval, late medieval and so on. Sorry. That's question, right to no, I like that. That's question good. number one. Uh, <laughs> is it anachronistic or not? Yes. And if it's not, then what exactly do you mean by Prishnay? Uh Question two is more technical. I recently assigned one of uh, uh, Cyril Tumanov's short pieces in Hantes Ansoria on mm. the dating of Hore Nazi, which I hadn't read before, but I read it with my students. One of the arguments he makes, if memory serves, is that the Davidic origins of the Bakraduni uh, appear, according to him, to have come first in Georgia and then in Hore Nazi. Yeah. So that's the argument that he has for dating Hore Nazi in the 8th century, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. So do you have any horse in this race? Do you have any position on which one comes first? Or Two excellent questions. You're paying attention much too closely. Um, <laughs> I have rarely used the word Persianate in any of my publications, and I decided for this audience to use it here because I thought it might be a little more familiar than a clunky term like Irenic, which also poses its own problems. There's a real problem here with terminology. And so I've, I've used Persianate begrudgingly because it is something familiar. I have a journal of Persianate studies that sometimes publishes things, even pre-Islamic. This is a term that tends to be associated, though, with Islamic period and later. I personally, I don't know. I, I don't know how I feel about it. I felt weird saying it today because I don't usually use this term, either in, in, when I give talks or in my publications. But using a word like ironic, I-R-A-N-I-C, which I've used in some of my publications, it's also very unwieldy and not easily said, especially for a Hoosier. Uh, I'm from Indiana. There you have it. So, and I'd like, you know, if any of you have ideas about this, I'd really like to hear from you because I, I'm still struggling with this even though I've been writing about these things for a couple of decades. As for uh, your comment about Khoranazi, the Davidic claim, one of the things to keep in mind here is that even in the best of circumstances for pre-modern Caucasia, we have limited sources. We have only a fraction of what used to survive. In terms of historiography, the manuscripts tend to be much later anyway. They tend to be early modern in most cases. This poses a lot of textual problems and a lot, we really have to pay attention to manuscript traditions and the like. But with regards to surviving sources, I think there's really very little doubt that the idea of a Jewish origin for the Bagratids, that issue is first among the Armenian Bagratids, and it's first expressed in Moses' Khoranazi. Now, as I think you all know, the date of Khoranazi is something that's very greatly contested. Uh, Dr. Greenwood kind of steered clear of Khoranazi in part because of that, and rightly so. But whether Khoranazi is a 5th century historian or whether he wrote later in the 8th or 9th century, he was a brilliant historian and he drew upon older traditions regardless of which date is accepted. And in either case, he is the earliest source we have for a Jewish origin for the Bagratids. And he even suggests some names of ancient Jewish ancestors including Shambat um, in, in this source. The earliest sources that we have from the Caucasus that, that specifically uh, give a Davidic origin to any of these rulers comes from Georgia. It's not to say the Armenians might have come up with it first, but we don't have any sources. What we have are some Georgian materials, including some inscriptions um, from what is now uh, Far Eastern Turkey. Um, and we also have some literary stuff from around the year 800 that, that talks about the, the Bagratids, the royal Bagratids being Davidic. It does appear back in the Armenian tradition. And so if this general pattern holds right, 
you know, the Bagr these Bagratids in Georgia and Armenia were in communication with each other. It doesn't mean they were the best of friends, they, they were often <coughs> rivals, but they were nevertheless in communication and some ideas were going back and forth between these courts. So in the 10th century at least, we know in Armenia, some of the Bagratids are claiming that Davidic provenance. And of course, if you're royal and you have a Jewish provenance, it's, you know, the, the, the logical way to push that is you're related to David and Solomon. And incidentally, we see this elsewhere in, on the edges of the Christian world too. So in Ethiopia, those of you familiar with medieval Ethiopia will know about the Solomonids in Ethiopia claiming a direct descent from Solomon, a different way of really thinking about Christian kingship. So I'm afraid that's about the best I can do with the sources that we have. It's not directly related to what you're saying. I'm just hoping that you have some information about it. Okay. You were talking about the Khosroids and their connection to some sort of a Khosro as an ancestor of uh, the um, Sasani, supposedly. I found it very curious because the time they're going back to is the time that there are no Khosroids in the Sasani dynasty itself. Yeah. And also that the medieval um, Persian histories of the Arsacid dynasty keep on mentioning kings called Khosrow, which, as far as we know, are not in the Arsacid dynasty. Is this, by, by any chance, some sort of a Parthian Arsacid connection or reimagination of their ancestry? It is altogether possible that that's true. This term in the Georgian tradition gets thrown around, usually in a quite vague way, where it seems to be some ancient Iranian ancestor used in much the same way that Nimrod. The idea that he's pre acumenid it goes back to the very beginning. What was going on, we don't know, but we know that Nimrod was first and he was an Iranian and he was the inventor of kingship and we want to be connected to him. Um, Husro, or sometimes this gets used in a way, a very similar way, it's some vague Iranian royal ancestor that isn't necessarily Sasanian. And you are quite right, it might refer to per Parthians. Uh, so in Georgia, there were some Arsacids that ruled for a time. Uh, they tended to be dependent upon the Armenian Arshakunis and sometimes even brought from Armenia um, to rule in Georgia. But during the Christian period of Georgia up through the interregnum that starts around 580, this Christian family, uh, these were Christianized, acculturated Mihranids who had come from northern Iran. And exactly why and how, we don't really know. Um, but this word Khusro, later it does become identified with the Sasanians in some texts, and it's clear that it's, it's related to them but not always in the Georgian tradition. It might relate back to something pre-Sasanian too. Yeah. Yeah, I tend to use it in a way that is is um, some intentionality behind a cross-cultural condition. So there's and there's a a, a deliberate embrace. Um, and so I see that certainly in both Georgian and Armenian texts, and, and even in in the history of the Albanians that is written in Armenian um, by by uh, Das Khurantsi. But so it's that, I, I think it's more of a consciousness and, intention, and intentionality and physical connection that, so a place, Georgia and Armenia, this is very much, I consider it to be really one of the durable crossroads in the Eurasian world. I think really alongside Central Asia, and in many ways, the Caucasus, I think, is an extension of Central Asia, and I think we heard that earlier today, today and I, I absolutely agree with that idea, so moving that direction makes a lot of sense. Um, but certainly the Horn of Africa too. These are places that, that, that are not just uh, cross-cultural, but we have lots of different peoples actually physically moving through and staying. And over long periods of time, and how you deal with that, you know, certainly there can be tension and hatred and you can build, I was gonna say build walls, but I think I'll, I'll not do that. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so I, I think that's how I'm, I'm really using it in tandem, I'm using it in a very loose way in tandem with, with a cross-cultural condition. 
and not really giving anything else to it for this period. I don't want to read too many sort of ways we would think about what's going on in the 19th and 20th century back to late antiquity. That may not be the way to go. It's also why I don't use the word ethnicity for this period or the word national for the most point. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce the talk ensemble. We're going to uh, uh, play for us several pieces in both Armenian and Persian music. Uh, the talk ensemble includes, uh, and I can't read, sorry, Aryan uh, Forushi, who plays percussion. And we uh, have Anatol Nadalian as uh, Santur, who plays Santur, all the way from Petra. And then we have Ms. Nilufar Shiri, who is playing Kamaji, and Hesamo Abedini, who is going to be on the vocals. Uh, two of these uh, uh, people, I was going to say students, but PhD students, Hesam. Uh, and you uh, working on the PhD here in musical composition, and they also have an office in our center, so we get to hear them uh, sing or play once in a while. And uh, Hassam, I think before uh, uh, before coming to the U.S. as well as Nilufar, studied in the conservatory in Yerevan. Yes, uh, so uh, they're attuned to both uh, some of the Armenian and uh, Persian. So I believe that. Barabzes, salam. Hello, everyone. Um, I had the chance to go to Yerevan uh, in Armenia to study uh, in the conservatory there for three years before I come to US. That's like 12 years ago, the first time I went to Armenia. It was a fantastic uh, opportunity, and it was a fantastic place to be and live in. And uh, I always remember that probably that was the uh, most exciting experience I have ever had. And uh, since they have a great music program, great people, and wonderful music scene going on there. And uh, that's, that's how much I know uh, Armenia and Armenians. Uh, and we are gonna perform two, I mean, one piece first, that Sari Sirun Yar, which is an Armenian uh, melody that was uh, later used in classical Persian music and they put some song, uh, uh, some lyrics on it and performed it in Farsi too. So we'll perform both uh, Armenian and Farsi version. Thank you. 
só nos ouviu Poder e retirar Só me
لبش خنده نور دلش شده گشون سلا ششم بنیادش آبوی جنگنده repetition of a melody which are usually just so beautiful that if you repeat it like hundred times you don't get tired of it. And the other thing that we were trying to do was the keeping one note, one instrument always holds one note and then some, another instrument plays the uh, melody on top of it. And that was something we also tried in this piece. Um, what are we going to play? You're so silent. Like, <laughs> <laughs> after like 10 Trump, hours. Trump. <laughs> Trump, <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is also a melody uh, from north west of Iran, Armenia, Azerbaijan. It's a shared melody because I say this because like you know, Azerbaijanians, they say it's for us. Armenians say it's for us. Iranians want to say it's for us. I say it's from that area because uh, of how the <coughs> melodic patterns work, how it's developed. And uh, so I hope you enjoyed this melody too. And I just, I'm just going to sing a, a poetry of Feridun Moshiri, a contemporary Iranian poet, because I just liked it and I think it's it has a great, wonderful, beautiful message. So I hope you enjoy. Oh, 
نام زفرانی گل سر گل نور سهران چه زیبا Sorry, of uh, This is also another shared melody, and we are gonna. I'm gonna sing the Farsi version and Armenian version, and since I still remember Armenian after eight years.
That's just for instrumental piece. We'll end with a beautiful uh, song uh, that is uh, composed by a great Iranian musician, uh, Mastro Meshkatian. And uh, it's based on a poem of Hafez, which talks about friendship. And I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. 